Sacred Symbols is sponsored by Freeze Pipe and their remarkable line of glassware that I use every single day because they're so damn good. I'm telling you, I would know. Freeze Pipe is amazing. The bong is sublime, the bubbler a joy to use, the bowl a trusty companion that I have with me right now as I'm writing and recording this ad. Shop the smoothest pipes, bubblers, bongs, and more at thefreezepipe.com. That's T-H-E-F-R-E-E-Z-E-P-I-P-E.com. And use the code SACRED at checkout, that's S-A-C-R-E-D, for 10% off your entire order. That's thefreezepipe.com with the checkout code SACRED for 10% off. American-owned, affordably priced, and with free domestic shipping. Order today and start fighting fire with ice. Sacred Symbols, a PlayStation podcast, is brought to you by, well, you. If you want to learn how to support our show, go to patreon.com slash laststandmedia. Greetings and salutations. Welcome back to Sacred Symbols, a PlayStation podcast. This is episode number 299. We're on the precipice. My name is Colin Moriarty. I'm joined as always by my son, Chris Reagan. Chris, welcome back. You weren't here last week. Yeah. People wondered where you might have gone. Uh, yeah, how's, I, I, uh, how's everything going? It's, it's going OK. I was uh, gallivanting through the streets. Hmm. Now, I was doing some I was doing some uh, medical stuff. Nothing to worry about. But, you know, just got to keep keep on track. You know, it's easy to forget. I went years without just going to basic doctor's appointments because I just would forget for years. I mean, I went like I went like three, three and a half years without going to the dentist. And I was like, oh, I should probably I should probably just do that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm very fastidious about the dentist going twice a year. I don't know when you're a little kid, you go and get a physical every year, but that's really for school. I don't know if you need to have a physical so i had a physical a few years ago and it was all fine and they looked at all my my stuff my eyes and all that kind of stuff but um i gotta get back there as well yeah. mike has been encouraging me to go get my get a checkup who knows what's wrong with me at this point yeah you never know yeah i had skin cancer on my face for you know several years before anyone identified it as skin cancer so i just thought it was like a like a you know a small mole or something but they're like no that's skin cancer that's gotta yeah, go Jesus. well i'm glad you're okay for now yeah Dustin Furman, executive producer, welcome to the show. How are you today? I'm fantastic. I'm drinking uh, technically kind of a gift from you. This is the Rush flavored G Fuel, right? That because uh, Micah got you the cup, but mm-hmm. you didn't want you didn't want the gamer fuel. No, I you don't, don't know. I don't even understand gaming. what what is what what is is it what is it? Uh, is it like Gatorade? <laughs> no, it's basically just caffeinated Kool Aid. Really, that's about all it is. <laughs> That sounds fucking diabolical. And it's for yeah. gamers? That's how it's branded. I mean, they put gaming stuff on it to get right. to get more on. I mean, you that cup is amazing. The Rush Cup. Mm. I have a Persona 3 Reload cup pre-ordered from them, which I, I don't buy a lot of stuff. Obviously, this is not sponsored, but uh, yeah, the Rush G Fuel. It's just weird to slushy. me. That, it just weirds to me that it, it's just weird to me that. So. Micah bought the, the very kind. Yeah, like the, it's like a cu- cup kind of like that a little taller and it's like got a red top and it's Russian Mega Man and Rush is mostly uncolored so that when you put that stuff in it, he appears to oh. be the red color he is. But it's weird to me to for something like so unhealthy to come in a cup like that because that's usually like a workout supplement thing, right? Right. Well, uh, it's not necessarily unhealthy because well, you called it Kool-Aid, didn't you? Yes, but it's not oh, like sugar. Sh- no, it doesn't. It has like fake sugar in it so So arguably that's bad for you but it's zero i think it's maybe not zero but like 30 calories per serving you don't really know what you're talking about do you You well i do know that it's 30 calories you don't don't know no the point is that some people say the fake sugar will kill you right uh but uh, if if it kills me i say so be it have five diet cokes in a day i don't give a fuck that's how i go that's fine how you sleeping not bad I'm still Good. kind of going to bed early and waking up early. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. Something's changed in me, I guess. It's not like incredibly early. Maybe 1130 midnight. Waking up at about eight. That's pretty nice. That's that's so, normal. That's good. I went to bed at four last night. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> so oh, there's man. that. I was tossing and turning, reading. I don't know what I was doing last night. All fucked up. Well, it's good to be here with you guys today. We're on the precipice, my friends. Um, yeah. We're recording this. This goes live for Patreon. But by the time this goes live on free feeds, episode 300 celebration, live show celebration will already happen. Now, let me ask you this, Dustin. The question yeah. for you. 
you were saying so the next episode of the show is going to be a regular episode correct that's 300 that's but you have enough time don't you to to get that 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 video out if you worked 30 to 40 hours in those three days (laughs) technically some things are theoretically possible yes but this time uh the footage is getting mailed to me afterwards Cool. cool so no the the thing with sacred 200 was the so particularly we had ad spots on that <laughs> that needed to be fulfilled. Yeah. So between traveling back and forth to Richmond, I I pulled an all nighter on that one. Yeah, no, yeah it, I, I'm yeah. only busting balls, really. I, oh, mean, I know, I know. Um, I think it's kind of cool that we've separated them so that this will just be some sort of celebratory event. It's sold out. We're excited for everyone to be there. I'm going to have quite a few. So your parents are going, right, Dustin? My dad is. Your not dad's my going. Oh, OK, cool. And then what, what's your Chris, did we comp you any tickets for your people or are you having anyone at the show? Or no? Yeah, I got, I got a friend of mine going. This is somebody okay, that cool. I lived with for a long time who, who's back in New York now. Great. I have. Let's see, my my dad and my stepmom, my mom and my stepdad. PJ, my brother's best friend and his wife. And then my G.I. Joe Consigliere, Mike Patelli and his wife. So I have eight people coming. Could we have sold those tickets? Yes. Did my mom spring on me that she wanted to come late pretty late yes um am i gonna make fun of my dad oh yeah yeah it's gonna be good i'm I'm really excited about it do a little stand up beforehand and uh not really stand up but it kind of turns into that i don't really think i just kind of walk around the stage and just kind of stream of consciousness you know for a few minutes and then that won't be the whole show though i guarantee you in fact none of us know what's happening the three of us have no idea what's going on everyone else knows but it, I don't know. It's yeah. I I I feel strange about that. It's it's a, it, there's a strange anxiety in like oh there's a, you're gonna be there's it's a live event and you have no fucking idea what is going to happen. It feels concerning to me. But mm-hmm. like all right, it's, yeah. It's it's in some ways it's in, in some ways Chris though it's less stressful for me. Like it's like this if someone else fucked it up we just blame Ben, you know, mm. <laughs> and Brad <laughs> and Brad yeah. Yeah. Ben's easier, though, to, to blame. He's been with us longer. Brad, we probably have to give him a few mistakes first. Sure. You know? So I can't just throw him under the bus right away. But I think, we're yeah, it's going to be fun. It's going to be like a little bit of a like a quiz show, a roast sort of thing, I think. And I don't know what's going to happen. It's going to be fun. I'm excited about it. So thank you all out there for uh, agreeing to come see us. You're agreeing. Okay. To come agreeing. see us in New York City. <laughs> okay. Agreeing. Yeah, we should agree you. We, we are agreed. And then, so yeah, next week we'll have a regular episode 300, which we didn't have a regular episode 200. I don't, episode 100, I don't even think we did anything for really. Um, I don't think that so. That was either. probably during the video or the audio only days, actually, episode 100. Yeah. Yeah. That would have been sounds right. 2020. We didn't start doing video until 2021. For some reason, though, I used to still publish all of the audio just to YouTube. And for some reason, like 10,000 people a week would watch it. <laughs> <laughs> Even yeah. though it was like it was like the slow moving DVD icon. Yeah, we would do the thousands. same thing on, on Snark Tank. It was the same thing. It was just a thumbnail. People just like it on there for some reason, you know, like yeah, well, so a lot of, I, I found out that a lot of people just have it just like playing in the background, mm-hmm. you know, while they're doing other stuff anyway. And then if you I think I don't know if this is like a standard YouTube feature now, but it it used to be premium. I don't know if it changed because I, I've just been on YouTube premium forever. Uh, but you can have like the audio of videos playing when you shut the screen off, if mm-hmm. you do that, yeah, so yeah, it's, a lot of people I, did it that way. I have premium as well. I, I'm always so confused about people that don't like YouTube premiums made fun of. I'm like, YouTube premium changed my life. Basically. I mean, YouTube is so good when you don't have to have any ads. And I've said yeah. it before, like Micah has her, doesn't want to pay, you know, doesn't want to pay for that or whatever. So she, I watch She watches some things on there and I'm like, how do you deal with this? I, like, yeah, I, I. How do you deal with this? You know, I go to friends' houses sometimes, and they'll put up they'll put up YouTube videos. They'll be like, "Oh yeah, you should watch this." And then there's <laughs> some unskippable ad for some shit that I've never seen before. And I'm like, I don't know how, I don't know how you could possibly put up with this. This is it's so. Oh, do we lose Chris? We may have lost it, Chris. What? He bounced back. Oh wait, you're oh. still here. He's still there. Oh, <laughs> oh I can still. <laughs> you saw that too. That you was saw that so too. He, like, he like. F- you went into like the next dimension and then you came back that you, know, <laughs> you clipped. I heard that whole thing. So I was just like, what? <laughs> What's going on? What are you talking about? Well, because once in a while, I don't know if you guys have noticed this. It might happen to me when you're listening to me, too, is like Zencaster does a thing once in a blue moon where 
it'll like kind of like you know space out for a minute and you just yeah. kind of hope that it comes back in a few seconds and it usually does and so like the person because yeah. it's all recorded into your cat local cache so as mm-hmm. long as it's going for you it doesn't matter yeah you know? right um but that was a little bit longer than the usual you know mm. i wonder what happened i don't know maybe there's an emp going off god willing dude save us <laughs> god willing please please china just take the united states already and just put us out of our misery i'm not going to live under any <laughs> communist but at least i'll die you know right We're fighting for glory um welcome to sacred symbols of playstation podcast episode 299 we're on the precipice as i said of our i'm saying that word a lot of our 300th episode very exciting what so it's thursday we're recording this goes live friday chris are you leaving on saturday yeah i believe so i believe my flight is really 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 early saturday morning oh okay. which over here okay. i'll get there at like a reasonable i'll get there in the afternoon yeah because you'll jump forward yeah it'll be eight or nine hours by the time you land and then um dustin you're driving and you're probably leaving mm-hmm. tomorrow yeah, Friday. tomorrow afternoon is when we're leaving. So getting uh getting ready for that. Hey, listen to this, Chris. On the way, we're gonna stop right in New Jersey, right across the river. Mm-hmm. There's a Asian grocery store, like a market inside the one piece card game store. So <laughs> making a special trip there. I think I think I'm gonna buy a booster box when I'm there. They're like a whole box of cards. Uh, really, just wondering. really living on living on the edge there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You and, so, um, you and Chadley, me and Chadley. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, don't oh, mention Chadley, Chadley again. It's, it's so divisive. Wait so till divisive. you play it, dude. You're gonna want to. You, you're you're gonna join the ranks of the. the I'm sure Chadley. I will. He yeah. already annoys me in remake, and he's barely oh, in it. So it's so much yeah. worse. I know he's because he's like <laughs> I don't know what he's doing, but he's got the glasses and he's got the annoying voice. He's got like the old, the young man gray hair kind mm-hmm. of situation going on. That is it's one of the most disheartening things about Rebirth to me is it, because I really I really hated him so deeply that I stopped playing for like a really long time. And it wasn't even that it was like egregiously annoying. It was just it was just annoying enough in an experience that was otherwise completely good. And I think that's mm-hmm. what if the rest of the game was as annoying as Chadley, I would almost be like, oh, well, this is what it's supposed to be. It's kind of like that Justin Roiland game where it's like the whole point is that it's supposed to be annoying. And it's like, oh, all right. right. I could, I what could was that game called? Uh, uh, something Life. It was a shooter, right? Uh, some, oh, something, High on Life. Yeah. Yeah. High yeah, on Life. Chris yeah. again, but he's probably still there anyway. Um, Let's see what I'm happens. Still here. I'm still here. I'm just a little dicey connection today. I'm going to take a print screen here. <laughs> I'm still I'm still yeah. here. It's right now I'm he's st- mad because he can probably hear us. I can, uh, yes, we might be talking are, over each other for all we know. You're right. You're right. Might need to the, make. You're totally uh, right. Chris, where are you? Are you there? I'm. St- <laughs> I'm very much still here. All right, we had a technical snafu. We really did lose Chris there, but he he could see us and. Yeah, we don't there's, really there's some fun. There's some fun audio there, probably. Yeah, <laughs> to mess around with. Yeah, I don't. Uh, I don't know what's going on. But we'll continue on where it is episode 299 of Sacred Symbols, a PlayStation podcast. We appreciate all of you guys. Thank you so much for your support over on Patreon, patreon.com slash last media. That's, of course, the umbrella where Sacred Symbols is our flagship. But we have Defining Duke, our Xbox podcast done by Mr. Matty Plays and Lord Cognito. We have Punching Up, our Nintendo podcast. We have Knockback, our Retro and Nostalgia podcast, Summon Sign, which is our games conversation. Constellation is our off topic conversation. So lots of content over there for you. Five dollars a month is the sweet spot. And uh, you get early ad free access to all of our shows with that. Very affordable indeed. Kyle Day wrote into us. One of the perks you get is to write into the show on the weekly thread in the newsfeed. I go through those inquiries and then pull them out. He says, hi, guys, please read in Dagan's YouTube voice. OK, hi, guys. He doesn't do that anymore. Really? That used to be his uh, his big thing because he had a teenage. Well, he, had, he still has a teenage daughter, but I think that they were watching a lot of that kind of YouTube <laughs> stuff. at the time. Mm. No real <laughs> question. This week just wanted thing. to come. What, his I'm sorry, big thing used to be hi guys yeah well, that well, was like, his big thing <laughs> well his, his, his big thing like he would say hi guys in that feminine <laughs> right. YouTube action yeah Not, no I, I got you it's I, just I, funny it's funny to see it written that way i guess yeah fair enough uh kyle says no real question this week just wanted to comment on my experience jumping back up to the ten dollar a month patreon tier for the q a so ten dollars a month on on patreon it's all that stuff that at the five dollar tier plus you get a monthly q a with me you can ask me anything you want it goes for hours usually and then uh, you get your name in the uh, 
credits to the higher tiers as well. I had forgotten now uh, how enjoyable they are, so I downloaded the last 12 or so. I must say, the saga of you slowly and surely digging yourself from being behind schedule had me feeling some satisfaction when it seems as though that goal has now been met. What an end to a long and winding journey. Anyways, thanks for the best value $10 a month can buy. I started falling behind on my monthly Q&As, and I think we have, we have such a nice audience because I have so many things to do where I'm like, I know I could have just been like, listen, I'll just combine the Q&As and we'll do like a big mega Q&A and just get caught up. But I'm too like autistic probably for that. So what, what ended up happening instead was I was like, we're just going to go month by month and I'm going to start truncating everything so that we're doing them at a slightly quicker clip. And then so I was like two months behind and now I'm totally caught up and it was and I did it the right way for the audience, for me, total satisfaction. 100% Good. satisfaction guaranteed. Because if you really don't like the content, I'll give you your money back. I, I refund people once in a blue moon. You know, if you don't want to give me your money. Don't. That's fine. Go spend it on something else. You know, I saw I was at the uh, where was I? I was at CVS in uh, Boston the other day and they had the little donuts, you know, mm. and I was like, mm-hmm. damn, those look really good. You can go spend your money on that. It's pretty good. Good value for your bang for your buck, especially the powdered donuts. Kyle, thank you for writing in. One of the perks over on Patreon as well as Sacred Symbols Plus are once weekly supplement to the show where we do deep dives, interviews, and so on and so forth. Um, I had Jez Gordon on, Xbox content creator, journalist, and so on. People really like that episode. That episode will go free for everyone. Um, so you can look forward to that as well. We sat down, the three of us plus Ben, our associate producer, and did a two plus hour, I think, conversation about Hell Divers 2. I think I called it Helldivers 2, the final word for now or something like that, or the last word for now. Um, and we just get into the game, what we love about it, what we're doing with it, what our experiences with it had been. I think that's going to be really great. So that'll go live this weekend or already be live. If this is on free feeds, you can check it out on Patreon. I had Cliffy B on recently. I had Jonathan Blow on recently. We did a Final Fantasy VII Rebirth deep dive. We'll do another one once we all have played it all the way through. However, on the Jez conversation, something came up and I wanted to clarify it josiah wrote in said hi colin i was wondering if you could clarify some math you've referenced a few times most recently in your conversation with jez when discussing how much microsoft would make on a 20 dollars game sold on the playstation store you took the 30 percent platform holder rip off the top leaving 14 but then you said that six dollars sony makes as a platform holder needs to be subtracted again from the profit so microsoft makes leaving eight not quite following the logic behind doubly subtracting the percentage cut simply because it's a competitor taking that rip and was hoping you could elaborate congrats on 300 i won't be at the new york event in person but it will be there in spirit cheers to 300 more I think we could do 300 more. We'll see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> um, the 300, you know, so six years from now, it's going to look really different again, PlayStation, which will be cool to, if we're still doing the show at that point. So here's the argument. And, and some people were, so we were talking about uh, Pentiment, $20. So $14 would be my, um, Microsoft's cut of that. However, I was saying this, Josiah, in the context of the famous Phil Spencer quote of saying, Sony takes 30% of, ev- of the games we sell on their platforms and uses it to foreclose on us. And so if that's the way they really feel, then you really need to negate that money leaving. And it's, so it's not literally going to be shown in the books. It's just a philosophical argument about like, well, these two things cancel each other out. If you believe Phil Spencer's words about how he thinks that they do that with their 30%, of course, you could believe that Phil Spencer talks out of both sides of his mouth. But either way, I wanted to clarify. That was a great conversation, though, and I'm really glad people enjoyed it. So please look forward to it on free feeds merch last day media.store shirts sweatshirts hats stickers and so forth free shipping in the united states on all stickers all sent from my house here by my wife micah timothy martin wrote in said hello lsm team wanted to share an lsm moment with you i was i was walking through the commissary think army grocery store i'm not that stupid yeah come on on fort leavenworth wearing my fantastic new sacred symbols hoodie i heard a voice yell stand down since stand down is a military term and I was on a military base, it took me a moment to realize it was another member of the growing LSM army. To my fellow Sacred Symbols Leavenworth chapter member, it was great to see a fellow traveler. Sacred Symbols is infiltrating the ranks of the military. Colin, we need to give you some rank. I would love that. I've said in the past that I was told by people that were in the military, like my friends, that because I have a college degree, I guess, I mean, I'm too old to join the military now, but because I have a bachelor's degree that I would actually, if I joined the military, oh, there you go. You got your hat. And your dad's a veteran. My dad's a veteran too. Yeah. Um, my dad was in the Air Force. Your dad was in the Army. Um, mm. And so I was like, well, I would be so instead of starting like private first class or whatever you start at, I would start at like some slightly higher position. And so with that in mind, feel free to give me 
any battalion commander, perhaps something like that. Chief. I don't even really know what that is, but it is a position. Yeah, I don't know. Do you think trophy rank could come into play when deciding your rank? Colin? It could. I mean, if that's that's fine. <laughs> That'd be insane. I'll just be like a lieutenant. <laughs> you know, just put me somewhere in like the you know lieutenant Colin Moriarty. I, I like that it's uh, yeah just make me a lieutenant it's just a lieutenant <laughs> lieutenant's an insanely I feel like that's a very high rank it is a high rank the, the um it's funny because uh I always wonder you, you guys have noticed this surely they say left tenant in British English like left I don't like that what are like, they doing why, how do you get that out of that like I don't even this is what I'm talking about about the British <clears throat> what are yeah. they doing yeah they're problematic people yeah, they're the really reason. they're really in in some sort of way right now. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Let's get into some things to talk about here. What is this here? Oh, Saul Nolasco wrote in. Said, good day, gentlemen. In the past week, two users came to me asking for help since I work in IT. I had either sacred symbols or constellation playing in my earbuds on those two. And those two users backed away thinking I was in the middle of a meeting. So not only does LSM provide many hours of great content, but you guys also keep the users away and have them open a the ticket the way they are supposed to. So for that, I would like to thank you all. That's awesome. I was uh, friendly with the IT people at IGN and um, people really are annoying with that shit, you know? Yeah. Just things breaking. And, uh, but boy, when I quit, they came and collected my shit too sweet. Mm. I'll tell you that much. They were all over that. They didn't <laughs> want me to have any of that stuff. It's like, all right, I cool. I don't, want, I don't want my ancient tower, huh? Yeah, think? I did freelance IT work for a bit. Uh, it was horrible. I had to go install Windows updates overnight at a place. And uh, it's so oddly specific, but it was the plant in Pittsburgh that makes that uh, the poopery spray. Oh. So it just it smelled so strong of the poopery that there was some like if you, as you walk around the office because there was the facility like right in the same building but kind of next to the office mm. certain place you walk you get blasted by poopery and uh dude here's the other thing too about working it some of these people at their desks are filthy some of these keyboards Ugh. the desks you you t- you can see them glistening it's like they're they're like a glazed donut or something but it's their entire keyboard and mouse of just like <laughs> slime it's like a, it's <laughs> like a toddler possible? use them so Gross. it was good money, but I don't, I, I'm good on windows updates. The poopery family, the poopery family fortune. <laughs> yeah. I don't understand how people let their keyboards get so filthy. I, I, I really can't comprehend it. I, the thing I always wonder is that cause this happens with game controllers too. people eating like greasy chips and then just immediately touching their controller. Yeah. I, I can't stand that. I, I, I've known people that do that. They don't. That's, that's wild. Yeah. It's like, why would that is, it's not even for the controller's sake. I take care of good to care of my things. I've always done that. I've always really been very, I want to like, if I buy something, like I still use a Bose Bluetooth speaker from literally 15 years ago. Like legit. It's the, Bo, I think it's the Bose, whatever Mark two, like, you know, like whatever, <laughs> like the second one they ever made or whatever. Dock. And it's, and it works great, you know? So I like to take care of my stuff, but it's just the feeling like when you know, like your your hands are dirty, and then you're, it's like you're not getting the con. I don't, I don't know, man. People are gross out there. Like I'm surprised by how latently dirty things get over time in my life, and I consider myself a pretty clean person. Like you'll start to develop like right. a little bit of smudge or gook in your controller, like crevice. You can get like a toothpick mm-hmm. and just kind of pick it out. And it's like, oh, where the hell yeah. did this come from? But like, so imagine how bad it is for the Dorito eater. You know? Yeah. Or the or the smart food white cheddar popcorn person Ooh, who yeah. just doesn't even doesn't even bother to wipe their hands at all. It's it's crazy. Like it really blows my mind that people just don't have an instinctual, I, I, just some instinctual urge to just clean their controllers in general. Like it, while I'm just waiting for something to load up, sometimes I'll just like run like a like a card or like a piece of paper like through like the 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 seam of the controller you know what i mean just just for yeah just to kill just to kill some time at the very least so like to me and when you see people where it's like it's like caked like Mm. like like uh like when you when you lay down tile 
this the shit that's oh. in between. I can't remember what it's called. Exactly. Caulk. Yeah. What is that? A uh, grout? Grout? Yeah. It's that it's like they right. route grout, their yeah. controllers up with fucking gunk. <laughs> and it's like, why aren't you? Why doesn't this embarrass <laughs> you? Seal the seams. You know. Yeah. yeah Got to make gross. it a self sustaining oh. ecosystem. You could you could <laughs> you could breathe if you could shrink yourself to the size of like an ant or something. You could breathe in that controller in space because it's so vacuum sealed from all the fucking gunk. <laughs> I will tell you this, that I I only observed this in the last week, is that, and Dustin, I'm wondering if you noticed this, or if you, it depends on how you hold your controller. My ring, my wedding ring, Mm -hmm. is Mm -hmm. carving a groove in my DualSense controller. Like, it literally is. Like, it's, you know, like how it's, it's all textured (laughs) on the back? It's literally just totally smooth and starting to, like, indent. Where, where I hold it on that side. And it all depends on how you can hold your controller, I guess. But I didn't notice it. So now because it's smooth, I'm like constantly fingering it basically. You know, like oh. when I, like during uh. during like a cut scene, I'm just like rubbing my finger on the little nipple that I made. I put there, you know, there you go, Lockmore. Yeah, I don't I don't have my dual sense up here. These are dual shock fours that I used the entire time I was married. These don't have a mark, but I don't know about the dual sense. Maybe. I'm not very, look for it, it was now. very interesting because it's only been a few months, so it's 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 definitely the way I hold the controller. Yeah, but, and I never wore yeah. rings. Huh. In fact, my neighbor was like, "Oh, how's married life?" And I'm like, "Honestly, wearing a ring has been the most unusual part of being married, because I just never one yeah. time ever would even think to wear a ring, you know." And now it's fucking up my controllers. Great. That is thanks, Micah. That is that is a, such a fascinating thing. Because I have never once ever thought about that. Like about the idea. It's like, oh, yeah, if you're wearing a ring and you play games, you're, it's going to be harsh metal carving a groove into your into your plastic controller, potentially. That has that thought has never even come across my mind at all. Yeah. Yeah, me neither. And is your, and, uh, yeah, is your skin smooth underneath now? No, I don't. I, do you take yours off? Uh, only when I shower, cause I don't like oh. it. Like moisture gets stuck down in my I take mine off when I work out and when I shower, but yeah, so I don't, I don't notice anything about it yet, but it's, it's becoming less distracting, but it is annoying. I play with it all the time. Like me too. Just spin it. You know, um, I feel, I feel like that would drive me insane. I, I don't like the sensation of a ring like around my finger. I remember specifically like trying a ring on, like when I was like, I don't know, like 14 or 15. I remember being like, I hate, I specifically hate the way this feels. I feel like I'm being choked in some way. Or like I'm being like restrained. I don't. I don't even know. I feel like I would rather wear it on like a necklace, <laughs> like like Frodo, than than wear it on my yeah. uh, finger. Mister Frodo. That was Mr. a horrible Frodo. impression. <laughs> <coughs> that was just a horrible. Hey, one. it's Frodo. Hey, hey what's up, your boy? <laughs> hey, it's Mister Frodo over here. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> I would watch that. I would watch that Lord of the Rings. God, this lighting makes me look like a ghost. Look at me. I'm a Mediterranean man. Yeah, this isn't acceptable. That's okay. All right. What are we talking about? I have no idea. Sacred Symbols is sponsored by Freeze Pipe and their remarkable line of glassware that I use every single day because they're so damn good. Learn more now at thefreezepipe.com and use the checkout code SACRED to save 10% off your order. Dear listeners, allow me to regale you with a true story. A few months ago, I came downstairs from my home office, as I always do, and my wife points to a package on our kitchen island. It's from a company called Freeze Pipe, and it turns out they're sponsoring some of our shows, and they wanted to send me some of their products to use. Nothing out of the ordinary there. But soon after I first used my Freeze Pipe glassware, something unusual did happen. I didn't only like my Freeze Pipes or love my Freeze Pipes. I actually became a diehard Freeze Pipe loyalist. See, I've been smoking marijuana for more than 20 years now, and when you do something long enough, you develop rhythms and preferences. But Freeze Pipes bong, bubbler, and bowl are so next level good, so obviously better than what I had been using for so long, so advanced even compared to my previous preferred bong company that I had been with since college, that I'd become a permanent convert. See, Freeze Pipes' various goods work by way of specialized glycerin chambers built into the glassware. And when you put your pieces into the freezer for just an hour or two and then load up the chamber, well, you've never ever had a smoke so smooth. I'm telling you, I would know. Freeze Pipe is amazing. The bong is sublime, the bubbler a joy to use, the bowl a trusty companion that I have with me right now as I'm writing and recording this ad. And they have other pieces for you to peruse too, but they all come back to this one idea of providing high quality, thick, sturdy, well-built glassware that happens to reduce the temperature of your smoke by up to an astounding 300 degrees Fahrenheit. 
I love Freeze Pipe, and I'm so glad that they came into my life so I can evangelize their goods to the masses. As a daily user of their glassware, I can attest to the smoking transformation I've undergone. Shop the smoothest pipes, bubblers, bongs, and more at thefreezepipe.com. That's T-H-E-F-R-E-E-Z-E-P-I-P-E.com. And use the code SACRED at checkout, that's S-A-C-R-E-D, for 10% off your entire order. That's thefreezepipe.com with the checkout code SACRED for 10% off. American-owned, affordably priced, and with free domestic shipping. Order today and start fighting fire with ice. Sacred Symbols is sponsored by BetterHelp, the therapy service that lowers many of the most common barriers to seeking professional mental health treatment. Learn more now and get started on your remote therapy adventures at betterhelp.com symbols. My friends, it's vital to take care of yourself, mind, body, and soul. And as we come out of the winter months and into the spring, you may feel like your mood and disposition are, well, a little darker than usual, certainly darker than your brightening surroundings. This is why I want to tell you about BetterHelp, a longtime sponsor of Sacred Symbols and the Ultimate Therapy Service, in that it combines accessibility, convenience, affordability, and so on into a neat little package that removes virtually all of your typical excuses, founded or otherwise, that would stop you from speaking to a professional. And speaking to a professional is a necessity for all of us at some point in our respective lives as we deal with the trials and tribulations of being human. I first utilized therapy as an elementary school student in the very early 90s, and since then, I've seen someone at random points in my life multiple times, including right now, where I've been seeing someone local to me here in Virginia for a couple of years now. But I also understand that I'm one of the lucky ones. I have good insurance and transportation and live in an area with readily accessible healthcare services. I run my own business, so I'm monumentally flexible schedule-wise. And if my insurance kicks some charges back to me, it's really not the end of the world for my finances. This permutation of advantages isn't shared by many, though. And it's frankly unfair that I would have access to something so important like therapy, while others have limited to non-existent access in their own lives, for whatever reason. With BetterHelp, though, so many of these issues are ameliorated. For starters, you'll speak to your licensed therapist remotely using BetterHelp, whether via video, audio, or even just text. This is fundamentally in and of itself majorly convenient, yes. But by killing off the middlemen, eschewing an office, making sure no one has to go anywhere, and so on, that manufactures a lot of savings. And that savings is passed along to you, the client, meaning that therapy has pretty much never even remotely been this affordable. Listeners, I get it. Life is hard. Sometimes it's really hard. I know. But there's help out there waiting for you if only you're willing to take the first step. Learn to make time for what makes you happy with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash symbols today. That's B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash S-Y-M-B-O-L-S to get 10% off your first month of therapy sessions. Again, that's BetterHelp.com slash symbols for professional, high quality, affordable, accessible, and convenient therapy. Now, there are no excuses. I guess we can start talking about things that are more relevant to the show, but not yet. Zero wrote in and said, hello, boys, not a question, but just wanted to shout out Boar's Head Superiority. I live in Michigan and it was never a brand that I could find. Lo and behold, I ended up shopping at Kroger and found Boar's Head. The Sacred Boys hyped up Boar's Head and I needed something I could eat with one hand since I am a truck driver. I have to say that you boys are right. A little pricey, but worth it. Totally worth the, the extra price. I mean, not even close. If yeah. you're eating that Columbus garbage or like that store brand trash, stop. Go get your boar's head. There's got to be boar's head around you somewhere. What's that deli on the circle? We haven't talked about them in a while. Hitler's bunker. Yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, I was there in the summertime and it was awesome. And yeah, they had boar's head, but I got a meatball sub, which was also awesome. Yeah, that's strange, but that's fine. I'm sure it was great. That's a strange poll, but it's great. Nonetheless, I'm glad that you did that. Hitler's coming up a lot on the show lately. Some people um, are mad about it. Are they really mad about it? There's one guy. <laughs> There's one guy in the comments. I just notice it because he always says something. <laughs> I feel like I get a little annoyed sometimes with some of the feedback we get because like actually with um with laxative gate or whatever, people misinterpret our humor so deeply sometimes that they think that things that are overtly not even remotely serious become serious. Like people think that we're really upset about la- the laxative stuff it's like we're yeah. just joking oh well you dude. Know, like the, well, how can you listen to this show and not understand the tenor of well, it whatsoever yeah. Yeah. good people thought people thought what was the game that people thought i spoiled like it's oh it, P. P. <laughs> yeah like i mean <laughs> yeah. you've gotta you've gotta understand that at some point it's just like yeah people are just not going to people are going to listen and they're going to like it but they're not going to click with it exactly and that is fascinating to me that that people will listen extensively to something that they fundamentally don't understand. <laughs> like it's, but people do it. People do it all the time. I'm sure people go to like. I'm, I'm sure there's a bunch of like uh, people who are like really into cinema or, or into cinema who go and watch these like 
huge movies that they don't understand. And they're like, yeah, I liked mm-hmm. it, I think. <laughs> and that's kind of what's happening, I think. It's just like, yeah, I sw- yeah, I sw- yeah, you fight Walt Disney at the end of Lies of P, guys. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, and what a fight and what a boss fight it is. I it it's I was scrolling through the YouTube comments on the video version of last week's or maybe it was two weeks episode ago. No, it was last week's because it was just Dustin and I and someone had said this is hard, hard to get through. There's like so much anger or something like that or something like that. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, what are you, are you like on the wrong, like you're watching a video and then you have another window open and you think it's the comment section of like a different, and it's actually our video that you're writing in, but you're watching like a fucking, you know, like an argument or a political conversation. I don't even understand. So you can't do very much with that kind of feedback. If I have no idea what you're talking about, I've said this in the past, Nine out of 10 times people say I say something on the show. I absolutely didn't say that. Yeah. You know, people meet, leave comments all the time telling us things that were said on the show. Like, I don't even understand. So, like, at some point, you just got to kind of. I don't know. What am I going to do? What can I do about it? I've, I've gotten so much better about that, about just disconnecting. It's, it's, it's the reason I stopped posting socially on Twitter is because every post on Twitter becomes some argument about the original tweet. Like, yeah. It's kind of cringy, but I've done it as well. It's like someone tweets something out and then there's a second tweet a few hours later being like, just to clarify. And then there's like a third tweet a few yeah, hours later or the next day yeah. where it's like, oh, whatever. You guys don't. Understand. It's always the same thing. So I'm just like, eh, no one cares. It's, it's it's almost like when you tweet. Your original tweet becomes invisible, <laughs> but people can still somehow react to it. It's very strange. It's like yeah. it's like people are reacting to the memory of something that they could simply read. It's yeah. a very strange experience being on on social media in general, but there's especially also, on there, there's people calling like you're saying that say that you said something you didn't say. But another thing I notice, because like you said, people have this on in the background, they're driving, they're doing some other tasks, whatever. So they're not and I'm not saying you need 100 percent attention all the time. But if you come up and say you guys didn't talk about this when often we clearly did just in another yeah. section or you weren't paying attention. Sometimes that happens too. Sometimes mm-hmm. timestamps are general. So sometimes a little bit of something else was said in this section. Yeah. You, know? yeah. you listen like to the whole show, all yeah. five hours of it. You, you don't. Yeah. yeah. You don't have to. You don't have to attentively engage with every single moment of every single episode. But if but if you are going to comment on the episode, right. you should at the very, if you're going to engage with it, then you might as well at the very least pay attention to the thing that you're trying to engage with. That's it. I don't mind somebody who's like just listening to the show kind of passively and just kind of like minding their own business. But like when they come at you, it's like, why didn't you say this? Or why didn't you talk about this? Or like you said this and it's and it's like, no, none of that is true. Yeah. The declarative stuff. It all feeds right. in. It's all Chris. It's all in the same bucket. And we talked about this a long time ago. I remember of the the whole this phenomenon of people pretending they're blocked by other people on Twitter. Right. It's all like mm. there's all this performative stuff you have to do in comments and all this. So what I'm saying is my favorite thing is, is like I see on a regular basis people claiming that I have blocked them on Twitter when I'm looking straight at their comment. And yeah. I'm like you're not blocked. I don't know why you're lying about this. Like people always lie about the weirdest shit. I don't I don't understand. Anyway. Say what you want and engage with the content the way you want. That's totally fine. Just, you know, be a little nicer to Chris, especially. <laughs> was it w- w- was the last episode particularly angry no no i have no i actually <laughs> thought the last episode was good and was totally normal that's the point i'm making it's like what are you and then you'll and then you'll see it get like 10 thumbs up or something and it's like what is going on here i expect that at certain places like there are certain places that are clearly that clearly don't like us but talk about us like like our reddit i would say is a is a, u- a uniquely negative place where you can't like get too hung up on anything that's said there because it's usually not going to be nice no matter what like no matter what you do but it's like engaging with the content at that deeper level it's exactly what you said in the few times that i've interacted or tried to interact with people that do the content i listen to if i have a letter or a thought i'm like really meticulous about making sure that i have the full context so as to not waste their time and all that kind of stuff i don't know it just bothers me because it sets these cadences and we're totally off on i don't even know on some sort of tangent but we we it sets these cadences where it's like damn people it's easier to read the comments than listen to the content and the content's long i mean it's totally inaccessible i've said that a million times it's completely inaccessible but that's kind of by design it's a show that you're either going to get or you don't 
and at least represent the things we're saying honestly and, and kindly. Only leave nice comments, only thumb up the videos, only support us on Patreon, patreon.com slash last mm-hmm. you, you know what would really convince me to stop engaging with a lot of social media stuff is that I, 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 t- I can't remember, I can't even remember what it was, but I tweeted something and somebody was like, somebody disagreed. And then I replied with the, a copy pasted version of the same exact tweet that they were replying to, like the same exact thing. I changed nothing. And they were like, oh, well, you should have just said that. And I was like, <laughs> no, this is it. <laughs> this is People over. are illiterate, dude. <laughs> yeah. Like yeah, that's the one thing I, being on the internet has taught me more than anything is like, there's, <laughs> yeah yeah people can people can read words but they can't read that's right and, most, and many people can't even read the words you yeah know? but they're usually not i don't know i'm just shocked by that we it should be smarter than ever right we should be you know the tragedy of that is we are mm, touche <laughs> <laughs> touche yes okay oh i'm looking forward to seeing you chris i'm gonna give you a yeah, big hug mean- when i see you yeah, Ooh. in New York too. It'll be yeah. it'll be a big come coming home moment. Yeah, exactly. And I'm gonna give Dustin a big kiss on the mouth. Oh, okay. I was gonna say, so no hug. No, I'm gonna give you a smooch. Okay, good. He's gonna grope you. Yeah, he's gonna <laughs> kiss you. <laughs> <laughs> Mattias Kuklinski wrote in and said, "Hello, Sacred S- Symbols crew. The last episode of Chris Chan, a comprehensive history, has come out. At least for a long while." Dustin and Chris, did you watch the finale in Colin? I was wondering how far you got into the series before you stopped watching it. Personally, I fell off somewhere in the episode 60s during the whole dimensional merge arc. Pete Chris Chan was the first 50 to 50, 40 to 50 episodes, I think. Thanks. Mike had told me this, that this series is over. And I think I got somewhere in the teens, probably. And I'm, I wasn't I was just like, eh, it's just a lot. I mean, it's yeah. literally like, at this point, I've watched Ken Burns Civil War length documentary about <laughs> Chris Chan. Seriously, like 25 mm-hmm. hours, you know, like yeah. Ken Burns baseball or something like that. It's like it's an un- unnecessary amount of time. Uh, so you, I had to wrap it up at that point, but I'll, maybe one day I'll I'll go back. But what are your thoughts, Dustin? It's uh, it's all over, I guess. Yeah, I actually didn't know about this. I'm behind by probably four or five episodes. The later stages of this saga are nowhere near as interesting. And it's not that the documentary does a bad job. It's mostly just reading tweets and forum posts at that point and it's nowhere near as interesting or exciting but i feel like if it's coming to a close i gotta i've already made it this far so yeah. i gotta go back maybe that's something i'll download and watch on the way to new york tomorrow some it's of those fallacy <laughs> yeah so finish it up but i'm curious to his reason on why he's ending it if it's right if he's ending it probably around the uh the jail arc <laughs> The incest arc. Uh, maybe that's why. Maybe it's just time. Or maybe he wants to do other things. He's done m- more than humanly necessary uh, by many <laughs> degrees at this point. I remember saying to you when I discovered him and wondered, like, I had assumed that <clears throat> he would be making <clears throat> seven figures doing this because of how deep it is and how much traffic he gets. But maybe that's not true. I don't know. But like, I would suspect if he's smart and he is and he's an interesting dude. What's his name? Gino but, Samuel. Yeah, Samuel. G- Gino Samuel. Um he should have made a nice amount of money on this, on doing this, like a nice amount of money to go do something else now. So good for him. Uh, Chris Chan, the most famous person in my neck of the woods. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, I still, I was at, I was, I'm going to that Walmart that he was in next week to get my um, passport photo taken. So I'll let you know if I see him. Yeah. All right. I'm sure he'll be, he'll be yeah. lurking. He's going to be working there. Yeah, <laughs> I just just to say something, I yeah, I have I've been aware of this guy for so long, but I, I never kept up. Really? I think to me, Liquid Chris is the peak of like Liquid Chris oh, was the absolute pinnacle of that entire situation. And everything after that kind of it's va- it, it is interesting, but it's I don't know. I, 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 I don't really care a lot about what happens after that, really. Because like you said, it's just it's so much investment into a single person where it's like I have a lot of information on this person that's like unforgettable in my head. That's probably taking up space that could be allocated to more useful information or even just like skills. I I really do kind of feel like the older I get, the more convinced I am that your brain is indeed a computer. And there is a degree of like finite space there, even if it's kind of 
incomprehensible to even think about like how that could be measured. And so to me, I think about like, oh, yeah, I know this, this and this about Chris Chan. It's like I could replace that with something probably. <laughs> I always think about that in terms of bandwidth, like however right. our mind, um, like however our mind storage and all that tra- and like our ability to process data translates to actual computer data or whatever. I feel like you can, at least for me, I can feel when I'm like at my bandwidth or like reaching a bandwidth moment where it's like there right. are too many things going on. We just as humans, we're like, oh, we're frazzled. But I think that's like your brain saying, like, can't do all this, you know, like, yes. stop it too much. Yeah. It is interesting that there is something about Gino Samuel where like he I don't want to I don't mean this is like an insult at all, because I think it's really cool what he did. But it's like he's obsessed with Christian. Right. I mean, like. Yeah, that's an obsession to do something like that, I think, yeah. and like speaks to his own like you can meta analyze like his own yeah. you, you you could make a pretty good case you could make a pretty good argument that a documentary about Gino Samuel as somebody who is as obsessed with Christian would be as interesting potentially like there's there's not like public freakouts or anything but just the idea that someone would dedicate so much of their life and so and so much of their time to this specific thing that in and of itself is also fascinating and interesting and kind of insane like, with all due respect to Gino Samuel, he's done a really good job making this documentary, but it's also insane that you've done this. Like, well, like, it's like, it's like you could do a documentary like this long on FDR or something like that. Yeah, you know, that, that's like what's so that's the whole point. It's like it's so interesting. Yeah, that you probably couldn't. Yeah, that's 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 the thing. It's like you probably could. Well, he probably could. That's what I'm saying. It's like I feel like he could really he, he I feel like he has a lot of skill. In this arena in some way, so. So to have stuck with Christian for so long is fascinating. <laughs> it is. I agree. Yeah. Well, RIP in peace. Not Christian, but the, the documentary. Series. Yeah. Christian, I think, is alive and well. All right. Final thing. Zach Apuzo wrote in. I saw this in a few places, so I wanted to bring it up. Regarding the recent Constellation episode, I'm writing in to ask about the charter bait. Is that how you say it? Ch- or chatter bait. I always thought it was. Ch- oh, chatter bait donation sound that went off at two hours 53 minutes and 13 seconds and it says parenthetically chris i know you know what sound this is <laughs> colin did you secretly have a campsite open mid podcast dagan was it likely jaffe or perhaps micah hmm i saw this comment i mean people can be like Ooh, i have no idea what you're talking about so who could it have been it must have if it was anyone in that four people it's jaffe right it was coming from jaffe's audio i checked but from what I could tell, you could hear a sound go off and then you hear a Amazon type device go off and start talking. And you can see Jaffe. I think he mutes himself and, and turns it off. So I yeah, don't his Alexa think, turns on often. On I think that's show. what it was. But because I was going to be like that because I'm like, that's so bold. And, but that's also so weird. Yeah. And. The bold part doesn't really bother me. The weird part bothers me more. And so when I saw that, I'm like, no, there must be some explanation to this. You know, so it's Jaffe's audio. We know I that. I believe so. Yes. Um, so there's not a second shooter. The audio comes from <laughs> one one location, but we think that it's probably the Alexa thing. And I would imagine that that's what it is, because it, that that's probably happened a dozen times in the time. And I'm, I record Jaffe all the time where it's like he'll have to be like, Alexa, shut up. Like he says something that like just sets it off. Yeah. Weirder to me that isn't David Jaffe one of the most interesting people you've ever known? Like, seriously, like he, he, in my opinion, like he's one of the most I've known him for a long time, but I've really started to get to know him over the last couple of years. Like as a friend, like I consider us good friends and uh, I hope you would feel the same. And he's so interesting. Like there's so many dynamic levels to him and just the Alexa thing, like him having an Alexa. I'm like, that's so anathema to my whole it's like i'm not putting a live microphone in my house the only person i know that has an alexa in my personal life is my mom you know i'm like oh yeah no, i'm not, not doing that so people didn't have to one for a while easier you know? i'm sorry chris were you saying something no oh, no i said I, I had one for a while but i, I, uh, I didn't really see a pur- i didn't see a purpose in it i switched to the apple home pod mini just because it's much easier to connect to my phone. But the Alexa, I, wa- I realized that you can go in and 
listen to all of the recordings of when you engage with it. Yeah. And it just saves those. You can That's go nice. listen to them from two years ago. Or people something. can go people can go look it up. There's two things. People can go look it up. There were people at Amazon that I think got in trouble some years ago for spying on people through Alexa. So that definitely ha- can happen and like is built into the software. And you can, I can't even or the hardware. And I can't even imagine how the government backdoors this shit on a constant basis, even if it can't be. It's not admissible in court. It's like you can kind of get right. a bunch of information that way. I can't. even. So that's funny as hell to me. Um, and that's the first thing. But the second thing is this whole TikTok ban. And mm. oh, yeah. Um, I was listening to a podcast recently, the all in podcast, where they were talking about something we brought up in the past where it's like our phones are listening to us and we know that we know it. And yet none of the companies admit it. And we're it's just kind of this like, don't don't ask, don't tell situation where it's like we know. And he was talking about how he was talking about something very specific about coring apples was his specific analogy, how he was talking to his dog about how annoyed he was that he had to constantly cut these apples up or whatever. And then he got apple coring at like, you know, ads for like little things, handheld devices on TikTok because it came up through like, you know, TikTok clearly is a backdoor um, for all sorts of things. And they've admitted that they've used it as a backdoor too. So I don't trust any of this shit. I'm sure that they can do all sorts of things, but I'm not going to like give them nexuses to get into my house you know like even more things it's the same reason why i don't do the quick whatever they call i was gonna call it quick travel the uh <laughs> the thing at the airport where you go through quickly the oh the oh check. yeah but you TSA? have to like get do all this stuff and i'm like i'm not doing that like you might have all this telemetry on me anyway but i'm not gonna just give it to you you know like right. fuck yourself it, it's the same reason why i don't do any of the dna stuff like the dna what, like 23 and me or whatever yeah, because they, they save all of that stuff and they, they've used it to I mean, not that I've committed any crimes, but they've solved like legitimate crimes with that stuff. I think they found the Golden State Killer by like. Figuring out like he had he had like specific genes or whatever it is with cousins in that setting, and then they were able to kind of like backwards compute it to like find, triangulate him. Basically. Yeah, like basically it's like I'm just not getting I'm not I'm going to participate as little as possible in giving you that information. I, I used to be annoyed in. um. I don't think they do it in Virginia, but in California, you'll know, Chris, like at the DMV, you have to give them a fingerprint like you have to. Oh, do you remember the DMV? Yeah, like a thumbprint. I remember it being or something like that. I've never gone to the DMV here. And uh, somehow and that really bothered me. I was like, that's I don't like you having that, you know, like I just don't. It's not that it can't be garnered or taken. I just don't. I think people are too comfortable giving having all these different things that are. And so it goes back to this. It's like. Why doesn't anyone admit that these things are listening to us? If I could rip the microphone out of my, I know this sounds weird, but if I could rip the microphone out of my iPhone, I would and have it just be like a small internet and texting device. Same thing with my controller. You know, I don't know. This yeah, thing I, is I not, really hate this that. Thing can't read I really, anything. I hate that about the dual sense, really. Like it, it is the main reason why, like, I don't like to play multiplayer games on or like on on PS5 specifically because I re- I know that that thing is like on by default and I have to remember to like shut it off. What well, certain games it's off by default, but like most of them they aren't. So it's like oh man, I've, I've been talking this whole time in the middle of this fucking game, and it's just like eh, yeah. I don't like this. I don't like it. Anyway, I'm off on a rant. I don't even know what we were getting down uh, off to. Oh yeah, Zach. So I I think we've figured out the the mystery of this donation sound. I don't think it's that at all. Of course, postscript telling on yourself much yeah yeah that's because honest look i i'm not a prude or anything I, i'm not like and i can't listen like watching porn or whatever. i was gonna say listening to porn like it's an album but <laughs> i i genuinely don't know what the sound is i i don't know what yeah, he was confident made. you would know which was interesting he I, thought I, for I, sure I, you'd know i mean I, it, like what it, is it i assume it's just a a donation sound like is it the Twitch one? Because mm. I, I I assume that Chatterbait is just like a website, but you would use OBS to or, or something like that to connect to it. So maybe it's I don't know I don't know what the sound is. Yeah, well I think that maybe part of the reasoning of the three of us, you are the one that has an OnlyFans account. That so is you have true. A toe in that world, I do have a toe in that world. Mm. That is I don't that know is accurate. That warrants that much confidence. Yeah, that's crazy. Like the, the that, Zach that whole the whole the, the, 
the whole idea of like live porn is so strange to me. I don't, I, I really, I cannot, I, the same thing. I, I do not understand the appeal of that at all, even slightly. No, thank well, you. I guess I could understand the appeal of it for someone, but for me, I think that's awkward. You know? Yeah. Like well, now this awkward. is what Twitch thrives on now. Just yeah, uh, yeah, the yeah. There was that girl the who there was that You're girl good. though who did who did something that I thought was actually hilarious, where like she had like green screen booty shorts or whatever. Oh, I saw, oh, yeah, I saw that. Yeah. I, th- I was like, that's actually like intelligent. Like I I love that. <laughs> that's so smart. <laughs> it's just that's to me, a brilliant idea. It is it is smart. I, it what this all says to me about Twitch is that. And we know this based on, you know, their financials and them laying off a bunch of people, whatever. It's just like it's not going well there. And like they're willing oh, to yeah, do they need almost it. anything to make it stick, you know, which is crazy. Yeah. They seemed like they were on top of the world for so, for so long. And I was always really deeply mystified how YouTube didn't eat their lunch so much quicker. Like. It's just crazy how Twitch was actually viable and it still is mm-hmm. viable, but it's crazy how it became like a Titan when it wasn't attached. It's almost like Valve where it's like it's just this random company it was yeah. Amazon after that but but where it just kind of came out of nowhere and and dominated because remember it, there was a bunch of different ones you stream and all this and, and it was but meanwhile the titan in video i like, couldn't figure it out for so long it was very weird you know very weird yeah very strange all right let's move into the news there's a few small news items to talk about then we'll get into what we're playing then we'll get into the bigger news items then we'll get into your listener inquiries from patreon.com slash last stand media as we record this 299th episode of Sacred Symbols of PlayStation Podcast. All right. The big news here comes by way of... So you guys will remember last year, Jaffe, we were talking about Jaffe earlier. He had this kind of lead about this important person working at at, at um Sony that a lot of people wouldn't know if they weren't really deeply in the weeds, but that was nonetheless a very important person and this person had a left and he couldn't believe it. Um, and that person was Connie Booth. Connie Booth began at Sony in 1989. So imagine that. She was at Sony, I think at Sony Pictures first, and PlayStation didn't even exist as a brand for several years until, so she was there the entire time. She's going to be group general manager, um, and it's apparently group general manager action RPGs with a portfolio, according to IGN, that will include EA Motives, Iron Man, Cliffhangers, Black Panther, and BioWare's Dragon Age and Mass Effect. Um, So she had kind of maybe acrimoniously left Sony last fall. It was very surprising because... Connie Booth, for people that don't know, and we can get back into it, was the vice president of product development for many, many years at Sony. And she was responsible in a major way in getting lots and lots of games, especially early and midway through PlayStation's life cycle to the console. So we're talking about things like Crash Bandicoot. We're talking about things um, from Sucker Punch. We're talking about, or that is Sucker Punch. We're talking, or no, I'm sorry, Sly Cooper and stuff from Sucker Punch. We're talking about Crash Bandicoot and stuff from Naughty Dog. We're talking about Insomniac and those relationships. Very much involved as a production head and really a master producer. You would see, if you beat PlayStation games over the years, you'd see her name all over those credits. And so it was a big deal that she left. So she's over now at EA. I think this is a great get for them. Demetrius wrote into us on Patreon and says, Greetings, gents. As of yesterday, it's been announced that Connie Booth has joined EA with one of her duties being revitalizing the Bioware studio as reported by GamesIndustry.biz. With Booth being a veteran at PlayStation for more than three decades, is it safe to assume that such an endeavor will bear fruit? Does this perhaps showcase for EA an interest in moving away from live service models outside of EA Sports? As always, keep up the great work and best wishes for a great celebration at Sacred 300. Thank you, Demetrius, for writing in. So it is worth noting, Chris, we can go to you first if you have anything you'd like to say about Connie going to EA is, um, she did have some multiplayer games, like SOCOM was developed under her, at Zipper, but it is true that primarily it was single player fair and PlayStation was known primarily for single player fair. So that makes a lot of sense. I really f- share Jaffe's surprise that they let her walk um, and she might have been responsible in some ways for the games as a service strategy that has failed. And, and if you want to start or not failed, but has been kind of turned in some way. And if you mm, want to kind of look at yeah. it through that lens, you can. But I think this is a great pickup for Electronic Arts and should bear, I think, definitely bear fruit for those studios because she has um, a lot of good. Um, ideas and and deep wells of experience yeah i mean if anybody needs this kind of support it's it's ea i feel like they're in a weird spot especially because i don't i don't know what the hype level is for bioware stuff going forward but it's probably 
I, I can't imagine. Uh, I don't even think I'm alone on this, but like, I can't imagine that there's much care for Dragon Age or the next Mass Effect in comparison to you know what it used to be. And so, like, I th- I, I do think getting some help from Sony in this capacity, um, or getting some ex Sony help from in this capacity for like for this for th- for their slate of titles and stuff that they're working on makes sense. I just I just don't know if it's it's a good it's a good get for them. I just don't know if it's really enough to turn the tide of like where they're kind of headed because I I I don't know about you. I I I have no faith in EA at all going forward, especially because when they do have something like uh what was that game that you you championed last year that didn't do oh, Super Immortals of Baby Immortals. Yeah, Immortals like they 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 take those bets and they don't really nurture them really well and they, and they don't really like I didn't see that marketed at all. Maybe that was like them seeing the writing on the wall for that. Or maybe they were just like, ah, there's no point in marketing it because it's doomed anyway. Or like, I don't know what their thought process was, but I, I don't know. I, I feel like it's going to take more than Connie Booth to shape EA up. Dustin, you have any thoughts you want to share? Yeah, it's, uh, it seems like EA between this and also, I think this news was maybe over a year ago now, but him bringing in Vince Zampella to kind of oversee things is that they're trying to bring in these well-known established people to kind of write the ship. And I think Chris put it beautifully and just that it's, it's tough because sometimes one person can make all the difference, but at the same time to turn around an entire ship can, that's a extremely difficult task. And so Man, I think so much is riding on this new Dragon Age game for them. Um, yeah. I don't know. It's, it's always funny because they always feel like they're one bad release from not existing anymore, but that's happened twice now. And so we'll have to see what happens. I, I'm guessing her effect on Bioware specifically will most likely take place after this Dragon Age game since this is kind of mostly... Yeah. Uh, wrapped up at this point if it's supposed to come out um not this year right maybe next year so the question uh i guess is for mass effect i think that's where all eyes are on for bioware and whether they can recapture that magic that they uh try to already bring back once and fail yeah well said well congratulations to connie i mean it was clear that she was going to be scooped up if she had wanted to be if she didn't want to retire and she's young still so she has Lots to give, and I think she can help them turn things around. Though I do wonder, see, the more information we get, an intellectually an intellectually honest person, as they get more information on something, will kind of bend and be malleable towards their predisposed notions towards what they think might have happened originally. And as we, more has come out about the games as a service cancellations and the layoffs, the bungee snafu, and so on and so forth, so forth, which we'll get into later. It does make you look at something like Jim Ryan leaving under a different lens, like maybe kind of a mutual parting. I mean, again, it doesn't seem like that that's necessarily true, but it could be something like that. And you see something with Connie where it's like, though she shepherded all of these amazing games for these amazing studios, was she, why would there be consternation between everyone if she didn't have her hands in something that went wrong. Otherwise it makes no sense. Unless the entire thing was like, our games have become so expensive under you, (laughs) but, and we've been doing this for so long and you have not adequately controlled costs or maybe they were just tired of each other. I don't know, but it's just weird to be at a a place since 1989 predating the PlayStation brand by five years and then just leave like that and then end up at EA. It's like a totally different life for her now, but I'm sure she's paid very well to be there. And yeah, um, it's funny because EA has mined Sony talent before, specifically with Amy Hennig, although it didn't work out very well for them. We'll talk about Amy in a minute. Um, I just wanted to bring this up over at Push Square. I think all three of us are on a Helldivers 2 hiatus now, but they mm-hmm. wrote a story that I thought was pretty cool. It, it said Helldivers 2 paranoia peaks. Players convinced the Illuminate already walk among us. So here's what it says. It's actually by Kale Adam, who was on our show, Sacred Symbols Plus, not too long ago. One of their writers says, quote, Helldivers 2 players have served heroically in the ongoing intergalactic war effort, turning out in millions to patriotically defend Super Earth from the external threat of both bug and bot. But reports have begun to trickle in about a new enemy faction moving in the shadows, or perhaps more appropriately, the return of an old nemesis, one known as the Illuminate. 
Some even suspect they are already walk amongst us, which is obviously the fetus nonsense. I like the I like writing it uh, from this perspective, by the way. He goes on yeah. and says, quote, the Illuminate were an enemy faction in the first Helldivers, an ancient technology, technologically advanced race of aliens hellbent on destroying super Earth. We all know that they were wiped out long ago, like those pernicious, completely false reports of flying bugs that simply do not exist. Still, some patriots perhaps suffering from battle fatigue are reporting coming under fire from a vibrant blue laser, which something matches the energy signature of sniper weaponry employed by the Illuminate previously. It's pretty distinct from the red energy weapons used by both Helldivers and bots, but visual evidence remains inconclusive. Um, so there's this theory that, um, and Push Square has this theory that the Helldivers alert Twitter account is actually run by Arrowhead and that they strategically leak things on it. So they tweeted out a little while ago pictures of the Illuminate, like leaked models of the Illuminate. And then the CEO of the, of the company tweeted out, blue beams aren't real, it can't hurt you. And then there are videos of it really appearing, like this blue, this random blue beam. Chris, I want to get you in on this because Dustin and I talked a little bit about this last week, but I love this dynamic level of updating and that it's cool that they kind of like hot fix and just add things to the game dynamically. I was curious what you think of it as a kind of a multiplayer gamer. It seems unique to me in some sense to, to have like this level of propagandistic denial that plays into the game. It's very, very yeah. cool. And I wonder how much they can do with it. Yeah, it's it's very... I like anything that that is that allows itself to be played in a meta way in real life. You know what I mean? Like if, if there's like some way to in, engage with it beyond just the game without it feeling like without it feeling like destiny where it's like a second job <laughs> where, you you know, you feel like you have to pay attention to everything and you have to dedicate a certain amount of time to, you know, every week to unlock stuff. And I like the I like the fact that this is a game that kind of. It follows you everywhere only in the sense that like you constantly hear interesting things about it. And even just in this article, how it's like written from the perspective of (laughs) it's like written with some flavor that you don't know, you don't normally see in articles covering games like these. It's cool. Like I I like the way that they're teasing this stuff. I like that the way that they're they're dropping all this stuff. I like that the way that I like the way that they're testing this stuff, too. And like, I I think this is because this is how the uh, the buggy got leaked, too. Right. Because weren't they just appearing in certain matches? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just very cool. Just a very organic, or organic way of of updating without. Hey, th- here's a weekly update, or like one of those like splash screens that pop up at the beginning of a game. It's like here's this week in Hell Divers, and it's like there's a buggy, or like there's blue beams. Instead, it's just like authentically playing off of social media, which is awesome. I love it. There's been an update too. I was looking on the Helldivers Twitter account and there's a post from one hour ago. It says breaking in a shocking turn of events. Sightings of flying bugs have been reported from the front lines. According to the Ministry of Truth, no previous sightings have ever been recorded in history. (laughs) 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 Which is just it's very it's very funny. It's cool. They really have a good thing (laughs) going on over there. We'll talk about them a little while, too, in terms of sales. All right. Thought I'd read this. This is from Bloomberg. It looks like Pal World is looking to come to other consoles. Of course, Pal World came to Xbox One, Xbox Series, and Windows early this year in early access format. It has apparently sold more than 15 million units in addition to the people that are playing it on Game Pass. So you would assume this game maybe has 25 million players at some point. Obviously, broke all sorts of records, uh, uh, appeared high on the steam concurrent charts is still heavily played to this day and it looks like it'll be migrating over to playstation according to um reporting from bloomberg although it doesn't use playstation specifically it just says other platforms you would have to assume switch would be a pretty interesting place to put it to although would there be an issue there i I think nintendo would just want money personally if they have no legal problem with it i don't know why you wouldn't allow that so um what are your thoughts here about this dustin uh pal world coming on over would you like to see it on PlayStation? It makes sense to come to PlayStation. Everyone can make a lot of money over there. Yeah, I think when we talked about this originally, I and and maybe this info is out there. I wasn't sure if they had made a deal with Xbox for some term of exclusivity or if it was a case where for a while, PlayStation was very hesitant about putting games that were early access right. on the console. I think that's what it is. I, I, I assumed that as well. The first thing you said at first, that it was like it's a money deal, but it doesn't seem like that. It really does seem like it was just early access. Right. but. It's interesting because that game Temtem, I believe, came 
via early access unless we're dealing with the semantics of a an in development game versus one that they're saying oh it's the early access for and it's we're adding new things i i wonder what the actual definition of what sony requires in the background but yeah it's surprising that it wasn't on playstation and clearly it would have sold a lot if it was available on playstation day one i'm curious about Tem- uh not temtem pow world being a game that really was a a zeitgeist game uh, at the beginning of the year and now i don't want to say it's nobody cares about it anymore but we i think overall the the huge explosion has moved on so i wonder if uh how successful it would be surely enough to be worth it still but i am curious about the future of the game i had a good time playing it it was definitely early access in a lot of ways and i got to the point where i decided i would like to just wait to check it out again but Having PlayStation available with crossplay, I think, would be pretty cool since this game clearly a lot of people were into this when it came out. Sorry, I'm just doing some math. So they've sold, let's say, 15 million copies at $30 a piece in addition to the Game Pass money that they got, which whatever it was. So that's $450 million gross or 315 net once. So it really wouldn't be that it would be gross, you know, not with taxes or whatever, but with um, Steam's cut taken. The game cost six point seven million dollars to make. So they made over three hundred million dollars in profit on the game. Now, an important thing to note about this is they say this in the in the Bloomberg article. Quote, for now, Pocket Pair, which is the developer, is content to remain an independent studio and maintain the intimacy of its small team. The company is in talks to bring Power World to more platforms beyond Steam and Game Pass, so that's what we talked about, and to be open and consider offers for partnership or acquisition. It has not, however, engaged in acquisition talks with Microsoft. This is what I thought was interesting, though. This is according to their studio lead. He says, quote, We are and will remain a small studio. I want to make multiple games. Big budget AAA games are not for us. End quote. I think that people would look at this and be like, damn, dude, you guys made an extraordinary amount of money. But can you rely on that pop? And the answer is, is that they probably can for their next game. But no, I, I it's still people would say, like, why not just make 10, six point seven million dollar games and see if any of them stick? And I'd be like, the likelihood is that none of them will stick. And you might make a lot of money, you know, a lot of money comparably. But you're not, again, this it, it's what I get back into the hell divers. It's like it's still it's not it's not enough money. They want more. Um, this is an amazing margin to um, yeah. to behold, though. Uh, do you have anything you want to say about Pal World, Chris? Did you guys either of you you played it? Both of you? I I, play I played yeah. I played a little bit of it. I wouldn't say that I wouldn't I wouldn't say I played it like in the way that like a lot of people are supposed to. I, I fucked around with the controls. I crafted a couple things. I got a sense of you know the UI and movement and all that stuff. But I think I played it for like maybe like an hour and a half max. Um, all said and done, not a game for me, not uh, my style of game. Definitely early access, very, very jank. I might be curious enough to pick it up when it's when it's got its 1.0 or whatever, but uh, I, I don't know. Like, I'm just not a survival game person in this in this aspect. I've, I've never been drawn to like dust or, or uh, arc or what, what's that other one? There's like another one that's like huge. Uh, Do- is it? Is- Rust. I, I, I was thinking Dust for some reason. But uh no, Dust 514 is not yeah. still relevant. <laughs> the uh yeah, so I, I don't know. It, it's not something that I'm interested in, but it, it does make sense for it to be on PlayStation. I mean, they, I feel like they can make a boatload of money there, especially uh especially if when it comes to PlayStation, there's like a handful of uh, quality of life changes that weren't there on the Series X and uh original launch. I think that would go a great deal. Or that would go a great way of uh, making that a an enticing offer for people, but yeah, I, I can't say I'm interested in it personally. All right, this was announced. I don't really care about this personally, but apparently people are really into it. Um, we'd be loath to ignore it. So I think this was announced at GDC actually, which is unusual. But Marvel is publishing or have or uh, I guess having licensed a game to Skydance for something called 1943: Rise of Hydra on its website. It's described as, quote, in the chaos of war, worlds collide. Captain America and Azuri, the Black Panther of the 1940s, must overcome their differences and form an uneasy alliance to confront their common enemy. 
fighting alongside Gabriel Jones of the Howling Commandos and Nanali, a Wakandan spy embedded in occupied Paris. They must join forces to stop a sinister plot that threatens to turn the havoc of World War II into the ultimate rise of Hydra. And quote, it comes out in 2025. It's on Unreal 5, I believe. And there's no platforms announced yet, but I assume PlayStation 5 will be one of them. James Hill has written in and said, hey, Bussy Blasters have, or Bussy Blasters, I'm sorry, have you guys seen clips of Marvel 1943, The Rise of Hydra? The shit looks damn near live action. Have a great one. Dustin, what's key about this for a lot of people is the inclusion of none other than Skydance's own Amy Hennig, who has been kind of waiting in the wings and has been unable to get her projects out. And I do think it's been so long now, kind of where it's like, I don't know, if this means anything anymore, but we'll see. I think it will. And Uncharted was remarkable, of course. So what are your thoughts here? Are you interested in this game? Um, People seem to be really stoked about it. I'm just so over, obviously, all this superhero shit at this point. Yeah, I watched the trailer, you know, last night or this morning, and it definitely the graphics are very impressive. I think they were showing it off at something that Epic was doing as a Unreal 5 showcase type thing. And it looked very impressive. I got to say that I think what interests me the most about this game is the setting being in World War II. I think that that seems pretty cool because that man, that first Captain America movie of the phase one Marvel stuff, that was uh, maybe not my favorite, but one of the ones I liked more just because the setting was so unique for that world. So I am interested in it from that perspective, but I want to see gameplay. Of course, always. It's interesting. No hype, though until gameplay yeah fair enough any interest in this chris yeah on a surface level like i I like i i don't disagree with people who are talking about how impressive the visuals are i do think that's very true like it uh, it's some of the most impressive facial animation that i've seen in a while it's where i couldn't really there were parts of it where i'm like that actually does look live action and it's not just people saying that which I find I find a lot of people say that for a lot of games that just have high fidelity, but it, it doesn't actually look real. It just looks very detailed, which is I think those are different things. Um, but yeah, the animation work is superb. I, I just I'm kind of with you, Colin, where I uh, <laughs> I I do not give a shit about superheroes at all at this point, even slightly. So. 1943 awesome year awesome time awesome place for us for awesome setting for a game awesome but the fact that i i have to go there with the caveat of being captain america fighting with the black panther is uh pretty infuriating to me yeah uh, yeah so i don't know I, like like dustin said though if the game looks good like if if the game play if the actual gameplay looks good i'm yeah I, i'm willing to give it a shot but this alone hasn't sold me all it's really done is make me kind of impressed with the animation quality of it which is objectively very good like very 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 good yeah it's a hard no for me for the same reason where i'm just i don't care what it looks like i'm not i can't but the the only superhero game that i'm really interested in maybe potentially is iron man just because i like that character it's the same thing with spider-man like if spider-man iron man batman that kind of stuff I'll, I'll still probably mess yeah. around with, but the whole wider universe, it's like, eh, I don't, I don't even like Wolverine. I'll play because it's coming from Insomniac, but even that, I'm like, I don't really give a shit about this. To be honest with you, it's it's like it's, I'm I'm excited. People yeah. are excited about it. I just don't know how many of these games are we gonna get. This is it's like how many earnestly like aren't people tired of this? Don't they want something? It, it's like all Star Wars, all Marvel. All <laughs> yeah. It's like, damn, dude, like You're where right. is the flavor and the and the texture and the the variety? Yeah. Don't you're you- asking that of you're asking that of an industry, though, that that. Indulges itself on, you know, an annualized Pokemon game that has barely any effort put into it and, and annualized Call of Duty games that are more or less kind of the same. You know, if if there's ever. If there was ever an industry to lend itself well to the sheer repetition of of Marvel and superhero stuff, it is unfortunately video games. I say that with love for the industry, but. Yeah, it's it funny it because is. it's not that I have an aversion to things going on forever because I don't like I, I really have this. I don't have an aversion to perpetual licenses and franchises, but I think of it more right. like James Bond or something where it seems. 
and I'm not into Bond at all, but it seems more tasteful. It's like we have these generations of Bond. Then within there, there are these different films. There's one every few years and there are the books, right. obviously, in the beginning and all the rest. And it's like, OK, that's cool. And that's the way I would even like things like Uncharted to continue if they continue with Cassie Drake or whatever. It's like, that's cool. It's been so long. It's just the repeatability of it happening too soon is the problem. It's not that yeah. there isn't a Marvel game every few years. That would be great. If that, if that was the case, it just people, they just. Why do you want to wring so much out of out of the market like that? Well, I mean, it's obvious you want to make a lot of money, but I think it's dangerous. Personally, I think you're overexposing yeah. yourself. And uh, I just I just don't I don't know what I don't know what what interesting gameplay possibilities Captain America presents, really. That's kind of the, the, the curiosity for me, where I'm just like, what are you going to have this guy do that's more fun than swinging around like Spider-Man? Like, I, I can't fathom. Because you're just a guy. He's, he's a really strong guy, but he's not like he's not even like Superman tier strong. You know, he's just, he's just like a really jacked. It might as well just be you might as well just be playing a game about a really healthy person. So like with a I, shield with a shield. Oh, yeah, I guess yeah. he does have a shield. The shield is the, the coolest part that he can throw and it's like, you know, bounces off guys and I, stuff. But outside yeah. of that. I don't and know. who is Hydra? This is the are they are they like other Nazis? Yeah, they're like Nazi Nazis. I think is kind of like the. I'm trying under, to remember. <laughs> there's gonna be people so mad. Oh, at us for I mean, not knowing why, just, why do you? <laughs> it's just weird that you would go to World War II and then invent a bad guy. It's like right. Yeah, there are a few good ones to choose from here. I think the you idea I, I think the idea is kind of like an Assassin's Creed Templars thing where it's like kind of this ancient thing that's been around for a long time that's been pulling the strings of like a lot of a, a lot of evil things that then occur in real life. You know, like so I think like the Nazis are like an incarnation of Hydra or something. Mm, is okay. how I understood it from like the movies and like my limited understanding of this fucking universe. Here we go, Colin. Originally a Nazi organization led by the Red Skull during World War II, Hydra is taken over and turned into a neo-fascist international crime syndicate by Baron Wolfgang von Strucker. It's kind of got like shades of Cobra in some sense. It's interesting. The um, Yeah. You don't. uh, Although I guess Cobra is more overtly they're overt terrorists in some sense, but. I don't know. I, I, I don't. It's so funny, like the top 10 adversaries to Western civilization of all time, right? Three of them. Are in World War Two already, and one of them is potentially the biggest in the Nazis. It's like you don't need to get any cuter than that. I don't think, you know, like we don't need a yeah. Hydra. What is Hydra? Yeah, well, it's, it's hard to it's hard to bring modern children into a movie theater where where they're Nazis <laughs> where they're fighting right? Nazis. I, yeah, it used to be fine. It used to be fine for Indiana Jones to like melt Nazis faces off. I don't know why that's a problem now, but I think we need we need cute terminologies now. Instead. Yeah, yeah. Mm. yeah. In other words, it's not that I want the Nazis to be the bad guys in a lot of things. It's just that like you're where you're in 1943. I mean, you're already there. You're there. Right. That's exactly right. You're, you're not going to grab a there. slice. You're not going to grab a slice in New York. Come on. You're there. You're right. Right. Don't be stupid. Right. Grab a slice. Well, at least I'll be able to release it in Germany with no problems. Grab a Nazi. <laughs> I wanted Chris. Let's stick with you. I wanted to know what you thought of this. Just a random mm, thing that people yeah. would be pointing to. And I, I always say his name wrong. It's Marcus Leto. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, because I, I want to say Leto, you know, but it's not. I mean, it's I'm Leto. sure I'm, the H I think kind of says that maybe it would be Lay. Yeah, Leto. So he was the art director, right, at Bungie for a really long time, and the original Halo games, and on Destiny, I think as well. He went over to EA. And um, was headlining their Ridgeline Games brand for a while, and they were going to make a single player Battlefield game. And so he randomly quit. And then a few days later, they just laid everyone at the team off, which apparently, according to his public prognostications, and I don't know for sure, he wasn't aware that that was going to happen. But I just thought this was interesting. He said this on Twitter, quote, not been saying much here since I don't have anything positive to say about EA. (laughs) My recent departure <laughs> and how so many, including my team, are suffering due to the industry sweeping layoffs, end quote. What do you make of that? It's very I just just a passing comment, but I wonder if you take anything yeah. from that. Yeah, I mean, I, I 
<laughs> I really love these original Bungie, Bungie guys. Like the, the, their candor is so wild. But yeah, I, I, I mean, it's disappointing. That was one of the more interesting things that EA had lined up, in my opinion, was was that that single player battle battlefield project from from this guy and his team. And so for for that to be kind of done with is pretty disappointing and and really in in from my estimation pretty bad for ea considering that was i mean you had that and then you have these struggling bioware games that i i, I don't imagine are um like we just went over are, are, are I, I don't imagine are particularly um confidence uh boons so like i i, I don't know i i think i'm really curious as to what even happened because why even go through the trouble of getting this guy to beyond this project like have the economic realities really shifted that drastically in the short period of time that they've been working on this like it can't be that they were taken by surprise by how much a project like this would cost or i i i just wish i wish i knew more but uh, i do think it's it's cool to see somebody just kind of be honest, like yeah i don't got anything positive to say about it <laughs> there's a level of brassness there that's like that's pretty i, I love i i want it it reminds me of e3 in like the early 2010s you know what i mean where like the it, it felt like the industry was a little bit smaller and so you could get away with a lot more and there were a lot more people who were a lot more candid whereas like now i it's an attitude of a, of a bygone era now um or at least that i've seen a lot of people have flowery kind of pr tweets whenever mm-hmm. something like this happens and it's nice to have uh people who are a little bit more open well i mean um, if he was truly blindsided by the complete closure of his team. I mean, that that's a lack of a breakdown of communication. Yeah, that would be pretty major. And if like it was on the razor's edge and him leaving kind of caused them to make that decision, that's a lot to live with. And what and maybe he was maybe he would have made a different decision. Again, that's all just I don't know if yeah, that's true, but it's just my thoughts on that. I will say that. It's um, unfortunate that and it's not just because he's talking shit about EA. I actually, I don't really have a problem with EA. I think EA is a lot better than they used to be in a lot of different ways. So I'm not talking shit from that that point of view, but it's kind of a bummer that it requires either people like us that are just kind of outside, but not very powerful, or people in positions of power, but that are independently rich and responding right. like it is to be able to say what they need to say and put out what needs to be put out. It's just kind of a bummer that, and maybe it shouldn't be so safe, but it's not safe enough for people to kind of speak their minds like that. He made a lot of money, right? Like a lot of it. Presumably, and, and yeah, I would I, imagine so. I mean, considering where he when he was there, he was there for the sale to Microsoft. He was there when they spun off. He was there for the Activision deal. He was there like he probably I would assume someone in that position made tens of millions of dollars. I mean, that's my my prediction. And yeah, you, at that point, you're working because you want to, not because you have yeah. to. And so it gives you a, a level of latitude, which I think is pretty cool. And um, I just I just wish more people were more comfortable saying more. But I understand why they're not, especially in a time when jobs are truncating, where people are losing jobs and will simply not get another job in the industry. And it's not. Yeah, it's not just games. It's I mean, you know, my brother, I know my, my brother's really struggling in animation right now, too, that that industry is in like even worse shape. And so it's just a bummer that there there are too many people that want to make games and there are not enough like ways for them to do that. And they have to kind of move on. All right. Two more things quickly. Video Games Chronicle reports that the Callisto Protocol developer Striking Distance has announced a new spinoff game tentatively titled, according to them, Project Bird's Eye. It says on Video Games Chronicle, quote, Project Bird's Eye is an action roguelike game set in the same universe as the 2022 survival horror game, which Striking Distance says is being worked on by a small team alongside its next full scale game. Um, And then in a video, which they're kind of citing someone from the team says, quote, we're excited to introduce you to something we've been working on. Since it's still in development, we're referring to it internally as Project Bird's Eye. It's our take on a fast action roguelike experience set in Black Iron Prison. Last year, a small group of us began working on a passion project that was born out of our obsession with easy to pick up and play games, but fun to master roguelikes. We love the world we created with the Callisto Protocol and want to keep playing in that sandbox. And Black Iron Prison is the fir- perfect future punk playground for the team's vision. And then they continue, quote, as you can tell, this isn't the Callisto Protocol 2. Think of it as a side quest that really resonated with the team. It let us expand the world of the Callisto Protocol and stretch our stretch our creative muscles on something a bit different without impacting development on our next AAA game. So much of the Callisto Protocol's post-launch journey was shaped by the community. It made sense to bring everyone in during an early phase of development to see its, if its concept clicks with you as much as it has with us. Um, so, of course, this studio was founded by Dead Space's Glenn Schofield, who 
left. So he's not there anymore. And they also laid off 32 of their 90 uh, af- headcount after the launch and kind of the Callisto Protocol sold millions of copies. It's actually sold, I think, 5 million copies or something, but they they ended up losing money on it. So they're working on an Unreal 5 game now. I assume it's not a Callisto Protocol game. Maybe it will be Callisto Protocol 2. I mean, that would be pretty bold to just try it again because I think they were onto something. I just don't think it was extremely well executed, but it was it was fine. Uh, any interest in this game from either of you? Let's go to you, Dustin. We haven't heard from you in a minute. I haven't played uh, Callisto Protocol yet, so I have not not in a negative way, just zero interest in this game. I am curious what they'll try to do, if they'll try to give it another shake with uh, the second one. But it, it came at a time where when that game came out, I was playing something else and then Dead Space came out, the remake, and everyone was talking how much better Dead Space remake was. So I was like, well... I I'm, I may get to it at some point but I don't I don't feel like yeah. I need to run and and go play it but um yeah I forgot about Glenn Schofield leaving after that so must feel um you know he he created and started that company so t- they they released this first game and now they have a new leader or something so it's good to see them already just back on it even with just a smaller project as they work towards something bigger Chris, as I recall, you did play Callisto Protocol. I did too. I platinumed it. Um, yeah. And just to correct myself, this is according to Wikipedia. Quote, the game failed to meet sales expectations of Krafton, who, who's the publisher, who expected sales of 5 million units, but lowered their estimate to reaching 2 million units within 2023. So not quite as lofty as I thought. Anyway, go ahead, Chris. Are you interested in returning to the Callisto Protocol universe? Uh, I mean, I, I, I think there was something there with the first Callisto Protocol. I think... Uh, I kind of enjoyed it. I thought it was I, I thought there were some elements of it that were strange and especially like the, I remember that dodging mechanic being like very odd, but there was something about how odd it was that made it a lot more interesting to me to play than just another, you know, third person, you know, action game that there's there was something there that I felt like they had a a grasp on, even if it wasn't fully realized. I guess for me, the question is now it's like having some time to not really think about the Callisto protocol for, for quite some time now. Do I have really any vested interest in returning to that world or those, or those characters? The answer is not really. I'm curious as to what that studio can do, maybe even with a similar type of game. But uh, I can't say that the, that the universe of the Callisto protocol really beckons me in any, in any real way. Although I, you know, this game, this thing that they're talking about, this spinoff or, whatever the trailer is that they showed. Artistically, it looks cool. I don't know if I'm necessarily into playing it, but I like the style of it. Mm-hmm. It's a very, 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 very different style than, <laughs> than the Callisto Protocol, which I think is cool. It's, it's smart to kind of give your universe uh, versatility in that way or kind of set the cadence of expectation where like, okay, yes, yeah, so this is our universe or whatever, but we can kind of do whatever we... We'll do whatever we want uh, visually or stylistically to achieve the the goal that we want. And that I think is cool. Yeah. Um, yeah okay I also think it's that. very low risk. I also think it's very low risk given how few people are invested in the Callisto Protocol universe as it is. So there's not really a lot of people. There's not a lot of Callisto Protocol purists, I would imagine. So there is like a freedom in, in experimentation that kind of lends itself to that uh, in fairness. But yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm rooting for Striking Distance. I love that name. Uh, and I think... I think they can make a solid game. Uh, and so I guess all that really remains is waiting for the time to come for them to really, really something that hits. And I, I do think it's possible. Um, but uh, I just don't know what it's going to be. I don't know if it's necessarily all that wise to do a close up protocol too, but that's also kind of ballsy. Yeah. So, I don't think it's, I don't, I don't think it's the right move either, but maybe make a different game. Maybe again, keep the universe the same, but just do a different game from some other perspective in that universe and kind of have them can interconnect it. I think the game looks really cool, but we'll see if it, if it comes to fruition, it shouldn't make cost them too much to make, but it does look pretty kinetic. So yeah, go check it out. If you guys want to on YouTube, it's called project bird's eye. First look from the striking distance studios, YouTube channel. Final thing I'll just speak on quickly. I was sad to see this is, uh, and this was reported by many uh, outlets that have that, you know, Jap- Japanese um, language readers that can, translate the stuff for we Western audiences, but Matsumi Inomata has passed away. She was age 63. 
She is well known as being the character designer of many a Tales game going all the way back to the second ever Tales game, which is Tales of Destiny, which is my favorite Tales game. And people that know, um, I guess, the aesthetic of Tales will know, like, will appreciate the watercolory kind of. It's it's the character designs, if you're into Tales, in my opinion, are as attached to that series as a mono logos are to Final Fantasy, where like it's a very specific look. And you can tell in terms of she didn't work on all of the game, all of the Tales games, but many of them. And she didn't work on a rise, which I thought was good. But you can kind of tell, in my opinion, that there's something missing there. So um, it's unclear why she like what she passed of. Apparently, her sister reported it on Japanese social media again, age 63. And uh, she was in the industry since the 80s. So RIP to you. I love tales and I'm sad to see that that has happened. Okay. Let's get into the games we're playing. Chris, you and I are both playing Final Fantasy VII Remake, so I guess we can start there. I'm going to do a sit down with Dagan next week on Knockback, I believe, and get into it deeply. And we already did a podcast back in 2020 about it. Um, but I'm playing it again as you are. I beat you yeah. didn't beat it the first time through, right? I, did. I don't believe so, no. So do you have any I, I'm gonna kind of reserve my what I have to say for it. And I'm on chapter 14 now, and that's kind of the last chapter where there's like side quests, and there's a lot of them. So I'm just kind of cleaning those up and going through it, but then I'll probably beat it in the next couple of days, maybe right when I get back from New York and move on with yeah. my life. Do you have anything you'd like to say about it? Um, I mean, I'm still pretty or like I I opted so because i was kind of in already like relatively far not super far in relative to jrpg standards but far in enough that i was like i don't necessarily want to restart but i do want to kind of get reacquainted with the the controls and the systems and all that so i kind of i started a new game for about like two hours and then i kind of jumped back to my original save to continue just to so i'm at a at a point where i kind of grasp or I'm, I'm I'm back in that mode and zone, but I haven't really progressed to new places from my experience much from when I've last played it. I'm going to put more time into it this week because uh, I do want to kind of get through and, and get into rebirth kind of as soon as possible. Um, but I'm enjoying it. I'm playing it on the Steam Deck through that through that um, through that. Uh, what is it? The remote play thing. And it is such a good it is such a good Steam Deck game. And by extension, I would imagine a very good portal game, too. If you've got that great Internet situation where there's like just no latency, playing that game in bed is really, really cozy. Something about like the the, the style of it and the the soundtrack and just the sound, all of it just like it kind of lulls you to sleep, which is kind of a problem because it's impeding my progress a little bit because it's strangely relaxing, even when it's like kind of chaotic. Mm. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm getting through it. Um. I really, I, I'm, I'm thankfully past the point where I feel like I need to deal with, I haven't, I haven't heard from Chadley in a while. So I'm feeling good about that. Good. Very well. That's like a good, fe- that's a good feeling. <laughs> that's always a nice feeling with his material. He's unusually powerful, unusually smart, you know, makes the materia. He has the VR kind of Coliseum thing going on with the summons and it's just, it's a lot. Yeah. Dustin, do you have anything you'd like to add on about rebirth? Yeah, uh, I just saw last night PSA for everybody. There is a patch out for the game that is supposed to improve graphics quality. And they added two modes, a sharp and a soft mode for performance. I messed with this for five minutes. It came out right as I was kind of getting ready to go to bed, but I wanted to check it out Uh, just for my very brief five minutes. I didn't notice much of a difference, but uh, I'll be able to report on that better next week. They also made some changes, Colin. I saw that the mini games didn't your inverted controls didn't carry over to certain mini games. And so they have fixed that. So you won't have an issue when you good, play. Very good. Yeah, that's a, that's a night. It's so nightmarish to think that that kind of stuff can even get through with the no one being like, you can't do this. <laughs> yeah, you know? it's weird. Like, I don't know. I, it's, it's it's always strange. It's like what I said. I played Zelda on Wii U back in the day at E3 and you couldn't invert the controls. And it's and they're like, oh, we can't do that yet. It's like, oh, okay. Yeah. And I can't play. The other funny thing, too, if you guys remember, there was the yellow paint debate mm, yeah. because there's yellow paint on some of the, the different things you can climb up. It's it's a little on the nose, but I get it. 
there is a small part of this game where you're in a cave, no spoilers, where there is not yellow paint on a wall that you can climb. I was able to see it and and had no problem, but apparently a lot of players had no idea that they could climb this wall and were getting stuck and had to look up <laughs> where to go. And so they went and added some kind of vines or something. They they made it more obvious. Mm. It's just very ironic after this yellow paint debate, everyone's saying how annoying it is, how unrealistic it looks. Indeed. And then the one section they don't add it, <laughs> no one knows where to go. So <laughs> obviously there's a lot of arguments about other ways that you can point players in the right direction, but it was pretty ironic. But I think that I'm hoping next week I was kind of hoping I could beat it before New York, but I, I don't want to at this point. I definitely can't. And earlier this week, I didn't want to rush through things. At the end, I'm just taking my time, not doing everything, but trying to savor it. Cause this is going to be one of those games that uh, you can't play twice. Oh, well, you can play twice, but it won't be the same, right? The, the, the second time you play it. So I really want to make sure right. I get the full experience out of it and just having a, a fantastic time. Highly recommend it. How's the story? Still. Story's great. It's yeah. very fun. Yeah. Uh, I mean, fun. Not. Into, I mean, yes, the gameplay is fun, but is it like all? Is it like alternate universe echoes of Final Fantasy VII again? Alternate er, universe echoes. Yeah, like. Yeah, like <laughs> is 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 it is it manipulating what happened in Final Fantasy, in the original Final Fantasy VII in, in in ways like the like Final Fantasy remake did? Yes. I don't I don't want to get into it. Um it's it's hmm. the same it's the same basic like you you hit the same points on the map, but there are some different things and I'm very very curious where they're going to go in the end. I initially was feeling really nervous about someone spoiling stuff for me, but it seems to have been okay, but now I say that I'm going to be dodging like crazy. But yeah, they they do a lot of cool and interesting things with the story. I will say, uh, I'm curious what you guys will think, because I think this game feels more silly in a Japanese way than the previous mm. ones. There are some Yakuza esque silly moments in this game that I really, really enjoy. But I wonder if those with less uh, Japanese anime sensibilities won't like that aspect of it. Uh, it's not in your face all the time. It's not yeah. like a completely different tone, but they definitely weren't afraid to make it a little more silly. Yeah, it's funny. I in playing remake. And I always say this, I don't remember anything about games I play after a while. Like, it's it's just so funny to me. Like, I, you just move on. You remember little touchstones, but I, I just can't remember everything from these games. It's a lot more silly than I remember it being, actually, mm -hmm. in some sense. The that that new character that you meet on the motorcycle early on in the game. I, I was, oh yeah. Yeah. Like it's funny. It's cool, but it's very Japanese. And I, I was, I was actually talking to Micah when we were um, on our way home from my mom's house for St. Patrick's day dinner. And my, my nephew Declan, who's a high school senior was playing final fantasy seven. And he was like, that's ah, kind of like very anime in Japanese. And I'm like, I know what you mean. Like if you aren't, inoculated to that sort of thing or were brought up in that kind of thing and they're like it, it probably is very strange and that they ramp that up is a little bit surprising because i think it's kind of maximal in final fantasy 7 remake from a perspective of like a mainstream audience like i don't know how much more you can do until they're like Ugh, this is yeah but but that's kind of the secret though is like by the second time you're already so invested because you've already finished the first one you're yeah. just like well damn I, I'm not I'm not going to turn away now. I just spent money on this game. I finished the first one. It's like a, a, a non negligible amount of hours. I can stomach through some more anime nonsense than I would normally tolerate from a first outing yeah. to get through this. Yeah, or at least you would imagine and by that point, you're probably so attached to the characters that you could probably they could probably throw a lot of stuff at you and, and you'd you'd be fine. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm surprised. People weren't like I saw videos of people being completely thrown off by Kate's Kate Kate Sith, and I was mm. I was so happy that to see other people completely throw it because there's all of a sudden there's a fucking Digimon, and uh, <laughs> it's just like all right, I guess, I yeah, I forgot is, about that too in remake that like she just randomly appears. <laughs> she shows it. There's great reactions of people like, what the fuck is that? And I, to me, I'm like, oh, awesome. Yeah, like, she witnessed this or whatever from this perspective, and. That's part of what I was talking about, Dustin, is and what I've been more openly saying is like Final Fantasy 7 and Final Fantasy 7 Remake are different. 
and they both happened. Like, that's how I understand it. You know, mm-hmm. I don't know if that's like pulled through in the second game or not, but and that's not really that's that's not yeah. a spoiler. That's why I encourage people to it's not spoiling it at all. That's why I encourage people to play them both, you know, because it's not the same, yeah. you know, and it's frustrating to yeah. me that people are like, especially when I'm going into Final Fantasy seven remake again, knowing Final Fantasy seven so well. And then knowing Final Fantasy seven remake from my previous playthrough, you get even more out of this one where like this is pretty deep and there's a lot of symbolism in it and like the where it goes off the beaten path and how and why and how it, and how things are altered and it's dope you know it's really cool will, it's really yeah. thoughtful and the remake name is a misnomer you know maybe mm-hmm. intentionally so i will i'll save you guys from a comment here kate kate sith not a girl oh i always Whatever. thought you, i always thought you well we, I don't even i don't think you even say it kate sith I think it's like Kai Shi or something, right? Isn't it? Wasn't that a thing? Uh, yeah, they they say Kate Sith though in fuck out of here. Oh, then like in the in the VO. Yeah, yeah, yeah. good. Because I I remember that was one of the things people would make fun of you about, like the weebs. You know, back in oh, the day, like, you're not saying that right at all. That's it's Kai Shi. Yeah, and I'm like, oh my god, dude. It says Kate that, that Sith. Re- that reminds me of the 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 Tenkaichi pr- pronunciation. Everybody was like, you're saying, te- you're saying, you're saying Tenkaichi wrong or whatever the fuck. And it's like, it's Tenkaichi. They say it in the fucking menus of every single game out loud. Okay. So take it up with them. They, they did it. Hi. They, they <laughs> named it. Good Lord. Chris it's a shame though, that Final Fantasy seven remake ends with uh, that weird kind of dating that Yakuza dating mini game where you're mm. at a restaurant with Adolf Hitler. It's, it's fucked. It's really unfortunate. I'm sorry for spoiling it, by the way. You and Hitler go to see Loveless. <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's a real deep nerdy <laughs> oh boy we'll get a little crisis core in there yeah good stuff all right so that's what we're playing we'll be back i think so remake dagan and i will do a knockback conversation he's never played it before and he's almost through it now so his, this is his first time um Final Fantasy 7 Rebirth will do something on that I think in the coming weeks I'm going to need time to play it if we're getting impatient you can just go without me I have no problem with that so we'll have more in-depth conversations about both of these games coming up for you guys very soon on the last stand all right let's get into the news all right let's get into the news here big piece of news and you guys have to kind of translate this for me because you know I'm not a very technical person it's not why I'm in games number one As we've told you in the past, the much rumored and much discussed PlayStation 5 Pro is very real. We have sources who have been briefed on it, and as reporting has long noted, it's coming at the end of this year, 2024. But now, thanks to new leaks from friend of the show Tom of Moore's Law is Dead and the Broken Silicon podcast, we have concrete details about what the PS5 Pro can purportedly do from a power and technical perspective. PS5 Pro's codename within Sony is Project Trinity, and over at website Insider Gaming, a reliable leaks website that confirmed Tom's earlier reporting, They broke down the different specs to compare them to the base model PlayStation 5 unit. So here's what we know. PS5 Pro CPU will be the same as the original consoles, but comes packing a so-called high CPU frequency mode in which, quote, more power is allocated to the CPU and will downclock the GPU by around 1.5%, resulting in roughly 1% lower GPU performance, end quote. This allows the CPU to reportedly perform 10% better than a base PS5s, and this has created some concern for those hoping for reliably higher frame rates from this console. The GPU, on the other hand, is markedly improved and allows for 45% faster rendering and multiple times faster ray tracing. System memory has also been improved 28%, making PS5 Pro's, quote, system memory more efficient than the standard console, end quote. Website IGN also confirms Moore's Law is Dead's reporting and says the following in part, quote, of particular interest, the PS5 Pro is said to have an upscaling and anti-aliasing solution called PSSR, or PlayStation Spectral Super Resolution Upscaling, custom machine learning architecture, and an AI accelerator. Elsewhere, PS5 Pro has a detachable disk drive and a one terabyte of storage, end quote. What we, what we await now is official confirmation from Sony, which should come later this year with a holiday season-ish release likely. We also await a price, which people speculate could be $600 or even more once it hits the market. Tony Rigatoni wrote in and said, hello, men. The PS5 Pro is supposedly prioritizing increasing resolution over frame rate based on the leaked specs. Would this machine even be worth getting if we only got marginally improved resolution for approximately the same FPS? I know the improvements probably go deeper than that, but this AI, PSSR, et cetera, all go over my head. Maybe Chris or Dustin could further explain the meaning of these specs. I, for one, am curious if they keep the vaginal design for the Pro or possibly go deeper. Oh, and make it even more evocative. I, I wonder that as well. God, I hope that they make it a different form factor. I really do. They usually, 
in their redesigns, they usually do, but they've really not done that with PS4 and PS5, like where they've just become smaller versions. Anyway. Um, all right. Who, uh, Dustin, let's go to you. I- explain this to me. What are we looking at here? Yeah. So the the main conversation about higher frame rates, I think, is very dependent on the game. A, a lot of this conversation about these specs, there were many, many reports of people talking about the digital foundry. They basically did a a podcast conversation about these specs. One of the big things they talked about was don't necessarily expect GTA six to run at 60 FPS because of PlayStation five pro because of the CPU. Now in the case of PS four and PS four pro, it it seems like if my understanding is correct, the, the CPU is may remains re- relatively the same in order to keep compatibility between the pre- the the previous console. So in, in PS4, PS4 Pro, same CPU, now PS5, PS5 Pro, keeping the CPU the same. So in terms of games getting higher frame rates from this, I think it really depends on the game itself. So games that are heavy CPU bound, games like Baldur's Gate 3, uh, Dragon's Dogma 2, from what it seems. Yeah, it, it seems like you're not necessarily going to get the dream of a m- much higher FPS. But in terms of games that use more heavily the, the GPU, this is going to be, I think, a pretty significant upgrade. That and along with the more power to the GPU on it, the PSSR, So PlayStation Spectral Super Resolution Scaling is going to be kind of the make or break thing, I think, in terms of how appealing this console really is. So for those who don't know about some of these upscaling techniques, I think the biggest comparison is DLSS for NVIDIA cards, where basically the idea is the game can run at an internal resolution of 1080p we'll say or even in some cases if you have it on the performance mode of dlss 720p and then through using ai it's able to upscale the image to 4k or something like that and i think that that's where the ps5 pro what's really going to excel is a lot of these games that are currently running at 1440p 60 or close to 60 this is really going to take it over the edge to take it to a full 4k 60 and depending on how how good this pssr implementation is maybe even beyond that but i think it really will be a case by case basis and that's the thing that's hard about looking at these specs is that we can see the specs and we can imagine how they would translate but it's some of these other things the you know the the pssr the the AI stuff in it that or the custom machine learning architecture. That's kind of the big question mark is that how are these going to improve the performance of games as well? So, yeah, I, I think that there are some disappointing aspects of it, I guess, to think about the CPU being the same and how that's going to keep some games approximately at the same level. But I think that overall, a lot of games are going to be pretty awesome on this. And then, of course, too, the, the ray tracing performance is going to be pretty interesting as well, just in that we've seen some decent ray tracing implementations. Uh, unfortunately, they often really hamper the performance of the game, where if you want to use ray tracing, you have to be on the graphics mode, which means probably 30 FPS. We have seen examples of ray tracing in performance mode, specifically from Insomniac, that have been very good and really cool. And so if it truly is a two to three times ray tracing performance, I think we'll be able to see potentially some awesome ray tracing in these performance modes at decent frame rates and at good resolution. The last thing I'll say is why I'm remaining cautious is just that one of the big aspects of PlayStation 4 Pro was, of course, the upscaling, the checkerboard rendering, which did indeed provide a pretty convincing upscale to 4K in a lot of cases. But if you were looking for it specifically uh, with the checkerboard rendering was something like tree foliage. You could see kind of the the edges of the system not working as well. So 
I, I'm really curious about this PSSR. I think that's going to be the main thing about this. And um, I think earlier years ago, when we were first talking about PlayStation 5, when it came out and how initially with a game like Demon's Souls remake, you know, it was 1440p and it was kind of like, well, that's, that's not full 4K or something like that. Or it was upscaled to 1440p. I can't remember the specific details, but one thing to keep in mind going forward with these upscaling techniques and different tricks is I think it's going to become less about the specific render resolution and, and the numbers on paper and more so about what do you see on screen? Does what you see on screen look comparable or in sometimes extremely close to 4K? And that's going to be what really matters. So these leaks, pretty interesting shout out to Tom for really breaking this story. Uh, obviously, there was a lot of people that followed up and, and confirmed that these documents went out, but he was definitely the first on it. So congrats to him. Yeah. And I'm a little annoyed about the way people have treated him. Um, yeah. And I've treated him uh, as a friend and a friend of our show just as just like this unreliable source that needs like it just it just <laughs> there are these i understand everyone in my opinion everyone is it gets things wrong sometimes but like there are these out of control narratives where like certain people that have the same exact kind of reputation in reality are treated differently than other people and it, it bothered me a little bit but nonetheless that's really neither here nor there Chris, what do you think about the leaks for PS5 Pro? I mean, I, I, that was that, Dustin was really, really comprehensive about what all of it meant. But I, I think what I make out of it is that it, it is. Yeah, it's it's a bit of a disappointment to know that uh, games that are more CPU limited aren't really going to see that much of a boost. Uh, but at the same time, it is going to be a better version of the machine that you currently have. So ultimately, you will still like, I, I have to imagine that if you're looking for just a better experience playing your games, it's probably going to be worth it anyway if you're an enthusiast and uh, you're going to get value out of it regardless. But knowing knowing that it's not really going to be a boost for, say, something like GTA 6, which is, I have to imagine, going to be a pretty CPU-intensive game, uh, just given the type of... Just given the breadth of what a Grand Theft Auto game is and what those games have been trying to become... I mean, I don't know what what is the likelihood really of of something like that running well on the on the PS5 Pro. I don't I don't know because I'm thinking about the physics engine that's going to have to be in place, and I'm thinking about like the the amount of cars and the amount of pedestrians that are going to have to be in one place, and like wondering like w will the game remember it? Are are they going to uh, like is I don't know much about like the internals of Grand Theft Auto games. I just I, I have to imagine that it's they're pretty intensive, right? Dustin, would, would, you, so. would you say? Yeah, it's. I could uh, be getting that uh, wrong. I have no idea. Like, but like, it just it strikes me as like a game like that where like population density is important and physics is important. Like, I have to imagine that any game that has that much of importance on those things would be heavily or at least somewhat deeply impacted by CPU over GPU. Right. Yeah. Physics is a big thing, and also like world simulation dealing with like the one thing right now with Dragon's Dogma Two. I just saw this that uh, there are players that talking about killing NPCs in order to get better performance. This was also uh, a thing for Baldur's Gate, specifically awesome. in Act 3 when you get to Baldur's Gate. Spoiler, you go to Baldur's Gate in Baldur's Gate 3. Uh, when you're in Baldur's uh -oh. Gate, it's one of the most densely populated areas of the game because it's simulating so many different characters going around doing different things. The frame rate takes a huge tank. The one interesting thing about this Rockstar GTA 6 uh, thing. This was something I saw in gaming leaks and rumors. So I'm taking it with a grain of salt. It's actually labeled with grain of salt, but apparently a senior artist there responded to a tweet that he then deleted that said, boss, uh, someone respond tweeted at him and said, boss, after GTA six is released, can we get the frame rate to a stable 60 FPS on PS five? He said, I don't know, but we are very confident. And then that tweet got deleted. Mm. I don't know what All that right. means. Hmm. Um, yeah, maybe. But, uh, we'll see. Spend I, I, enough I'm, money on your games and you'll probably figure out really 
unique ways to get them to run you know not for nothing <laughs> that's true i think yeah i mean if anybody could figure it out it's them with the amount of capital that they, <laughs> they have mm-hmm. access to i guess but i do think yeah i mean is it a little bit of a bummer that we can't expect like across the board uh boosts to frame rate as a group of people who values that i would imagine over resolution yeah but uh i was i mean i'm still gonna get this thing like if i can get marginal improvements off of other games that's that's more than the price of admission just to have something that isn't inherently you know out of date already you know um and, and the ps5 is, is approaching that like i mean we see it with final fantasy 7 rebirth and, and and the performance mode on that and how it's just completely not great looking and and we're, we're at that point now where we we could use some kind of a some kind of a bump is even if it's not going to be the bump that we would ideally want and the second thing i'll say is like you know the, the the these specs on paper are what they are but like dustin said like a lot of these a lot of games interact with these specs differently so i think we're really not going to get a sense of what any of this really means even i don't think we're really going to going to get a sense of what this uh, pssr really really does until we can see it in action and i think that will be a that will be more of I would imagine a way to get this across because I think one of the things we we talked about early on in the show is how kind of not sexy this kind of stuff is like th- th- these these mid generation kind of refreshes are never going to be as attractive to a wide audience as you know the next thing you know PS5 is going to be way more interesting to PS4 owners than PS4 Pro is and we have to kind of keep that in mind as we're going into this we're you know, we're not getting a PS6. You know, so I, I guess keep your expectations in check. But I want to see it in action first before I really take any of these specs into really any consideration. Like, I want to see, like, what what is the the actual difference between a game running on PS5 and PS5 Pro that can benefit from this stuff? Like, let me see that side by side. And I think that'll that'll be really useful information. And I'm sure Digital Foundry is going to be all over that when it's available. Um, so... I will know. We'll know soon at some point. Yeah, I uh, as a more layman, technologically layman person. My interpretation of this and reading people's responses and watching videos and and uh, doing a little bit of research is I, I came out with a few things. The first is. This kind of this choice, although it's about comp- the CPU stuff, as I understand it, and Dustin, you said this early on was is about making sure there are no compatibility issues more than anything else in that. Like it's not maybe the wisest or not the wisest thing, but it complicates things by messing with it too deeply when you're running, I guess, uh, similar hardware. And so the GPU is, I guess, fundamentally simpler to fuck around with, but it indicated to me as a layman, but someone who knows people in the industry, and we've talked about the statistics that have been shared with me in the past, like seven out of 10 players in a big AAA, you know, shooter choose, uh, fidelity over performance doesn't this suggest that they're chasing fidelity over performance in some sense anyway now and so in other words it's reinforcing this idea that it's like we're kind of the odd men out yeah and so that was just like something i thought about where i'm like well maybe this just says what we say like people want prettier graphics and this will provide you prettier graphics now that feeds into what because i agree with you chris like even if there's not a, a big and again I think there's something to this PSSR thing that I don't understand. I'm not, I'm not going to understand that might have, as Dustin was noting, like the secret sauce behind like stabilizing frame rates and making them better. And maybe that's just the way like offloading some of this stuff to allow, um, you know, a better frame rate. But I wonder if um, there's some indication about price in here too, that maybe they just don't want to get too crazy and have this really expensive machine because remember when the ps4 pro came out ps3 or ps4 was what 299 99 i think so you're gonna sell a console that's 400 dollars or whatever and it doesn't seem as crazy but when you're selling a console for like 500 and then for like 600 or you go to like 700 i just think that this plays some mental games. And I was wondering if maybe that was part of their calculus too, of being like, we can't, we just, we have to make choices. Let's lean into the things that we know matter to the most of our audience and frame rate. People like us are maybe just not in the majority and people just want sharper graphics. But this is what I was going to say before Chris was, I agree with you. Like I'm buying this thing day one, because for me, 
even if it doesn't do what I really want it to do, which is kind of a frame rate boost and stabilization, because people are talking about 120 frames, like whatever, dude, I just want the games at 60 frames. Like, I, I don't really if, if you want to then play with this, like, all right, Colin, now play these games at 120 frames and try to go back. It's like, OK, well, let's get there first. I'm not quite there yet. But if what you're saying to me and, and my, by you, I mean, Sony, what Sony's saying is like, all right, Colin, you're going to get the games you already have. You like performance over fidelity or you like perform. Yeah, performance over fidelity. But this console will maybe have some marginal performance boost for you, but it's going to make the fidelity a lot better at the performance you're used to. So I guess what I'm saying is when we talk about it's not one or the other. It's for me, it's one and the right. other with a preference. Like I still want my games to be prettier, so I'll take that. But right, exactly. It's like, but what, it's not what I would have wanted. And I guess that's where people are kind of losing sight of it is like there are obviously going to be material benefits to the game that are beyond mere performance that I care about. I just don't care about it as much as that. And because I have I understand if you don't have disposable income or whatever, I imagine this thing is not going to be for you. But remember, the leaks from Insomniac showed us that PS4 Pro was. I don't want to say substantially, but quite more popular than I think we thought. Like, I think it was something like 18 or 20 million units sold. I had always thought it was like 10 to 12. Um, yeah. And so there is some sort of latent demand. So I guess those are the things that I kind of rattle off from my mind where I think about. Constraining price, making choices, the choice leans towards the preferences of the majority. And again, kind of this this and again, I'm way over my skis on this, but the PlayStation spectral super resolution upscaling like and I think this is what you were saying, Dustin, is like, could this be something that offloads like something that helps free up CPU, like the existing CPU stuff for what, like, you know, a, a bandwidth or whatever to process things. Because I was seeing on insider gaming, like they had specific games. I don't know if this was like in the documentation or whatever about like game a, like make this choice and this happens, make this choice and this happens kind of thing. And these are the settings on the PS five. And these are the settings on the PS five pro. I just think there are probably things maybe that we don't quite understand about it, but I'm going to defer to the technological experts out there that this yeah. thing is not going to easily make the frame rate situation better, at least overtly from what we understand. And that yeah. is disappointing. But again, that's like column A. There's still column B, C, D and E that I'm like, OK, cool. I still want that stuff. Yeah. yeah. It, so I'll still get it, it. it. It's important to just. I mean, you said you hit on something that it's like, yeah, we, we are kind of like the odd men out when it comes to this. Like, like we care a lot about it as enthusiasts and as people who like pay attention to this stuff. But like the majority of people like I've, I've told the story on the on the podcast a million times. But like I, I've been to people's houses where they're they're playing on on they're playing their TVs. They're playing on their TVs and their TVs aren't on game mode. So they're getting like an insane amount of inherent latency and they don't care. People, for whatever reason, want the moving media that they interact with to be pretty when it's completely motionless. I don't, I fucking don't understand, but like that is the way that the majority of people operate. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, God bless. I mean, it, it's really great for screenshots and, and, you know, images, but like, I'm not playing images. So like, I just, I, it, it really breaks my brain that that's, that that's a preference, but it is, it is the overwhelming preference where people just want the 4k picture and they don't care how stuttery it looks dude i i know people who are playing multiplayer games on base ps4 well into like the 20 teens and, and early 2020s and i can't even fathom how they were even I, I can't fathom how they weren't seizing watching their own gameplay at like 20 frames a second and like with, with comp constant stutters and the shit that people put up with is crazy Mm -hmm. but, so there, there's a degree of like maybe we are spoiled in some way mm. to to add a counter point to this, because I think it's good to have our expectations in check, specifically in terms of the, the GP or the CPU and the the limited nature that could cause games to not boost in frame rate. Um, to my understanding, and I love feedback from from developers, but by and large, PS5 games are not CPU limited. They are GPU limited. So mm -hmm. if this thing does have a what was it here? Forty five percent faster rendering in addition to PSSR. It reads to me that this thing is actually going to rip pretty hard for for a lot of games. 
Um, yeah, but there yeah. are going to be the, these instances where it's like, yeah, this game is CPU limited. And so it's not necessarily going to do that. One thing I was looking at, um, just reviewing some of the stuff from the key to gaming article. And one thing that they said is a new performance mode for 8K resolution and accelerated ray tracing. Now, the use case for 8K is so low, but I think what's important to read into this is that that's how far they're pushing it. So I wouldn't read this as necessarily like, oh, this thing's a, just a tiny upgrade for certain people that care. I think that overall, this thing has the potential, I should say. I'm not saying it will, but it has the potential to go pretty hard for a lot of us and a lot of the games we like. But have it in check for certain games. Uh, yeah, I, I guess for something like, what is it? Um, Oh, my God. What was that game? Lord, is it Lord of Shadows? That one that was like the, the whole point was that you were oh. sw- sw- you were swapping between like two parallel versions Lords of, of the, the same- Fallen. Oh, Lords of the Fallen. Right, right. right. Yeah, sorry. Um, I would imagine that's probably like a pretty heavily GPU limited game because I, I would I would imagine that it's rendering two different worlds kind of somewhat simultaneously and choosing choosing which one depend because I remember hearing the performance on that was terrible and I don't I don't imagine that that's a particularly CPU limited game there's I, I don't think that there's much going on that would necess- necessitate the CPU usage I, I don't know if there's like because there's no like sprawling I don't know it just doesn't strike me granted I haven't played it so like I'm I'm really making a lot of assumptions but there are games that are, are going to no doubt rip I I just I guess from my perspective it's the games that really need to you know, the, the sure. games that really kind of need that boost and haven't seen it, which are the CPU limited games um, like like uh, like Baldur's Gate and like presumably GTA six um, that really kind of need that frame rate boost the most. And they probably won't get them, I guess is what I'm saying. Like, I do think we're going to see. I do think because of this, we're going to see solid 60 on most games like uh, like we kind of do now already. So, so I, I'm not really that worried about the majority of games but like there are key really latchkey titles that i would imagine won't see the boost that we're hoping to see and that's kind of a that's kind of a shame but it's still yeah you're right though it is it's still probably going to rip pretty hard yeah. yeah it's uh it's very interesting to see I, it's funny with all the stuff leaking it feels like like come on just do something like <laughs> just tell us <laughs> yeah. about it at this point they're probably waiting till this summer uh, to do that, but uh, I'm very. I would I, think you would want to wait as long as possible if I were them, and that's yeah, probably why they're probably not too pleased. But what what do they expect with letting specs out to the third parties? You know? Right. Yeah. So I I'm super excited. I mean, I know for the three of us, we've talked about this. This is a day one buy, and uh, I'm mainly excited about thinking about certain games now. That sure, there's stuff like Dragon's Dogma too that is is not good and this the ps5 pro isn't going to save it but i think about games recently something like final fantasy 16 that was cl- so close not yeah not, almost there it's like this is gonna i would imagine gonna take care of that completely it, not just take care of it but take it even further potentially i think the thing we have to understand now is or not understand but talk about and we'll come to understand later is when this thing's gonna come out and what, what it will cost as I was saying earlier, I think you you can't announce this early. It it would be no. so bad for PS5 sales if people knew that it would be if there was like a new model coming, even if it was more expensive. And I think it's actually going to be most powerful to sell to to sell the old model PS5 once it's on the market, and there's a comparison between power, what you need, and of course the price differential. So I think that if say they're releasing this thing in October or November, I think you re, you would announce it literally in like September. Um. Yeah. And maybe go from there, but maybe they don't get that far. I don't know. I could be totally wrong on that. But let's go around the horn quickly and see when we think it'll come out and what it will cost. I have no concept of what these things will cost. I imagine it'll be hard to charge more than $600 for this thing without getting. If you go above $600, you are now in the territory of consoles that historically failed or are like very niche items that still commercially failed anyway. Six hundred dollars was considered a joke back in two thousand six, but it's not two thousand six anymore. Six hundred dollars was a joke back in two thousand six. It's not so much of a joke with inflation and what these machines can do. So, my assumption is something like October or November for five ninety nine ninety nine. And as we said, IGN had a part of the leak that 
that I thought was interesting that other people were reporting on is it no disk drive and one terabyte of hard drive space. So that's what's going to be standard with it. So so with that, I think it's going to be, I think $600 is totally believable. And it'll probably in some way use the same disk drive as the other model that, that you know is out now. And thus you would assume it will be that vaginal shape that Ugh. we hate so much. Yeah. So well, sad. I think that is the big question, Colin, is it, you know, uses the same disk drive. Do they include it in the box? In I would say to- I would assume no. I mean, if yeah. you want to if you want to keep the price down, I would think that's what I'm saying. Five ninety nine ninety yeah. nine, one terabyte, no disk drive. Yeah. So that yeah. in November, I would say is when I think it'll come out. What do you think? I, I don't have anything different. I think November makes sense. November is not that it has to be exactly like the past, but November 10th was when they released PS4 Pro, get it in before Christmas and five uh, five ninety nine sounds right to me. That that's the the big thing to me is the disk drive. Whether or not they're gonna, I'm trying to remember how much the disk drive cost them. Uh, the number what to manufacture? Like for them to include it in? Is it? Oh, let me look. I want to say when we talked about this a while ago, it was around eighty dollars, but that was closer to when PS5 came out. Yeah, sorry. I'm just kind of looking on the fly here. PlayStation Direct is so slow. All right, so Marvel Spider-Man 2 PS5 Digital Edition is $400. The edition oh. with the disk drive is $500? So the disk drive separately cost 80 right now. Okay, so maybe it's... Yeah, I don't know what I'm looking at here. I was wondering what their material costs are. Oh, yeah, to... I don't know. Is that in the leak? Maybe an Insomniac leak? It could be. Yeah, disk drive. So, because that's the big thing is that for so if they're selling the current disk drive for eighty dollars, maybe I, I don't know what they would want on a profit margin for an add-on like that. But yeah, I don't. I don't think it's even about that for them. I yeah, think selling it at cost, console at cost, hardware cost is totally par for the course, if not at a loss. So I, yeah. I think yeah, it, it would just be hard. So you can go on PlayStation Direct now and buy a four hundred dollar discless PlayStation Five base unit with a game. There's no way this thing can cost more than $600. I just can't yeah. imagine it. it might even be cheaper than that for all we know. I don't know. Um, but I don't think above $600. What do you think, Chris? Yeah, I mean, I, I can't say I really disagree with the with what you guys have said. I, I, I'm more curious when they're going to announce it, really. Like, that's really more where my curiosity lies. Like, because I'm with you, like, where they, they kind of have to hold it off for as late as possible. But you can't hold it off too late. So, like... I would imagine late September, early October, right? Like you'd have to imagine that that's probably like when they would say something. Yeah, I mean, they're going to start rolling. I, I would imagine this summer they're going to start late this summer. They'll start rolling off the manufacturing lines and they're going to leak one way yeah. or the other. So, um, yeah. If we want to look at history again, uh, PS4 Pro revealed September 7th on my birthday in 2016. Yeah. So, I mean, history is always a good guide. History repeats itself whether we want it to or not. So, yeah, I, I think we're all kind of in relative agreement. Close to the best announcement, holiday release. Yeah. 600, I think. Again, playing with that price point is so. I don't know. If you believe it, if you're superstitious, and we all kind of are, the Japanese are certainly superstitious in many ways. It's like fucking around with this old price point of like your worst possible moment, basically, is a little bit daunting, but it's just a different time. You can't avoid the increase in price and it seems like a reasonable price if you're if you're saying the base unit costs 400 discless maybe maybe 549.99 but i think they would be eating the lowest yeah that that would be the lowest that i would uh, that i would imagine i think people easily pay 600 too in terms of thinking of i've made this comparison before but think about how much people spend on smartphones and computers and other stuff that is all significantly higher than no one blink. And I don't want to say no one blinks an eye at, but it's kind of just commonly accepted that those are those prices. I, iPad four ninety nine, dollars approximately. There's cheaper ones now, but I do, I do think people generally are like, <laughs> this is kind of sad, but I do think people are generally more accustomed to paying more for less anyway. Yeah. <laughs> I, would say, I, would, I would say that it's like a good thing, but like it, it is the, the kind of the material. Oh, a $20 skin for a fucking Fortnite. Cool. <laughs> great you know like why not why not six hundred dollars for a new machine so if it comes without a disk drive 
are you guys just going going without it? Are you going to yeah, buy the I, add-on? I, I haven't put a disc in my PS5 at all. Not one time. So yeah. I don't even need the one that it came with. I don't, yeah, I don't even think I put a disc in my PS4. Yeah, I'm going to have to so pay like, the tax. The $80. The troll toll. The troll toll for the physical games. Oh, well. You got to pay the troll toll if you want the baby boy's hole. <laughs> the bait. <laughs> <laughs> I love that show. All right. Well, that's good news, but we have some bad news. Number two. Oh. According to reporting from financial publication Bloomberg, Sony's struggling virtual reality headset PSVR 2 is indeed in some trouble. In fact, sales are so slow that according to Bloomberg, Sony has outright seized manufacturer of the hardware while sales channels clear of stock. The piece reads in part, quote, sales of the $550 wearable accessory to the PlayStation 5 have slowed progressively since its launch and stocks of the device are building up, according to sources. Sony has produced well over 2 million units of the product launched in February of last year, end quote. Bloomberg cites data analysis from IDC, which predicts unit shipments of 600,000 in its launch quarter, 435,000 in its following quarter, 343,000 the quarter after that, and by the holiday season quarter, because we're going by the calendar, the actual calendar year, not the fiscal year, the number drops to 325,000. This compares to PSVR 2's primary rival, Meta, which shipped 1.3 million units, units of its headsets in the holiday quarter. It seems that PlayStation VR 2 is in a bind. A follow-up to PlayStation 4's original PSVR, which launched in 2016, PSVR 2 certainly doesn't lack in game volume. It has a lot of games to offer. It, it does, however, obviously lack enough killer content to get people to buy in, particularly at such a high price point. And it's simply obvious that it's not moving units, perhaps due to Sony's own hesitance to support it internally. I was trying to think of a different way to talk about this to you guys. And we've talked about PSVR 2 a bit, but we're not doing it from an experiential point of view. Obviously, we all own it, but we haven't really messed with it too much. And I think I think Dustin's probably messed with it the most out of the three of us. But yeah. Sometimes I get caught in a bind where I'm, I overcompensate as an analyst because I know people and I and I know what they're saying about things and I know people. So I say that because I know people out there are enjoying PSVR too and you don't want to like write it's 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 fucking obituary when people are enjoying and I totally get all of that kind of stuff and people are like you're not giving it a chance. That's totally true. All of that's true. But we have to divorce that from the reality that what I think doesn't really matter, but what the market thinks matters a great deal and that this thing is just not interesting to people. Whether it's too expensive, whether the games, though in high volume, are not compelling enough, whatever it is, you can see that this thing is getting trounced by its competition. And the Bloomberg article makes note that neither VR headset company is selling a lot of them, but that Meta is doing substantially better and probably sold more units in a holiday quarter than PSVR 2 has sold cumulative to date. So... I say that because though I get like our friends at PSVR on parole and all that, like they love it and they and they'll go to its defense and I believe them about all that stuff. We still have to take into consideration that though that is true. Clearly. There's a lack of interest to the point of maybe one in 50 PS5 owners having it. That's not going to do the trick. So we have to ask ourselves why at that point. And I wanted to say that. So Dustin, let's go to you. What are your thoughts here on PSVR 2's purported struggles? I think the what people want from VR is very rapidly changing right now. Um, and I, it was already kind of changing as PSVR 2 was coming out. But specifically, when you look at the pros and cons of each device, right? PSVR 2 is tethered uh, to the PlayStation 5. And so that's a trade-off to the MetaQuest that has, you know, you can take it anywhere, right? And I think that's one thing that particularly now, um, even though the Apple Vision Pro isn't something that is a direct comparison, particularly as in terms of price, but more and more as time goes forward, VR in public is going to become normalized. Um, particularly as the Apple Vision Pro goes down in price and other companies step in people love the idea of taking these things on a plane or when you're traveling or something kind of getting away and it's already ha i mean dude i see chris cringing no, but it's, I, you're, right, it cringing. you're right you're right yeah it especially because the thing for me is that on a plane let's say it is normalized sure i'm cool with that not in a million fucking years am i going to walk around 
on a street with an Apple Vision Pro or whatever on my face ever. Never going to do that Uh, in my home when I'm stationary somewhere. Sure. When it becomes normal, even right now, like if I had a MetaQuest 3, I don't think I would use it on a plane. Dude, the, there's yeah. nothing wrong with it. The the Cybertruck dudes are the best. <laughs> you know, yeah. Like. So <laughs> when you're when you're a potential when you're a customer looking to get a VR headset and weighing out some of these things, I just think that the MetaQuest has so much more to offer in terms of its usability. And to the other thing too is just when you're looking at what games are available, you buy a MetaQuest and it has the big games that people want it has Beat Saber on it. Um, but in addition, it also works on your PC. So if if you are looking for a more hardcore VR experience, you can hook it up to your PC. You can play Half-Life Alex, whatever you want, stuff like that. It's all available where PSVR 2. So the biggest selling point in, in a lot of ways needs to be content. And yes, this is the thing you were mentioning earlier, Colin, is that the hardcore people in the PSVR 2 will argue the content is there. And I would say for VR enthusiasts, yes, that is the case. But VR is trying to move out of an enthusiast market. It's trying to become a mainstream. And, you know, you look at the price range between these two, which I think the MetaQuest 3 is also, is is 500 and PSVR 2, is it? I'm trying to remember the price on that. It's 550 according to Bloomberg. <laughs> so yeah, it, it costs more money. And that, that's, feels, that's probably Canadian pricing though. So let me just look that up real quick. PSVR 2 price. 550. Oh yeah, it is 550. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So it kind of feels like you're getting this device that you can do less with. And also uh, outside of call. Okay. So call of the mountain. Let's say, and I'm talking about the big marquee titles, right? Call of the mountain. Uh, Resident Evil. Uh, like Gr- Gran Turismo. Gran Turismo. OK, yeah, that, that is a, a good one. I think that, that is. A I, I would imagine that that game is probably one of the most popular games on VR. But I think, well, here, Awesome Tatum wrote into us on Patreon, says this. What's up, Sacred Symbols crew? I am curious about the crew's take on the recent Bloomberg article about Sony hitting pause on PSVR 2 products as unsold inventory piles up. I think us in the VR and specifically the PSVR 2 community see this as a non-story and follows what seems to be a trend of unnecessary hit pieces towards the PSVR 2, especially in comparison with Meta and Valve. We understand that the PSVR 2 has its problems and nobody is arguing in the VR communities that the PSVR 2 is or will be a great success. But what we can say is that the hardware has sold over 1 million headsets and has over 200 games in the library with more in development. We can all agree VR is general in general is a small niche market, but what's concerning is Meta nor Valve get these kinds of articles written. And they all have similar problems with lack of exclusive and AAA games, unsold hardware, et cetera. Thank you for your time. This is what I'm talking about, though, is there. I, I won't speak for Valve specifically because I, I think Meta is really more PlayStation's target right now is that they're just doing better. They're doing way better. And yeah, but that there there is this. These things can all be true at the same time. I I do think it's worth noting that Sony has stopped manufacturing completely PSVR 2 units because there's so many of them sitting on sold. That is a story. It might also be true, though, Awesome Tatum, that the others are stories and you can't be mad at journal. Like I- I'm just reporting on the news, but maybe like a VR website should report on all those things. But in the Sony ecosystem, meta having issues is not news to us. PSVR 2 having issues is news to us. And I think what people have to understand is like you're it's sold more than a million units and that's awesome. But how can a uh, how can there be this shadow ecosystem of PlayStation five in which only one in 50 people are even viable consumers in that space. This is just a numbers game to, in my opinion. So anyway, Chris, let's get you involved here. What do you uh, have to say about PSVR 2's purported struggles? I did the math. It, the numbers according to IDC would have shipments at 1.7 million, but that's that's shipped. And since they're not, since they're just, since they're not making any more, I'd, I'd imagine hundreds of thousands of them at minimum are sitting around waiting to be sold. Yeah. So we don't have specific numbers, but I think if Sony was proud of it, they would say. For sure. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's not they're not in a in a great position. And I don't know, I, I, I kind of take umbrage with this idea that it's the, 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 that just talking about objective realities facing a product is constitutes as a hit piece. Like maybe, maybe there are hit pieces out there like I I. 
I, I can't imagine that there are, though. Like, I, I don't. What would be the impetus on somebody to write a hit piece on PlayStation VR? Like, is that even. Like, I, I'm speaking from ignorance here, to be fair. Like, I, I really have no idea what that ecosystem looks like. But it, it, it's strange to me to imagine that there would even be such a th- such a thing as. I really have a bone to pick with PSVR 2 specifically. Yeah, I, well, like, I do think the, his argument in some sense, I think, makes sense in that. And I know this as being an, a journalist back in the day is like, well, websites like negative news. Definitely. Well, yeah. For so sure. if like something negative is about and if something positive about PSVR 2 is reported, it's much, much less glamorous. That's true. But like you said, it's objective reality nonetheless. And it also can't be like that's just true of anything. You know what I mean? Like, I, I don't imagine like if there was negative news about meta, I'm sure that there would. I'm sure that they would jump all over it. And and so to, to me, I don't know. There's this kind of responsibility that's placed on the consumer to give certain things a chance. But I think I, I really do feel like it's backwards thinking. It's kind of like thinking it's like. Uh, it, it strikes me a lot like like in the realm of politics where it's like, oh, well, it's the, it's the voters uh, job to uh, not raise concerns about their candidates or whatever. It's like that's not true at all like if you want me to take interest in it if you want me to give a product a chance you first have to make a product that speaks to people and like i own a a, a meta quest 2 i believe that's the previous one right because the, yeah. the, the 3 is the one now i have a quest 2 and i didn't get a quest 2 because i saw vr and i was like oh i think i'll give it a shot i got a quest 2 because i tried it at a friend's house. And I was like, you know what? I actually want this thing. This is actually, I, I see value in this thing enough to get it for myself. And the, the PSVR two is just kind of in that, in that place where like, if I, if I wasn't do if I wasn't on a PlayStation podcast, I don't, I don't, I, I don't think I would have one really like, cause I don't think there's really much there that calls me to it. Even as somebody who's on the show and who has it, I've barely used it because there's really not anything there speaking to me as a consumer and I like games and I like VR and, and, and when you're trying to branch outside of that to people who don't have a PS five, it's like, okay, well that's a thousand dollars. You know, like that's a, that's a, a grand that you have to spend on this thing just to get, just to get involved with it. When you compare it to every other competitor that's out right now, I mean, with the exception of, you know, the Apple vision pro, which is insanely expensive for obvious reasons, it's Apple and it's very highly niche. It's very high, very new tech. But like, even like as somebody with enough disposable income, right, I would, I have no interest really in the Apple Vision Pro, but I'm infinitely more curious about it than I am about the PSVR 2. And if I were to drop something approaching thousands or the thousand dollar mark on VR technology, I might at that point just bite the bullet and say, you know what, let me see what the fuck that new crazy thing is that I, I barely understand as opposed to this thing that's going to require me to get this console and then it's got and then it's got to be tethered and and then there's no real killer apps for it. And it's got very, very specific use cases. And I know we covered on the show, too, recently that they're expanding that uh, that use case to uh, expand to PCs, or at least that's what's rumored to happen. Is, or, or I'm pretty sure it's. Yeah, that's, that's what the, I mean, that's now. obvious now why they're doing yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah, it should have been it should have been obvious from the get go that that should should have been like a key feature of it. But it seems like it was a kill switch, like they they built it in yeah. and they were like, if we need to do this, we got to do it. You know? Yeah. 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 Basically. It. Yeah. And so that's really smart. And I think that's a good gr- that's a good way to get it out to a lot more people who maybe are uh, barred from entry because they might not have a PlayStation 5, but understand that the, the, that VR headset, as far as games are concerned, is probably like one of the higher end top of the line bits of kit that you could get. That's definitely going to open the doors more but i mean it's just it's not as convenient as the meta it's not as it's not as uh, mystifying and and high tech as the apple vision pro so it's just kind of sitting in this awkward prohibitive space um and i don't know if there's really much you can do to spin that in a positive way and so, and so I, I i don't know it's it's they're in a they're in a bad situation with it. I, I, I wouldn't say it's apocalyptic. Sony's still going to be so Sony's going to be fine. PlayStation's going to be fine. We're still going to get PS6 and 7 and fucking whatever the hell else. But will we get a PSVR 3? I'm not really convinced that that's ever going to happen based yeah, on I, the that we're seeing here. Yeah, that's, that's the thing is that I think that they feel like this is a space worth being in. 
like as a company, Sony, and that right. they're kind of expressing that through PlayStation. And they're, I don't know, man, like, like you're the vision pro is an augmented reality machine that also does vir, has virtual reality functionality, right? Like it already, yeah, it's, it's already a very more future proof like that. You can wear it as yeah. a heads up display, basically. It, it It's just true that there's just some constraining portion of this that just it's just unappealing it's clearly unappealing to people and i guess that's what i'm saying at the top is though i think all three of us need to give it more of a chance as individual gamers especially me i mean i'll speak for myself like i definitely do it's just sitting in my loft behind me um and then i just don't play with it and that's not going to change anything about the reality of the unit it's going to change maybe my own perception of it as a creative device or something like that but it's not going to change this trajectory i don't have that much power <laughs> you know like and I think that PSVR fans need to understand that it's not they're putting too much power into the into the press and into creators and, and the lack of kind of attention it gets or whatever or fairness that's treated to it and, and not realizing that if it was truly appealing, it would overcome that because so many things overcome all of that shit all the time. So there's there's deeper problems with PSVR two than just perception issues. It's not perception. Perception is reality, by the way, virtual reality. Oh, Ooh. but there is something to speak about here from Ben Sender. And he says, it seems pretty likely that we aren't going to get any more first party PSVR two games, at least exclusive VR titles. Why doesn't Sony at least port the exclusive PSVR titles to it like Blood and Truth or Astro Bot Rescue Mission? I kind of agree with you in a sense that we probably won't get maybe too many more. Maybe something like from a, a, like uh, at a new Astro Bot game will have some sort of cross functionality, like you said. But do you think that this even matters there? This is a rock and a hard place sort of situation, in my opinion. Like. Does it matter? Yeah, like you can draw. Well, it matters if they had three triple A games like a shooter. And like an adventure game or something and other things, obviously, people would be more interested in that. There was like a naughty dog game and stuff, but there's an opportunity cost to that. And again, it goes back to one in 50. Like what can how what's the best your game can possibly sell on PSVR? hundreds of thousands of units and that's for probably a major success story it's just a rock yeah. and hard place they definitely haven't supported it well even worse than they supported the original psvr but at the same time i don't know if it's the differentiator either it would have changed the reality somewhat but i don't know if it would be enough of an arc to change no. yeah its course. I, I, psvr 2 could have 10 exclusives this year and i i don't think you would see the thing being saved in any real well, it, re it really just has come down to the fact that of the of the VR solutions available, it's just kind of the least interesting because it's the most restricted. It's it's not the most cost prohibitive, but compared to the one that is the most cost prohibitive, it's it's not as interesting. And the one that the one that's a lot more affordable is just a lot more convenient. It, it, it's kind of like PSVR 2 is in a weird situation where it, it feels like feels like a restaurant that you can it feels like an exclusively sit down restaurant that nobody really wants to go to because they could just kind of order out <laughs> or do anything else and they might serve good food like i have no idea they might have the top of the line kitchens and all that shit but like i mean it's a it's a monday i'm i'm gonna order <laughs> you know either the thing i always order or the thing that's most convenient or the thing that i know or something that is just next level strange just to try it. And I, I, I just think it's just too prohibitive compared to everything else around it. And I think that's really, that's really the issue is the convenience because I've, I've, we've long talked about VR in general and how, how much of an uphill battle it is to get people involved in VR just by the nature of you're not going to get more convenient than a screen. Like you are not going to get more convenient than sitting on a couch, looking at a big flat square displaying to you the thing that you want displayed to you. Um, really? Even, even with the headset, even with even with, um, you know, the, the, the quest where it's, you know, it's wireless and it's untethered. It's still like infinitely less convenient than simply not using it. <laughs> so mm. so I, I, I don't know, like I just I, there's a really uphill battle with VR. And I, I do think a lot of these steps are necessary to get to the point where we need to be, where like you can get these things ingrained in like glasses or like contact lenses or just straight up in your brain. But that's the goal that we're kind of marching towards. And we're not going to see that. I, I, I don't think I'll be alive to see that. So. 
we're just kind of in the growing pains of this of of uh, or, or like we're in the infancy of this really like I firmly believe that what we're seeing with PSVR and like MetaQuest and, and Apple Vision Pro is like the progenitor to something that I cannot fathom will exist in a hundred years. Like I I don't I I really do think that that's the lineage will be drawn back to to these machines. Yeah, like implants some maybe of some sort. You know. Yeah, but until then, until it becomes more convenient than the ultimate convenience that we already have, it's just simply not. Um, you have to make a big case for it. And the best case that you can have is it's the most convenient, it's untethered, it's cheap, and PSVR is none of that. So it's you're just kind of in a rock and the hard place where you're just kind of selling like the best feature set of a VR headset, technically, as far as like tech goes and like foveated rendering and eye tracking. And it's like, that's all that's really fucking cool. But all that really only matters to people who are already in a hardcore gaming space to begin with. Like your average kid doesn't like your your average kid who is really excited about the MetaQuest doesn't give a shit about foveated rendering or know what that is. So it's already kind of niche because it's like high it's like a high tier product within a very isolated market within a very <laughs> with in a product that is inconvenient to use. It's 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 a lot of problems. And you know We'll we'll see how it improves over the over the decades, but this ain't it, and that's fine. It's fine for this not to be it. Yeah, there's I, I just know anecdotally what you're saying is true just because that does part of that does describe my own experience with PSVR too, in just the sense that it's like I just don't want to do this. Like ultimately yeah. I just and I think that I kind of just have to accept in some sense instead of trying to overcome it though I'd like it's it's almost like a preference between PC and console where it's like okay I have a nice PC I can play PC games nevertheless I'm not going to um right and I don't want it it's it's here I can do it I can sit here right here and play all sorts of games it's it's but, like but it's like Android and Apple dude like it's just like you Android could Android could put out a phone that does the most incredible shit I've ever seen probably and I I don't I don't know if I would care to try it, <laughs> you know, because I just I got my own ecosystem here. Right. Same. I've got my convenience. What am I what am I looking to do? Like, oh, I can I can make my my phone look like the Pip boy. That's cool. It's like a nice little novelty kind of thing. It's like it's cool. I, it's cool that I could code it to look this way. But like, I really just need it to show me my messages when I glance at it. <laughs> like, I don't know. I, I, I do want to address the fact that I, I probably sound really, really de- defeatist about this thing. And I apologize for that. But like, I mean, because I don't want to be like a like a, a fucking fun sponge here. But. What do you. Reality is reality, you know? Yeah, I think that it, I don't the thing that's weird to me. One of the things I think that would be so easy and, and maybe not because we've seen examples of this that were really good, but porting current games and making VR modes, I think yeah. is so awesome. And it's weird because Resident Evil four and Resident Evil eight both have excellent VR modes. Resident Evil four. I nearly beat it. I need to go back and just finish. I'm on the, like the very end of the game. I maybe have an hour or two left. I played almost the entire game in VR and it was an amazing experience. And it's one of those ones that, I don't know, maybe it's just because the ship had already kind of started to sail on PSVR 2 that a game like Resident Evil 4 VR uh, isn't quite enough, especially when there's not a lot of promise for the future. But stuff like that, I just it feels like a no brainer to me. There was just this idea with VR when it first came out that we can't convert established games and make them VR games it just doesn't work. And then we started to get like some really good examples of converted vr games and so i don't think that that's the case anymore i just think i always come back to this but a bioshock vr i think man oh, yeah. i'm not saying That'd it would write the ship it wouldn't change the trajectory of psvr 2 but experiences like that we have had a few some not so good there was recently for psvr 2 bullet storm vr uh that i didn't hear much about after it came out it's sitting at a mostly negative right now on steam so maybe that wasn't it there was a lot of really cool attempts on the original PSVR, specifically stuff like Borderlands 2 got a VR mode and also Skyrim VR and specifically Skyrim VR. 
was almost there in that it was so immersive and so neat to be in that world we had spent dozens and dozens of hours in, but the controllers weren't designed to play games like that without an analog stick. Sure, it it worked and it was very cool, but uh, it definitely didn't feel like the optimal experience because it just wasn't designed for that. Now we have the controllers. We have the tech to make these games. And you see that so beautifully in Resident Evil 4 VR. I seriously, if you have PlayStation VR 2, you have this game. Yeah. It's absolutely worth checking out. You mean you just play the beginning because that's I expected to just play the beginning of it and then move on. And then I almost played the entire game that way and had a fantastic time doing it. So it just we have this 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 new hardware that has so much more capabilities than the original in just its controllers. And that's hasn't really been utilized and when it has it at least in terms of like bullet storm vr i also just don't think that's the right game to really no, yeah that uh, was confusing I will, I will say the one thing to to put a little bit of a positive twist on this is that we do have that metro vr game that was announced recently that looks pretty damn cool yeah people people were disappointed by that but i thought like i i remember seeing that and thinking like oh metro and vr makes total sense yeah like that is a perfect marriage. Like that makes if there's anything that was I think that was the state was that the state of play that 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 they showed that at or, or what what was that that thing that they showed the metro thing at? Was that a state of play? Yeah, that showed, was the last one. Showed, yeah, yeah, because they showed two VR games that I remember being like, those both look like I would play them. That one, that oh, other, uh, that other one is the best selling game on PSVR two right now. It's it's Legendary, Legendary Tales, Tales or whatever. Legendary Tales, yeah. Is it really? Uh, I'm, yeah, yeah. I'm last gonna play month that. It was yeah. I mentioned uh, a few weeks ago asking Jimmy if he wanted to play that. He listened to the show and texted me, said, I'm in. So I said, as soon as I'm done with Rebirth, I think we're going to play Legendary Tales. Uh, so yeah. nine out of ten on Steam. So could be pretty cool. But that's the thing. Even if Legendary Tales is a nine out of ten. When you when someone's looking at buying this this device, it's like, oh, there's supposed to be this really good game that I've never heard of. It's not something that, yeah, it's great for people who already own it, but it does not move the needle for a potential buyer, most likely, unless this buyer is going in, doing research, watching gameplay, all these types of things. And even then is a game like Legendary Tales, which I believe you can play it on MetaQuest because it works. It connects to your PC. So, yeah, there so, is that yeah. also. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The, the, I don't know. I, th I think they're in an awkward position where like the for a, for a headset to cost as much as the machine. Um, you're kind of infinitely making a you're kind of always going to be making a, a comparison in your mind whether or not you want to consciously where subconsciously you're like okay well I, I have a PS5 I paid say $500 or whatever for it Um, I use it all the time J not just to play games but to like stream media and, and to like I'll blast Spotify on it I'll play I'll watch Netflix on it I'll put HBO Max on it and then when I'm when I'm done watching all my stuff I'll play a game on it I'm using it pretty often and then you have this thing that costs about the same. That is a, pro a, a hassle to set up that realistically I'm going to be using for a fucking fraction of the time. It's an awkward, it's an awkward, it's an awkward proposition. And it's always going to be in your head too, because they're linked together. That's why I think the best thing that they could do is really like sever that tie. And like, I, th I think I really do think it's like super smart of them to make that thing accessible to PC because that's, I, I think on PC, it'll thrive because it'll, it is a fucking crazy bit of kit. Um, whether it'll thrive in such a way that would save it or, or that would like generate millions of sales. I, I don't know. I don't, I don't know about that, but it'll do better. I yeah. think. Yeah. And I think they're wise to this. This was, I don't know if it was rumored or there was some indication by using the device itself or something that it was going to be coming to PC at some point. And they were more open to that. I, I think we agree, though, as far as games are concerned, that for there to be a, an arc for the arc of history to change with this thing, it needs a confluence of experiences that in its splash damage kind of reach many different people so that they all become interested in the device. It's not that it's impossible. I just I guess what I'm saying is I don't know that Sony did very much wrong, aside from the fact that they might just be betting wrong that this is a space worth being in. But other than that. I just think we need to be realistic about the the effect of this thing on the ecosystem and it's it's just complete lack of importance to playstation's health 
All right. Number three. According to fresh reporting from website IGN, Sony owned studio Bungie, once renowned for its work in the Halo franchise and later with Destiny, is continuing its slow but steady swoon under Sony's stewardship. As you may recall, Sony purchased Bungie outright in 2022 and is often noted on this very show over and over again. It was both a logical acquisition as well as a truly peculiar one because Sony virtually never buys teams it hadn't first worked with in a second party capacity, particularly for several billion dollars, a lot of capital for a corporation like Sony. Then again, then again, Sony felt like it helped it needed help in the games as a service and online spaces, and so it made a dramatic move, and it may not be working out. For starters, Bungie has multiple games in development, as we know, but two of them are the most vital, the Final Shape expansion for Destiny 2 and the reimagining of Marathon. IGN's multiple sources indicate that, quote, Bungie is in the midst of shifting around its creative leadership of Marathon, including removing longtime Bungie designer Christopher Barrett from the game director role, end quote. He's been replaced by Joe Ziegler, one-time Valorant game director at Riot, who moved to Bungie in 2022 around the time Sony made its purchase. He's apparently held this role for nine months um, in secret, so um, it's unknown what's gone on there. As we've noted on this show in the past, based on the Insomniac leaks and other circulating information, the Bungie rank and file are expecting layoffs after the final shape ships in a few months. IGN says that, quote, one person with knowledge of budgets at Bungie says nothing adds up and something will need to happen to curb costs unless the final shape does so well to cover the gap and people can move over to Marathon, end quote. And then there's the problem of employee retention, which Sony has paid a significant amount of money towards, but which can only be stretched so far into the future. They report, quote, within the company, there is a growing expectation that senior company leadership will leave in droves in the summer of 2026 when the final payouts from Sony's acquisition of the company take effect. With this in mind, there is a strong push to get Marathon out the door before then and let whoever takes the reins after that, be it Sony or Bungie, worry about how it's sustained, end quote. Later, they note that, quote, internally, the sentiment is only growing that the final shape needs to succeed for Bungie to avoid avoid further internal turmoil, end quote. As for Bungie's other two games, we've known for a while that their new IP codenamed Matter has long been canceled. But there's another game, a MOBA codenamed Gummy Bears, that's also bouncing around. This project is apparently on hold as all hands are on deck for the other two games. Chris, I've been eager to talk to you about this. Yeah. And see what you think about what's happening here over at Bungie, which I contend was a, a big mistake for Sony to get involved with and is slowly blowing up in its face. I think, although maybe marathon turns into this amazing success story, but from my perspective, it's yeah. like three and a half billion dollars invested plus the cost of making marathon. Like, how are you making that money back? I think this is a sunk cost for sure. You know? Yeah. It's, 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 it's a wild situation. <clears throat> I think, because I've seen <laughs> I've seen some interesting stuff kind of circulating in the community, even as far as like a like an email that was leaked that I, I personally believe uh, after seeing some of this stuff. And just basically based on what I know about Bungie in general, where there is a pretty obvious. Almost transparent disregard for the studio from some of the executives who have long held their positions to the point where like i think they were um they were rescheduling you know business calls with sony leadership even though they knew that like the next available spot was like months later like just really 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 not good <laughs> you, you don't have good talent in the executive suite at bungie you just don't and and it's been an open secret for a really really long time now it, among the community, but I think it's only now kind of um, hitting the fan with like on a more executive level where it's like, oh yeah, the leadership doesn't know what the fuck they're doing. Um, the talent knows the talent can do well, but like the, the, this leadership is fucked and they don't know how to manage anything. I, this seems to have been just a massive mistake or at the very least, if the purchase wasn't a mistake, the decision to not, immediately kind of go in and be like okay listen we 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 made this purchase right and you can remain independent to to a, to a certain degree or, or you can you can you know release your games anywhere but you'd think that if you were making an acquisition like that you would at least have some cursory research to kind of know what has been an open secret even just among the community for a long time and you would have made some kind of effort to kind of look into that on a deeper level with your now obvious uh backdoor clearance and then make decisions based on that um they probably should have been and maybe they were afraid of like the attitude being too hostile or whatever or it's like oh we don't want to come across like we're like doing a hostile takeover of bungie but like quite frankly like a lot of people both at bungie and who play bungie games 
wouldn't have minded that on some level. At the very least, to get rid of the people who are currently in leadership roles because they they have long been really irresponsible with the company. As far as like marathons um, shift, I've heard some rumors that they're they're moving from custom customized player characters to uh more of a hero shooter vibe or more of a like oh you're going to select like from a, uh, a roster of pre-existing characters which is like i don't know if i i don't know if that's really bungee i don't know if that's really the i don't know if that's the move there, there are certain things happening with marathon that don't strike me as the the smartest decisions and replacing christopher barrett with a the valorant guy i i i don't see that as a smart decision personally uh although christopher barrett's been a, a storied art lead more than anything he's been an, an environmental artist for a long time and he's been in charge of a lot of art direction over the over the over bungie's tenure including i think um i think in early myth he was like a multiplayer designer and then as, as far as destiny he became art art director and he's, he's moved through that direction for a while um and it could be that he wasn't directing the game well but like i j- there's part of me that really doubts that and i feel like they're really shifting direction as a result of a lot of the financial peril that they're facing and i think they're maybe moving with a bit more haste than judgment um as far as that goes but yeah man it's 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 a bad situation over bungie i don't know what the fuck they're doing um it must be the 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 attitude or not the attitude the morale there must be fucking dire if you're expecting layoffs after your next thing and just have to stick it out. Like you have to imagine that a lot of these people, you have to imagine that an overwhelming majority of the people who are working at Bungie on on a level that they know that they're going to be on the chopping block are well into the position of fielding other opportunities at this point. Like you would have to imagine, right? Yeah, I would think I would, (laughs) I would be, I'd be like, Hey, it's dicey over here. Anybody want to, you know, I'm, I'm really good at this. (laughs) Come throw me a lifeline. So it's, I don't know what to say about this other than, I mean, I'll bounce it off of you guys, but it's, uh, it's bad. What do you think? It is bad. I wonder in this situation, just that with how bleak things are, uh, (laughs) what would, what, what situation would Bungie be in if Sony had not purchased them? Cause that's the thing that I see bouncing around. And I, I think there's some, I, I see the different angles, but I see there's a lot of like, blaming sony for some of this stuff but i'm like no they're kind no. of you know saving the day on them for in a lot of ways and the thing about the final shape i just think that you know the, in the write-up you talk about how they're like well hopefully it does well enough to kind of cover the stuff in between and it's like i don't know i feel like the confidence in in destiny 2 even amongst its most hardcore is just at an all-time low and I guess to counterpoint that already, just think about how all it takes is one good release for gamers to change their their tune on something like it's always funny when when there's a bad release. It's like, oh, don't ever trust this company again until the next game comes out and then it gets really good scores and then everything's fine. So I don't know, maybe the final shape could be great and convince a lot of people to come back. But it's tough when a game like that is. Oddly, it's very approachable in that it's free to play. You can play a lot of the expansions, but uh, you can't play the beginning of Destiny 2 anymore. So really, the market on this is so small in that I guess you could come in and just start at the final shape. But I I don't I, I feel like with something that's so lore heavy and story, uh, people being so heavily involved with the story that the final shape is not necessarily that's going to appeal to new players you got to convince a lot of these people to to come back so it's a a tough situation yeah. for them and yeah. yeah the hero shooter thing dude chris i saw that thing also and it made me think of the thing you had said about halo infinite at one yeah. point being what is it about hero shooters that like after overwatch came out it, it it infected a lot of developers like oh we need to make our game our very established game and which i know marathon's not necessarily this case, the, the case but yeah suddenly everything needs to be a hero shooter let's put hero shooter elements in call of duty let's do this it's like yeah it's that, like, that, that, that was kind of sailed i feel that like was, not that there's no <laughs> good hero shooters but it's really not the hot craze anymore no not not even slightly and and yeah i i saw that and i immediately was like well that's that's 
Look, I, like you said, it's not marathon is is kind of maybe a hero shoot, but it's still an extraction shooter. So it's going to be an extraction hero shooter. What the fuck does that even like? Maybe that could be interesting. But like I, Bungie has always been, I don't know, even in Destiny, where things kind of got like very, very different from their roots. Like they've always had like a very strong emphasis on player customization and the fact that you are kind of your guy. So for them to move into a direction that's kind of spiritually antithetical to that is it's it's not interesting like it would be for them to have made like a third person action game. You know what I mean? Where like that'd be like, oh, I wonder what they could do in that realm. This is just kind of like, oh, well, you're doing something that everybody does now. And that's kind of not really that interesting. Like every, even Fortnite is just like, oh, I'm Spider-Man. Oh, I'm fucking... I don't know Lizzie McGuire. I don't know. I don't know who what skins they're adding to Fortnite these days. But like, you know, so like your every game is about like playing as every everything else, and 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 so for for Bungie to be like, ah, yeah, fuck, yeah, fuck the thing that we've been doing forever that we're really good at actually. It, it's it's very it's a strange direction, and also just the Valorant director being there doesn't really inspire me with a lot of confidence because that's that's a lot of outside Valorant. I, I, Speaking as a first person shooter fan, like Valorant has never spoken to me at all. I have never even been slightly curious to play Valorant. I have not heard anything positive about it from people who I know do play. Um, it is such an out there game that like I just I, I can't imagine that Bungie would have anything to learn from Valorant. Um, from a gameplay well, perspective, or design from Valorant, that. that would be an IGN article 15 years ago. Yeah, yeah, which is very little. I, I, I don't, I don't know. T- to me, the people blaming Sony are kind of insane. Uh, I, I don't th- like I like I've said many times on the show. Like, there's been a problem with the C-suite at Bungie for a long time, and if and if Sony is the axe that is necessary to free them from that C- from that oppressive C-suite, I think that's a, that's an axe worth swinging. I think, um, because that's been a problem in the in the company ever since the Activision. Uh, acquisition which was uh 10 years ago now or over so yeah would it would i the issue is how they choose to replace them is like that's really my concern is like well do you move are you going to move the talent there up because you don't necessarily want your talent to not be in a role where they can deliver on that talent but at the same time there's people who worked at bungie for a very very long time who probably deserve those positions and probably won't get them because uh, if they do kind of axe the C-suite or, or, or take these executives out and replace them, they're probably going to be with Sony executives. Um, or at least I would imagine that that would be the case. So uh, it's, it's a bleak situation there, man. And also the final shape being in, in such a... The final shape having so much pressure on it, not that it wouldn't have had a lot of pressure on it anyway, even if Lightfall wasn't a mess... But for it to have this much pressure on it can't be healthy for morale. It's not it's not healthy for the game. Like you have to imagine it's affecting development of the game to the point where like, yeah, the final shape is probably not going to be as strong as it could be based on the amount of pressure around it and the dire circumstances that surrounds the studio. So it's it's just it, the whole thing just feels like a snake eating itself, really, where there's really no there's not a lot of positivity to glean from any information that's come out of Bungie in a, in a while. So the best that they can hope for really is that the final shape lands and has a fucking hell divers style, fucking surprising Renaissance, which I really, I, I, I doubt, uh, but I have noticed that, uh, a lot of friends that I do play destiny with or have played destiny with who have fallen off in, in the last several months, largely due to the fact that they've delayed the final shape. And so this the extended season is just kind of like not really worth checking in with. A lot of them are starting to dive back in. I've gotten text messages about like, oh, are you gonna are you gonna dive into Destiny? I was like, I have I haven't had Destiny installed in months. What's happening? It's like, oh, they're adding this and that. It's like, yeah, okay, I'll I'll check it out. The hoverboards and or whatever. Th- they added they the do new look, vehicle. They, yeah, they do look cool. I will yeah. I will say, like, it just hasn't looked cool enough for me to install it. But, like, now that I know people are kind of coming back, it's like, okay, yeah, I'll give it a shot. And I probably won't delete it until the final shape because it'll be there anyway. And I've stuck with this franchise for long enough to want to see how it c- concludes at the very least. So I'm going to check it out. But, like, it, it's got to be fucking crazy good for it to have an impact 
that wouldn't lead to the dire outcomes. And, you know, I, that sucks. I feel, I feel bad for everybody at that team. That's kind of suffering under the weight of their own, um, the, the hubris of their C-suite. It sucks. Or Ponderer wrote into us on Patreon. Says hello, Colin, Dustin, and Chris. This week we received further unsettling news about the inner machinations of Bungie and its projects. With Marathon's creative director being swapped mid-project, the board reportedly dodging meetings with Sony, the cancellation of Matter even after a reboot, and mind you, that game had a $100 million in net ease investment. The situation for Bungie and the, and the way it will affect PlayStation seems to be materially worse than we could have imagined even last year. Just how long will Bungie survive is not an unreasonable question given how poor their operation and further projects have been progressing. What say you? Um, I don't know enough about their internal workings to really have a good insight into their like overall cumulative health, like if they could survive with whatever headcount. What I do know is my instinct early on that this was a mistake is was right. And I was saying that from the beginning that, and I said that in my write-up, what, which is like, this logically makes sense if you feel like you need help in some way, but you never worked with these guys before. You don't know them. And this is so very on Sony. You know, I brought up this data just to, to kind of put a fine point on it. We don't know all the numbers on what these teams were purchased for, but I am confident that Sony paid more for Bungie than the following teams combined. Okay. Bend, Blue Point, Fire Sprite, Firewalk, Gorilla, Haven, Housemark, Insomniac, Media Molecule, Nixes, uh, Valkyrie, and then all the closed studios that they bought Big Big, Evolution, Incognito, um, and Zipper Interactive. Not to mention Liverpool, which was independent as well. Sony spent more money on Bungie than all those teams, certainly. When you look, when you we know that Insomniac was two hundred, so Insomniac was less than ten percent of the price of Bungie, right? So we know that, and it's just like what a profound waste of money that was, and now this becomes Sony's problem, and that's that's yeah. where I, where I agree with you guys completely. Is people look at this and say like, what has Sony done? It's like as far as I understand, Sony gave them so much rope that they they hung themselves, hang themselves would be the technically proper English, and. That might have been a mistake, but I think it was a mistake getting involved with them at all. I continue to believe from my perspective that there must have been another buyer sniffing around and that Sony purchased this company without doing its proper, you know, proper due diligence and discovery and figuring things out and really going into the books, because what else could possibly explain such a mishap like this? They don't have the amount of money to kind of waste on on products like this. And if you combine this, if you combine the kind of botched acquisition along with the kind of aborted or half aborted games as a service initiative in which many of those games have been canceled. Then again, and we were talking about this earlier about gleaming new information and coming to new outcomes or what you think happened. It's like you can kind of see them being like to to um, to Jim being like, what have you done? Like. You spent all of this capital on this product that hasn't helped us is hurting us now costing us money and so, and a lot of time and talent and resources and we're also not even pursuing those games anymore it to me this is like damn dude i'm sure they wish they can unwind this i am positive that they wish they can go back and undo this in some way maybe there's some hope that like uh marathon turns into this huge success story but uh, it's what i said earlier it's not about having one success story to make the money back that they spent. This is what I was saying about Activision and Microsoft. It's going to take them a couple of decades to make that money back. If if things go the way that it goes now, it's not like just a zero sum. Oh, we make our money and now we're in the in the in the black or whatever. It's like, no, you just spent all this money and they're going to lose all their talent, which is what we were saying from the very beginning. These guys are going to get paid out and leave. That's what anyone that was smart would do, by the way. Because you can either retire or spend that money on a new project or just go do something else. Like you have, you're untethered from life, like real world. That's life changing money for a lot of these guys. Yeah. So, of course, they're going to go. I just don't understand why Sony decided to break their their mantra. And people made, made fun of me for so long saying this stuff. And it's been so right. That's what's so frustrating about it. I have been so right about saying Sony doesn't succeed when they get involved, like in these random situations where they haven't vetted them properly and they clearly didn't know what they were getting involved in and Bungie is worthless without its leadership like that helped guide all of these things and like you know the leads of all their teams and a lot of the talent too but 
the retention bonuses were me- meant to kind of keep people in place. So Bungie's just this shell. It's it goes back to what I've been saying when I was saying the Jez on our Sacred Symbols Plus episode of just this idea of games being made as one offs by unique permutations of people. No more of this old studio structure where you have to kind of sustain yourself in this massive headcount on this hopefully upward trajectory that doesn't often happen. I just think these problems were somewhat predictable. And so maybe in a couple of years, like Marathon will be the biggest game in the world and I'll look so so stupid for this, but I just doubt it. <laughs> and I just, I'm sure it'll be fine, if not good, if not garner a lot of attention, but it's it's, the cost is so great. And the distraction is so high. What worth it? Because they, they were saying in the story, it's like maybe after Final Shape, Sony comes in and kind of takes control. And it's like, well, what was the point of this then? So now Sony is going to own. We've said it before. So now Sony's going to run Bungie. It's a fucking the, the, the company they bought for their expertise. They're going to run them now. Hmm. Smart. Very smart. <laughs> Meanwhile, they could have purchased like a small publisher if they really wanted to for that. Or invested as they should have always been in new teams or putting a ring on a few of the teams that they that are in their orbit that they feel like they would want to get. Instead, they wasted all of this money. And so if you backtrack, you could kind of see it's like, yeah, maybe this went. Maybe the Connie Booth stuff, the Jim Ryan stuff, like maybe there's more to this. Because losing that much money for a company like Sony is a big deal. And they're going to be paying, as far as I understand, like they will be counting some of the price of the Bungie acquisition through retention bonuses out to future quarters. So this is going to be like on the books. It's not like the cost is already paid and they can move on. They not only have to sustain the studio's headcount and throw them a lifeline, but they also need to continue to pay off the contractually obligated money that they owe. Hmm. No. It's interesting. Teams rise and they fall. We were just talking Mm -hmm. about Bioware earlier. And maybe. I think the best the best case scenario, in my opinion, would be for Sony to somehow unwind this, sell the company at a loss to a private equity firm or something like that and retain a small portion of the company to try to claw back the rest of the money over years from future hopeful successes and just realize that this isn't a team you should be running at all. Yep. So I will say this: Sony has no business running Bungie. Sony doesn't know what Bungie needs. If Bungie doesn't know what Bungie needs, and Sony got in bed with Bungie to understand what Bungie knows, then how the fuck does Sony know what Bungie needs? That doesn't even make any sense. That's just a failed logic equation. Yeah. Mm, no. 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 I'll be watching this with great interest, like Senator Palpatine watching Anakin. <laughs> Number four, this just broke before we started recording, and I thought we'd go through it quickly. Monthly sales data has been revealed for the American games market, the largest core gaming market in the world. Obviously, this data covers last month, February of 2024, and it was another month of market dominance for the PlayStation brand. For starters, PlayStation 5 was again the best selling console in the region for the month, and it makes sense why. The two top selling games in February were PlayStation 5 console exclusives. Helldivers 2 was the month's best selling game, a second party title published by Sony and developed by Arrowhead which is purportedly nearing 10 million copies sold across platforms. A majority of those copies, about 6 and 10, being sold on PC. This means we can expect Helldivers 2's PC, PS5 sales to be a respectable 4 million or so. The second best-selling game of the month was Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, the sequel to 2020's Final Fantasy VII Remake. Other notable games on the list include Ubisoft's beleaguered Skull and Bones at 4, the Final Fantasy VII Remake and Rebirth Twin Pack at 8, Persona 3 Reload at 9, Spider-Man 2 at 13, and Avatar, Avatar Frontiers of Pandora hanging on at 20. In the young year of 2024 so far, this all makes Helldivers 2 the best-selling game in the U.S. to date, with Final Fantasy VII Rebirth at 4 and Persona 3 Reload at 7. Very nice. We'll see. Helldivers 2 is going to be one of the best-selling games of the year, which is uh, pretty remarkable. So congratulations to Arrowhead. Interesting to get a little bit of a breakdown. It is American-centric, but it suggests that a majority of the copies are being sold on PC. I don't think that's a huge surprise. Yeah. Um, By the way, guys, there's a fifth piece of news, which I looked just... uh, while we were talking before, this is nothing too serious to speak about, but I don't know if you saw Kotaku's EIC resigns over editorial edict. I'm oh. sending you the link here in the chat. This is from the crowdsourced games website aftermath.site. 
And they say, quote, Jen Glennon, who took over as editor in chief of Kotaku in October, resigned Thursday. And a resignation letter seen by Aftermath Glennon says she made the choice due to management team's recent decision to de- deprioritize news in favor of guides. Glennon is the second editor in chief of Kotaku since Stephen Totillo's departure in 2021, following Patri- Patricia Hernandez, who was fired in August of 2023. Um, <laughs> the letter apparently says that she that so Jen Glennon, the former EIC, wrote a letter to go or geo or go media, the people that own Kotaku and all those other sites it says, quote, after careful consideration, I have concluded that the current management structure and decision making processes at go media are not aligned with my values and goals for Kotaku. I firmly believe that the decision to invert Kotaku's editorial strategy to deprioritize news in favor of guides is fundamentally misguided given the current infrastructure of the site. This decision is directly contradicted by months of traffic data and shows an astonishing disregard for the livelihoods of the remaining writers and editors who work here. Um, so she resigned. The site says that, quote, according to a source close to the situation, Kotaku staff will be expected to write, create 50 guides a week at the site. Currently, Kotaku's homepage features a prominent games and tips guides module at the top of the page in a space that was previously reserved for major stories and breaking news. And um, Jen Glennon tweeted out about Jim Spanfeller, the Go Media CEO, says, um, I've quote, I've resigned from Kotaku and Jim Spanfeller is an herb. Now, this bothers me because does she think that the insult is an herb? It's a herb. The insult is calling a person a herb, not an herb. So I, I think you're a little, a little bit wrong there on that one. But I've never even heard that. I've never even heard that insult in my life. It's an old insult. Calling someone a herb is like a Ramon uses that terminology. It's like a very, I don't know what it is, but yeah, like saying like you're such a herb is uh yeah I don't know like a kind of a dork or a loser, right? So uh, do we have any thoughts on this before we proceed? I figured we it would be a good time to bring this up. I mean, I all I have to say is um, you know that meme where it's like God, I've seen the things you've done for other people and I want you to do that for me. It's like, Mm. let's just get this thing dead and buried already. Shall we? Can we all hope and pray? Kotaku is on its way out. Um, fuck that site. Uh, I hate them. I hate that website so much. They have been nothing but unfair, not only to us and to me, but to so many games, to so many people, just complete disregard, disrespect, just completely ideologically captured. And that they're, Stra- they're going to move over to strategy guides is funny because it means that their per- their voice is worthless that they're now going to seo farm and that their message is completely fallen I-, I i feel like this is the beginning of the end of the the brand um as it becomes some sort of guide sub so do you guys have any thoughts before we move on i know this wasn't in the write-up so i don't expect you guys to have anything to necessarily say yeah well it just tells me that their guides are probably the best thing on the site i'm looking at them now and it's not traditional guides that you would think of from IGN or something like that. It's more like 16 things you need to know before starting rebirth. How do you get this in this mm. game? Which, what is the best materia setup? So more like individualized articles. And uh, I think I've recently, I was trying to figure out how to do something in a game and a Kotaku, like a very specific, Oh, this is what I'm looking for. This article is specifically designed around this, which can be, helpful as opposed to going into a a giant comprehensive guide from something like IGN. Those are great too, but um, it just from what you've read to us and lightly thinking about the situation over the last minute, I I wonder, is this a thing where it's like, well, maybe management is looking at the numbers like, okay, the other stuff you're doing isn't making money. This is making money. So you need to do more of this. That's what it seems like to me, which if the site is dying, then, it, then yeah, there's, there's no saving Kotaku at this point. I, I don't, I don't, I just the the, the vitriol towards that brand is so unanimous. I don't know if you guys see it or not. It's like, it's, I don't know what happened because Kotaku had a big fan base at one point, like a big readership 10 years ago, even more than that. I mean, 15 years ago, Kotaku was a pretty big site with a lot of content, pretty good writers, not always, but some good storied seasoned writers there and they just completely ruined it. And the, the it's weird because the staff blames the management, but the staff is the one writing the content. If they were compelling, then people would read the content. It's, it's impossible for these people to look inward at all and realize that they are the problem. It's also the model, like just websites are a problem. So it, in and of itself, it's, it's oh, the, the whole games journalism as, as, as it was constructed is done. It's not, it's not a thing anymore. It's over. 
And if you have an unlikable and untalented staff of people writing your website like Otaku does, then it's really over. We were talking a few weeks ago about how Go Media spun off Deadspin. First of all, Go Media sold Lifehacker last year. Then they sold Deadspin. And I imagine Kotaku's future is going to be the same, where they're just going to sell the, the brand and fire everyone there and do some legacy content with it or something. It would be interesting, interesting like to know what they would want for it and if you could save it. But like, what is the point, really? Kotaku isn't worth saving. And so... <laughs> That's how I feel about it. I don't know if anyone else wants to. Chris, you have anything you want to say before we move into the listener inquiries? Uh, bye. <laughs> <laughs> bye, bitch. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not gonna miss him. I mean, oh. I feel bad for anybody. I feel bad for anybody who's there, who's like a, a decent person who's gonna lose their job or whatever. But like, I mean, there's no one on also, there. There's also, no one on their editorial staff. Tight. There's no one on their editorial staff at this point that is that should be doing anything in this industry <laughs> so that's fair my, yeah. my barometer for my barometer is pretty maybe my barometer today is a little askew because i've been watching that nickelodeon documentary which is wild <laughs> so i'm like as long mm. as you know as long as none of that's going on i hope i hope you land on your feet or whatever but i i i really i hate kataku i've hated them for a long time but i also don't want to sit here and just like circle jerk about how much i hate kataku you know what i mean no, totally so it's just like you know what have, have a good time F- figure your shit out uh, I won't miss it. <laughs> yeah, Chris Raygun, conservative YouTube commentator, right? King of that autism the- <laughs> is what they wrote. <laughs> yeah, it's wild. like it's like um, bye bye. Yeah, see ya. Okay, let's traditional uh, as we always do traditionally end our show with six questions, comments, concerns, thoughts, and ideas. Our listener inquiries from the audience over on Patreon, Patreon.com. Slash Last Stand Media, a medley of topics for us to get through as we wrap things up this week on episode 299. Michael, a lady, wrote in and said, All right, let's delve into the role of community managers. So last week, Chris, you weren't here, but we talked about community managers and what they do if they're necessary and so on and so forth. And I think we had a pretty nuanced answer, but Michael seems to be a little heated. It says, As a community manager myself for a video game company, your recent hot take rubbed me the wrong way, particularly because it seemed you lacked a deep understanding of the responsibility of community managers. First and foremost, Colin equated the success of a community manager with the number of followers they have on a specific social platform. Here's the thing. I'm not meant to amass followers. That task falls to the game's dedicated social channels. Managing social media is not synonymous with managing a community. While the social media manager handles platforms like TikTok, Meta, X, Instagram, etc., the community manager focuses on community platforms like Discord, forums, Reddit, etc. Occasionally, I collaborate with the publisher's social media managers to coordinate efforts, but on a day-to-day basis, it's not my responsibility to attract followers to our social channels. That's a job oriented towards marketing. Secondly, you implied that community managers don't have much to do, especially when it comes to single player projects. Let's outline some of the tasks I handle daily. One, I monitor our Discord channel, forum, Reddit, and Steam's community hub, addressing the plethora of questions directed at me. Two, I mediate disputes between players across all platforms happens more often than not. Three, I organize and execute community events such as tournaments and contests to foster community cohesion. Four, I arrange events like AMAs on Reddit to boost player excitement about the game. Five, I regularly engage with content creators to explore potential collaboration. Six, I consistently relay uh, player feedback to our team to keep them informed about the community's preferences and dislikes regarding the game. Seven, I consistently direct players to our bug reporting tool to ensure crucial bugs are reported accurately. Lastly, while I agree that community managers may not hold as pivotal a role in a project as those directly involved with its development, it's incorrect to suggest that they don't contribute to the bottom line. Maintaining a happy, engaged, and exciting community is no small feat, and it directly contributes to the positive word of mouth, which in turn drives sales. Hopes this clarifies things a bit. A little defensive, in my opinion. The lady doth protest too much. Um, <laughs> didn't we explicitly? I wanted to give Michael the way to, to say. I'm losing my mind here. Like, didn't we say last week that there are there are games that are so <laughs> that are so spe- specified that they need really deep? Yeah, go ahead. I mean, I I, well, I guess well, we, yeah, that's exactly what we said. We said certain multiplayer games that have multiplayer communities absolutely need community managers. I, am I? I feel like I'm losing my mind about what we talked about last week. Which, to be fair, I have said that. We forget nearly everything that's said no, he's on saying, the show. He's but saying your single player game as well. So he is clarifying like on a single player game. This, these are the things he does. But but it's like we didn't just we didn't just like defame all community management. We I said that it was a boutique um, position that cannot be afforded by most teams. 
and probably shouldn't be afforded by most teams and should probably go direct. Like there should be, I think what we said is that there should be a role that folds marketing, social and community management into one. That seems to be a, a wise use of, um, of resources. So I think that there are some games that totally demand community management, like I said, but I think that there are a lot of community managers at a lot of, on a lot of games at a lot of studios that are simply the lowest man on the totem pole. And I cannot imagine that a community manager, especially at a studio with an unannounced or unreleased game in which some of these places have community management. It's like, what are you even doing? I could describe, by the way, I can number all my tasks every day to make them sound as crazy as this. Right. You know, it's not a matter of like, so I understand you. I wanted to give you your, your chance, Michael, to say what you say and present your side of the case. But I don't know that we went that hard on community managers. I could be wrong. Yeah, I'm just I'm looking at this because it says, especially when it comes to single player projects. And then let's outline some of the tasks uh, and then immediately talks about tournaments and disputes between players. Uh, like talking about multiplayer related things, which the, our specific example last last week was about like a team like Naughty Dog, where uh, does Naughty Dog have a discord server or something like that? that needs probably, to be they probably do. I, I, I have no idea, but it's like that's. I don't know. I don't want to get too deep into it. I don't think that some of this stuff sounds all that important. That was kind of the point I was making. Of course, in in games with single player games with with big communities or storied studios making them, of course, you want to have a community manager monitoring all that stuff. We, we I think we said that as much. So, yeah, but again, I, I think a lot I'm of, sorry that if I understated anything. Yeah, well, go ahead, Chris. Well, I wasn't here for it, so I, I don't know. I don't know what you guys said or, or what, but like uh, I, I it is of my understanding and I. I I say that as somebody who is, I, I remember interacting with community managers uh, for certain games for a while. And I, I think, I think for multiplayer games, they're definitely necessary. Like unquestionably, like, like Deej was like really, really instrumental early on in, in, in destiny. Like that was, he was a big part of that, of, of what got a lot of people interested um, or at least from, from my perspective as, as a hardcore person who was kind of like already like in and just kind of like, oh, man, I wonder what they're going to be doing. And, and this guy kind of rose and, and did a lot of stuff. And I know that, too, from the the, the Halo days as well. Um, as far as like single player stuff, I don't I don't I don't know what the Naughty Dog community is, but I. I, I, I don't know. It, ju- it just seems like it's more of a multiplayer centric thing. Like if you have games with meta changes and like constant updates like Destiny or Helldivers, like. It makes sense, I think, to have somebody to do some outreach to like content creators who are building a brand, who are building their careers off of your stuff. And there's like a somewhat of a parasitic, um, I don't mean that, or a symbiotic, I guess is, is a better way to put it, a symbiotic relationship between certain content creators making videos about your game and you making and you making your game and updating it with enough information to keep that kind of sustainable. And that it, it kind of acts as like a way to get people in. I remember more console back in the day was like a big a big uh, engine for for destiny and now you have like aztec cross and and uh dado who they, they make like meta guides and all that stuff and th- they all do like super super well and that drives engagement with the game and drives engagement with the community that's really vital i i just don't know how much that exists for something like god of war like i don't know what the god of war community manager is necessarily doing i don't mean that to like disparage it i just genuinely have no idea that's, like I, I, I don't know what it is. That's what I said. I, I remember saying this actually last week was that I, for first and second party, I would see it being more efficient based on the rotisserie of games, mostly single player that Sony puts out that you would have a centralized PlayStation Corp run group of marketers, cross community managers, cross social media managers that deal all together and they move on from game to game to game together. As opposed to having just one. Pro- I, I don't know. I, to me, that seems or like, you a have like a fran- yeah, or you have like a franchise community manager you know what i mean somebody's like oh here's the last of us community manager generally right but it's like the last of us doesn't need a community manager that's 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 like kind of my point is like that what is the what is the community manager of the last of us yeah i I don't know i i i I know very extensively he probably needs multiple community managers (laughs) yeah destiny is a community team right (laughs) but but But, that's what i was saying you know yeah no i i get that uh yeah, I, I would want to know a little bit more in depth other than like a list of kind of vague tasks. Like I would actually genuinely out of, out of a sense of sh- authentic curiosity, I would want to know what the community manager for a single player project does. Because I'm just not in any 
Probably I wouldn't not consider, very much. <laughs> I, I wouldn't consider I wouldn't consider myself engaged with any single player communities enough to even know if that's even a thing. You know, yeah, because like, the, the only player, community, yeah, like, Hell Divers is is like Hell Divers is a big is a big thing. Like it would mm-hmm. make sense for that to have a community manager. Mm-hmm. Definitely, definitely. I, I I don't know. Anyway, it wasn't anything personal. Thank you, Michael, for writing. Murder and such wrote in and said, "Gentlemen." You may remember me as the guy who committed, as Colin stated, highway robbery for trading my SNES box copy of Super Perils of Baking to my local game store that specializes in vacuums and video games for a PSVR 2 and a Logitech G29 racing wheel. At the end of the episode, Colin had told me to stay frosty. Well, whether it be karmic or not, this past Christmas, I was diagnosed with stage 2 lymphoma, and that's on top of 27 years as, I ty- as a type 1 diabetic, including diminishing eyesight and a myriad of other issues. But I'm currently going through treatment, and I'm off work for the time being. In my time off work, I've rekindled a love for mo- for modifying consoles, particularly the Vita, and I've been introducing people to Vita Island to help keep me busy as to supplement some income as well. When I'm not working on handheld consoles, I'm often laid up in bed trying to relax while playing on my PS Portal or Steam Deck and listening to you fellas, which brings me to my question. By far and away, what is your personal favorite handheld console of all time? It could be the games, the comfort of the device, or any other combination of favors. Thank you again for the endless hours of content and break a leg at Sacred 300 Friends. Sorry to hear this about you. I don't know if it's karma. I don't think so. I felt yeah. like you, you, someone thought that that game was worth a lot more than it's ever going to be worth. Let's say that. Yeah. So I don't know. You just got, you got a good deal. That's fine. So murder and such a heart. I'm sorry to hear about your current situation, but we're wishing you well. Handheld gaming obviously is wonderful and has been a compliment to all of our lives, especially when we're ill. To me, I, I mean, I, I've had pretty much every major mainstream handheld, and uh, I would really say, I mean, being, I love the Vita. I love the Vita, but my honest answer is probably the DS. Maybe second to Game Boy Advance, and Game Boy Advance, I think, is so powerful because you can play Game Boy and Game Boy Color games on it. So, and you can obviously move that all the way forward as well, but that was a really big deal to kind of buff out because that had a very short lifespan when you look at it. It was big, three and a half years. So yeah. I'm going to give a shout out. My 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 favorite handheld has got to be the Nintendo DS. It just had so many awesome games on it. And I do love the Vita, but I don't know that it's going to hold up historically as well as the DS. What yeah. do you think, Chris? Uh, I would say, I mean, today it's the Steam Deck, unquestionably. Like t- today it's uh, without a doubt, de- like that thing is <laughs> astounding. And I'm so- I still get giddy turning it on because I'm, I'm still kind of excited that it's possible to do half of the shit that you can do on it and, and play some of the stuff that you can play on it from the comfort of your, like your bed. It's, it's amazing. Um, even the streaming stuff, I, I'm just really uh, um, impressed by. So the Steam Deck is probably my my answer as of like today, as far as like what I would use. But historically, like I really loved the PSP like a lot. Uh, a lot of the a lot of my tastes at the time were really thrown onto it. They had a Spider Man. They had a, a very unique Spider Man Two video game that was kind of that was made more. It was kind of like an asset flip of the original Spider-Man one game for the Xbox and PS2. And I remember thinking that was so interesting and how many versions of Spider-Man two exist um, and how strange that one was. They, they had a Dragon Ball Z Budokai game on it. I think it was like Shin Budokai. And then I think there was also a Tenkaichi, a Tenkaichi game on it that I never actually got a chance to finish. Um, so that spoke to me from like a Dragon Ball guy. Um, and Wipeout Pure is probably my favorite Wipeout game and it's on the PSP and just all that's I just I really loved the form factor of that thing. I loved the look of it. I loved the the logo. I loved the 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 silver circle on the back. I loved the how strange the UMD was <laughs> as like a it was like a cartridge disc. And I thought that was so fucking fascinating. Um, and the fact that it didn't even have a second analog stick didn't impede it that much, which which kind of blew my mind, really. Like, I guess you couldn't play like shooters and stuff on it, which I wouldn't have wanted to do anyway. But I, I really thought that that would be a bigger problem than it than it ended up being. And I don't know, I, I'm I, I'm really in from a handheld perspective. I'm really enamored with the PSP, both from like a marketing perspective, a form factor perspective, the games that were available on it, um, some of the remasters that were available on it. Um, the fact that they had their own like movie front basically where they, they made all of these like strange, it was like, are we, I remember having, are we there yet 
<laughs> the Ice Cube movie on UMD and watching it endlessly because it was like I could watch a portable movie. And that was really novel at the time because that was around the time that like I would say probably portable DVD players were starting to be a thing that you would see. Uh, but they were still like really big and cumbersome. And so to have it like on something that fit in your pocket was really fucking cool because it was before smartphones and before you could really do that. Um, so I would say like there's something about the P- and the connectivity that your first peak, your first peak at the PS3 cross media bar was was the PSP two. So like there was there was just something about it that I think the PSP was the Xbox 360 moment for for that console where like I, I got a glimpse of the future in it. Um that I didn't get from previous machines where the DS was still fucking really amazing too. I, I remember playing a lot on the DS and being really captivated by that as well. Um, but there was something about the internet functionality and, and the fact that there was a, a whole media system involved and just that sneak peek of the next generation. It's it, it was just a very special time. I think the PSP and the DS in general is probably like my favorite time of handhelds. Just generally, like those two was that was like a really, really peak moment in time uh, for that for that entire um, vertical of the industry. But I would say the PSP just had a vibe to it that I really, 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 really loved. And I was really disappointed that the PS Vita didn't really capitalize on or continue. There was something really bubbly about the PS Vita and a lot more like kitty oriented, even just the like the 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 user interface was like bubbles instead of just like a straightforward menu, which I thought was just kind of like, what is this? Maybe it just boiled down to like a kid wanting a machine to feel a little bit more edgy than it, than it was. <laughs> and so maybe it's like immature in some way, but there are aspects of the PS Vita that felt Fisher price to me in comparison, which like really bothered me because everything else about it was so much better. Um, you know, the analog sticks, the touch pads on the back and all that stuff is, I don't know. The vibe of the PSP was like really special to me. What do you think, Dustin? Yeah, I uh, well, first to acknowledge murder and such is right in. I'm sorry to hear about your diagnosis, and uh, I when I read this, I couldn't help but laugh. But the way you wrote it about us saying, "Yeah, watch out, stay frosty," and then saying, "Oh well, it ended up happening. I have lymphoma." Yeah, the, it's like, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah no. better attention. Oh, is, the, is no. the is the implication that? Because I I was going to be like, oh, well, like you said, stay frosty, and it's like, well. It, it's the karma. It, he's suggesting car, he has a karma, karma hit me. He has a karma. Yeah. No, 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 I understand, but I thought yeah. he was going to be like, I got frostbite or something. You know uh, what I mean? Yeah, like yeah, something yeah. adjacent to frosty. Right, I was like, right, there's, right, nothing, right. there's nothing really lymphomatic about stay frosty. <laughs> yeah, I don't, think, I don't think lymphomatic is a word, but <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like some like these like device. You know. I was gonna say that's like a yeah. George Bush word, but it's it's probably too Infamous. complicated of a, too many it's, syllables. Yeah, it's too many. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but in terms of my favorite handhelds, I go specifically to. I mean, your first is always so special. The Game Boy Pocket was was my first playing Pokemon Yellow on the bus every day, uh, and. Uh, Really, I mean, I played other games on the Game Boy Pocket, but Pokemon, we were so obsessed with it. And even playing the uh, Pokemon trading card game on the Game Boy Color, I think that was also on Pocket. It might have been one of those games that did both, but uh, that was just such an amazing device. And uh, in terms of beyond that, though, I think, Colin, I have to agree with you. The Nintendo DS, I remember originally my friend having the the, the version one, the mm. big chonky one yeah which and is being, eh, that's an eh one it's the second yeah. one that's the special one. Oh, oh the I, DS loved, Lite. I loved that first one dude the <laughs> ds light i remember eventually getting enough money to buy one and i remember getting home from gamestop and i didn't have enough money for a game so i was just playing some game boy advance games on the ds light thinking about when i could eventually buy a ds game just because i was a kid and i was dumb but yeah dude the ds specifically again and this continues with pokemon and how important it was to me at that time uh pokemon soul silver was just i i still think looking back that is my all-time favorite pokemon game was the the remake being soul silver was so awesome playing animal crossing wild world that was my first time playing animal crossing and then mario kart ds there was so many cool things and 
some other weird small games. I think of Elite Beat Agents. Hmm. Uh, that game was really fun and really cool. So, yeah, the DS and that that hardware for DS Lite, the screens, it was one of those mid-cycle upgrades that was so significant in terms of its design, the the better screens really was a nice piece of kit. And I, I still have mine. It is not in great shape just after so many years of lugging it around everywhere, but love the DS and uh, Chris, you're yeah. the Steam Deck. It Like in theory, that should be my favorite just because it does. Yeah. So much stuff. It It's you can infinitely customize it to do all kinds of crazy stuff with it. Yeah. And I love the openness, but I don't know. Nostalgia wins out. I would, yeah, I would one. say, I would say we're entering the, the territory of the conversation that differentiates between best and favorite, because I do think yeah. unquestionably, like the Steam Deck is the best. Hit. Like, there's no, there's really no contest with it. But like, favorite is is kind of that's why I kind of went back. It's like, yeah, the PSP and and, and the DS in yeah. general, dude. That 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 period in time was just so fucking good for handheld games. It's on. Un, it's unreal. Like you just had so many weird. Like I remember Scribble Knots on the DS being really mm. cool and and oh, being like that. fascinated by it. And scr- I remember that was a fascinating game. That was a really really neat game. I was yeah, I was really transfixed by it. I was just like, this is kind of. I mean, it wasn't like particularly amazing, but there was something about it that was like, this is kind of wild that this is <laughs> that this is a game that someone built and and that it's possible. I don't know. There was that was a really special game. And then the DS was the first time that I had played through. Um, on my own Super Mario 64 because they had the Super Mario 64 DS version on, on the DS. And I, I remember loving that. And just the fact that I could take that to school was yeah. crazy. I got to so give cool. a, sh- a shout out to Tetris DS as well, which you wouldn't suspect being amazing. But that was the Tetris game that got me into Tetris. I had played Game Boy, the standard Tetris game, but Tetris DS yeah. It has like a lot of Nintendo crossover stuff in it. And uh, it was really, really awesome. I should yeah. check. I haven't played that game in so many years. Tetris DS was really cool. I would love to play a DS. I don't know where the hell. I don't know where the hell my original DS went, but. I hope I hope I still have it somewhere in a box. Shout out to Picto Chat also, because I, I remember. Oh, <laughs> I remember, yeah, I, I remember Picto Chat. I remember there was a news story. That I made a video on a long time ago about how like pedophiles were using PictoChat to track down. <laughs> and it was so sensationalist. Like it wasn't even like based on anything. It was just it was just like people on some like local Fox channel being like, Here, here's how a pedophile could talk to your son while driving. And it's like <laughs> <laughs> they're going to do PictoChat while they're driving. It's insane. That, that, I really implore everybody to look that up if you can. That, that news report is one of my favorite reports ever. Of like <laughs> the pedophile panic around Nintendo DS. All right. Number. Oh, I was going to say number three, but that's not how we do it. Jared A. Rodin said, hey, CDC, last week, IGN tweeted an article about how Resident Evil 5 should be rewritten if it's remade. That tweet got ratioed into oblivion. It was so bad they had to turn off replies. Colin, you have said on the show multiple times the potential issues around a Resident Evil 5 remake. If you were at Capcom and tasked with remaking it, how would you do it? Thanks. I want to be fair to the IGN article because there was an IGN like op-ed written about this. It's called, I pulled it up here. It's called the Resident Evil game that can't be remade by Matt Perslow. And a lot of it is actually about the gameplay. And I don't know that I necessarily disagree with some of the points he's making for people that have never played Resident Evil five. What was notable about it is how action oriented it was. It's basically the first time Resident Evil, in my opinion, feels like a real shooter and it's about, enemy volume and I hated it at the time but I think I'm probably a little softer about it now I wrote the strategy guide for it what I remember specifically about writing the strategy guide was I took all the screenshots with a special outfit you only unlocked by beating the game and then a lot of people got mad at me because like every screenshot was my character in this outfit that you didn't know you could get (laughs) I guess and I was like is it really that big of a deal however part of Matt's article at IGN does get into the racial component of it and this is where I think this falls flat for me he says quote set in a fictional West African country Resident Evil 5's primary antagonists are black people. Yes, technically it's the Ouroboros virus that protagonist Chris Redfield is fighting, but the Parasite's host is depicted as a nation of mobs and primitives who are violent even before their infection. Intentionally or not, Resident Evil 5 positions Africa as the dark continent, an uncivilized world harboring a diseased population that needs gunning down via Western intervention in the name of global security. 
This insensitive treatment of people of color was hotly debated even as early as Resident Evil 5's debut trailer with writers such as, I never know how to say this guy's name, N-G-A-I, Kroll. You know that guy? He was an old, I don't know if he writes about games anymore. No, I don't know. And, and Stephen Tatilla pointing out the game's uncomfortable post-colonial imagery. The arguments and think pieces continued well into the game's release window with IGN's own former editor-in-chief, my old boss, Hillary Goldstein, having also wrestled with this subject. But that was 2009, a time when race was apparently a, re- a debate rather than a reality. In the 2020s, in a post-Black Lives Matter world, there is only one acceptable response to a white man shooting waves of Africans for an entire video game. No. Remakes may be able to redefine their source material, but there's only so many changes you can make until it's not a remake at all, but an entirely new game. And if you take Africa out of Resident Evil 5, is it a Resident Evil 5 anymore? Even with a vastly improved, more sensitive take on the continent, perhaps one with a black protagonist and more empathetic look at the outbreak, the experience would simply be too divorced from the original to hold the name Resident Evil 5. Well, I agree with that last paragraph, but... Yeah, this is going to be an issue they're going to have to deal with if they want to get involved in this. This is why I think that they're almost certainly going to go backwards to Code Veronica, to Resident Evil Zero, and kind of give this more space and time, maybe get into remaking Resident Evil 5 for PS6's generation, therefore distancing it enough from the... Like, Resident Evil 5 doesn't really need to be remade. It's playable at 60 frames, I think, on PS4. And... It is what it is. It doesn't come from a stiff camera angle, pre-rendered, fucking tank control, whatever kind of shit annoys you about old games. It's not here. Resident Evil 5 isn't like that. But this idea, this was like, there was some controversy around Resident Evil 4 as well. Not not very much, but about like, oh, you're killing Spanish people. It's like, um, the game's in Spain. So that's what's going to be going on there. Now, why should it's kind of tough because I get the, the there is a racial component to it and I get that it's probably not a great look if you just look at it out of context. It's like these white antagonists just gunning down these black zombies, but really it's deeper than that. The the umbrella corporations tentacles, as it were, reach all over around the world. And why would Africa be immune to that? And if you're so it's like we can't we just can't set any games here. You know, like, yeah, like and to me, I just don't buy that. It's like, why would you want to be excluded? And then why would you want to be further catered to by saying, OK, this is a West Af- African black country. Let's just throw some white people and Asian people in there just to make it not so bad. It's like, do you just own it? It is what it is. It's it's it takes place in that part of the world. I don't. I don't get it. This is like the same argument that was made about that HBO show Confederate that never ended up happening. Because people are like, this is too close to I'm like, guys, it's fiction about something that didn't happen in a place where this might be represented like this. It's not real. Yeah, I, I just don't I don't get why we have to reiterate this. It's almost infantile in some sense to yeah. assume that you can't handle that. It's like, no, 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 no shooters in Africa where you're going to kill black people. No, none of that. It's like, oh, OK. I mean, so so you just want to cut that entirely co- continent off. No stories can be set there where a vast majority of the population is black. It's like, I, I don't get it. That seems racist, actually. That seems more racist than Resident Evil 5. But yeah, I digress. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I have never gelled well with this, this argument either. Like, I, I just I, I also don't really agree with the idea that like, well, y- even if you said it with uh, even if you rewrote it to be like uh, more empathetic to the people who lived there or like that you'd, you'd see more of the content or whatever, like, would it still be Resident Evil 5? I'm like, why not? I don't... I, I, I don't... Resident Evil 4 and, and Resident Evil 2 Remake aren't like exactly exact one-to-one necessarily. But like, also, there are parts. But also, but like, what have, empathy? To who? Like, have these people played Resident right. Evil games? It's like, what what are you talking about? Like what do you I guess because the about? idea because the idea right is that they that they're that they're savages before the infection right yeah I guess but so are Resident Evil fours people Spanish settlers right like they were all like backwoods hodunk scythe wielding <laughs> farmer weirdos you know like, but did they but they but did they attack I don't remember Resident Evil five that well so like I don't remember if there's like I don't think you. I don't think I don't think in Resident Evil 4 the Spaniards are like attacking you before they're demons. You know what I mean? Or they're just like, ah, you know, I'm just it's me. I'm a Spaniard and I'm normal, but I'm going to kill you. But that, does that like, happen I, I in Resident Evil 5? Like, I don't I don't remember. That's what I'm saying. I don't. I, that's I what I'm saying. I really don't remember I, that. I remember the beginning of the game because I played it many times. So it, it's a little more in my brain than usual. It's like I think the first stage takes place in like a marketplace and you do start getting attacked because people are starting to get infected, but it's not clear. 
like what's going on yet. Yeah. So so if that's the case, then I don't really understand what the problem is at all. I don't because I don't think that I don't think any Resident Evil does any Resident Evil game have you killing normal people. Yeah, that's exactly that's my question. Yeah, that's what that's what that's what the article makes it. It sounds like the the people are depicted as like evil, like. Or, or, or like dangerous before the infection, but like I don't remember it that way. They're definitely I, third I, world, if that's what the guy means. I mean, they're definitely portrayed as poor, you know. Yeah, but there are places. There are places like that in Africa. I, I guess is, is the criticism yes. that it's not. <laughs> is it? Is it? Is the criticism that it's not set in like one of the major cities in Africa that's like really, really built up? Like, I mean, that's that's just not where the game takes place. We should be mature enough to understand. Are we not mature enough to understand that? Like, dude, there are places, there are places in Africa that are so crazy as far as not even like, I I mean, like in a positive way, I mean, like built up and like really, really high end that makes certain parts of America look fucking third world and vice versa. Are we not mature enough to like understand that when a game takes place in a certain place, it takes place in like a specific area in that place? Like, is the implication that because a game takes place in this specific part of Africa, that the game is saying that all of Africa is this way when we know that that's not true? Like, are, are we adults or aren't we? That, I guess, is the question that I'm asking. Like, are we tre- are we going to be treated like adults or not? Are we going to understand that we're not fucking six years old? And it's like, oh, Africa must be like this all the time. I guess there are no major cities in Africa. I guess it's all fucking markets and just uh <laughs> i don't i don't get it i don't get where the complaint comes from yeah i would just ask matt perslow at ign he's a white guy i'm looking and it's relevant because it's like stop infantilizing black people it's like enough already people doing this on behalf of other people is just too much for me it's like just relax that ever i think i think we all know that when a game takes place in africa and you're killing black people Wow, I'm looking at footage on their site. I wonder if this is my footage, which is funny. Yeah, I just, I don't get it. I don't get it. this game. Yeah, I don't, I mean, it could be, it's not very pretty, but it doesn't, it's pretty modern from a gameplay perspective. Anyway, thank you for writing. Yeah. It. Oh, Chris, did, Dustin, did we go to you on this? I don't even know. No, no, I don't. The only thing I'll just add is that I think it's interesting they talk about having, that maybe a fix is having a black protagonist, but, and I, I barely played Resident Evil 5, but wasn't the side character? Yeah, Sheva. Sheva? Yeah, you. Uh, yeah, she is black. She's like, a, yeah, she is. But you you play. You do play as Chris. I think you can later select. To play as one or the other. I don't remember. She's, right? a, she's a co-op character. That's so what like it was. She, yeah. like, okay. Yes. So if you if you go in with a friend of yours, like she'll they'll be. That's Sheva, right. That's what it was. Yeah. yeah. So and it was a costume on her that people got mad at me about. It was like some zebra costume or whatever. And people were like. It yeah, I was looking at the 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 wikipedia on her character and there is a big write-up about uh someone said that she was the pocahontas of video games or something like that like she's just the the normal characters of people being offended by uh yeah that she's you know that there's like the strong white guy the strong white american chris comes in and she's the exotic woman that guides him in the treacherous lands. Yeah. Made by a Japanese this, team, this, by the way, important. This context. really is, I really want to hammer, hammer the idea that this is, this really is the reverse, but very much the same shit is like, Oh, why is this game so fucking woke now? Like this really is this, it, it really is the same degree of derangement where I'm like, just play the fucking game. Please. For the love of God. RE five available now on PS4. And worth playing. I never played RE6. I keep thinking that I really got to do that because that's the that's the only Resident Evil game I have not played. I haven't. Yeah, I haven't played it either. <sighs> um, OK, Josh Kiskal wrote in said CDC. We're three months into 2024 and we already have one of the greatest games ever in Final Fantasy Rebirth. Helldivers 2, Tekken 8 and Prince of Persia is held to some of the best in this, their genre with games like Rise of the Ronin, Stellar Blade, Shadow of the Earth Tree, mm. etc. Still be released. Is it possible we follow up the greatest year of games in history with another banger? How is it possible we have so many great games releasing while the financial state of the industry is so bleak? Thanks and come to Detroit for Sacred Symbols 400. I can guarantee you we're never coming to Detroit for Sacred Symbols 400. Josh, thank you for writing in. <laughs> so Rise of the Ronin reviews are actually out and it's scoring in the high sevens, which is 
kind of what I expected. I really have no interest. I got to be honest. I really have no interest in that game. I'm just not going to play it. I don't think. Um, yeah. But but Stellar Blades obviously looking good. Shadow of the Earth Tree is going to be huge when that comes out, I think, in June. Final Fantasy Rebirth obviously doing great. Helldivers 2, Meteoric, Tekken 8. People are really enjoying Prince of Persia. Undersold, I think, according to Ubisoft, but strong critical reception. Dustin, is it possible that we follow up 2023 with a 2024 that's just as formidable or in that conversation or are things going to slow down? I think there are too many unknowns later in the year, though. I think surprise there's there's such a high volume of games that surprises are going to be likely games that you don't expect are going to pop. We might be in this permanent, not in a permanent space, but in a prolonged space of actually great releases simply by virtue of volume and the mathematical likelihood that some of those games have to be good. Right. Yeah, I, I think it's certainly possible. I mean, this year, even just for me so far with Persona 3 Reload, followed up by Rebirth and some of these other games mentioned uh, in the coming you know, short few months here, have all been either have been amazing or look very, very awesome. So it definitely seems like it has that possibility. It'll be mainly dependent on, as you said, when summertime rolls around and we start to see what is coming and uh, surprise stuff coming. And also just the games that may be announced right now, just we're not necessarily seeing them as a game of the year type potential. But I wanted to speak to the end part that Josh states about how is it possible there are so many great games releasing with the financial state of the industry so bleak. And this comes back to kind of like with COVID in that the the seeds of the industry three years or I guess not even three, more like four, five years now are being planted now. And so the games we're getting now, the seeds of those were planted for five years ago. So I guess it's what I'm saying is it's remaining to be seen about the bleakness of the industry, how that translates to games that are in pre-production or even being possible, you know, considered for pre-production, how it affects our long term future. So games right now are relatively safe from this kind of stuff. And even then, I think the financial state of the industry, it's not necessarily that video games are doing poorly by and large. It's just that there's a problem with how they're being made, how many are being made. And um, just overall, the the reckoning, as we've been saying, from the COVID boom and how they're kind of pulling back from that. Anything you want to add to this, Chris, before we move on? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think Dustin kind of hit the nail on the head there where I, I just think we, we have we, we have yet to see uh, what the effects of that are. And in some ways we kind of do because we know of a lot of games that are being canceled and, ha- and have been shelved. Um, but uh, yeah, we're, we're still kind of seeing the effects of an older industry or, or, or the fruits of, of labor that has been going on for quite a while. And I think that's that started last year, but there's no reason to assume that there's no reason to assume that that would arbitrarily just cut off at the end of the year. You know, like there's no reason why uh, the positivity from 2023 wouldn't bleed in some way to the year or maybe even years following. You know, it, it kind of reminds me of like how, um, you know, how like the 80s technically dies in like 93. Hmm. And how like there's there's always kind of like a trail off into the next thing. And I think that's kind of what we're seeing now is like we're seeing kind of trail a trail off from 2023 because things aren't really that neat. Like the 80s just didn't stop being the 80s the second the 90s rolled around. Like there, there was a there was a period of transition and a, and a gradient uh, or so. So I think we're we're seeing those hits now and we're seeing those misses. We're seeing Hell Divers, which everybody assumed was going to be kind of like mid or whatever. And turns out to be one of the better games. And then Rise of the Ronin, which I think people had a little bit higher hopes for, kind of hitting a little bit softer. And uh, I think we're going to see some more surprises. Uh, and there's still a lot kind of unaccounted for for the for the back half of the year. And I don't know, I, I, I'm, I'm pretty satiated with how things are going right now. Uh, I don't necessarily need anything else, but I'm sure more will come and we finally got a we we find I I know I finally got something that I'm really really excited about with with that new um uh, Dragon Ball Sparking Zero they just put out some gameplay for that and it just looks fucking perfect uh, and that's I think this year if I'm not mistaken although they don't have a release date or window yet I'm, I think it's pretty confident that it's probably this year or at the very least early next year so like I'm I'm pretty stoked for the future um you know so I I, I don't know I I think. 
But I do think we're seeing a lot of games being canceled right now, though. And and that inherently that is that is an effect of like the bleakness of the industry that you inherently wouldn't see because there's nothing to see of it. Like you wouldn't know about there's probably like hundreds of games that are being canceled that you have no idea about because they were never announced mm. or they were never uh, rumored or anything like that. And you just don't know about them because there's just no material f- for for you to have been aware of them in the first place. So that should also be noted. Brando Kazooie wrote in, said, hey, fats, can we do a status update? Got check on Sony's 12 live service games and strategy. The Last of Us Factions canceled. Deviation Games canceled. Twisted Metal canceled. London's Game canceled. Fair Games is in progress. Concord is in progress. Horizon is in progress. Ghost of Tsushima, probably. Do Marathon and Helldivers count? That would bring us to 10. What am I missing and how are we feeling? Colin, has your desire to play some of these games increased based on your experience with Helldivers? Thanks. Not particularly, because as I've said many times about Helldivers, it is very catered to something that is. It's one step. It's really the division that is much more difficult. And there's nothing and it's even less than that because it's not there's no PvP component. There's no dark zone or anything like that. So it's very catered to me. And I understand that a lot of these games simply will not be catered to me and I cannot bend them towards my will and nor should I because they're not really for me anyway. So I'll keep an open mind. I'm especially interested in fair games, as I said, because I think the idea is sounds cool, but I don't know what it's going to be. And so I'm I'm not going to say that I'm going to play any of these games. You're generally in the right frame of mind, Brando. I will say maybe another one of those games is because there's two Horizon games. There's Gorilla's Horizon game and then there's NCSoft's MMO. And I think those would both count as separate games. Ghost of Tsushima, I don't know if that would count because who knows if Ghost has what kind of multiplayer functionality he has. We're going to find out soon. I, th- I think that game's going to be announced in the coming months. And yeah. that, that'll be interesting to see. So how's it going? Not well. I mean, Helldivers 2 is a phenomenal success commercially and critically. But canceling and eating the cost of the games that they did, including Factions, which I would assume is a 100 plus million dollar write down deviation games. I told you guys last year that game was canceled. They pulled the game pretty early. Twisted Metal, apparently in pre-production, but bouncing between two studios. So you have to assume some sort of big investment. London's whole game canceled and their their studio shut down. So my gut feeling is that it's not going great, that they're probably pivoting away from doing so many of them. They want to see how these do. They'll probably always have some sort of trickle feed or like some sort of like 10, 20 percent of their games in development that would be catered towards this space. And I think that that's really smart. But they went or they feel who knows how it would have panned out if they released all these games. I have no idea. But it feels like internally they realize that they just were they 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 cast too many stones and they just need to. They, they, they can't hit as many as they thought. And in some sense, maybe Helldivers is a little bit lucky and fortuitous because it showed like, well, we had a hit right away. So that kind of takes a little bit of the pressure off and we can see what we can learn for these other games. But generally speaking, I don't think it's going so well, but I also don't think that that initiative is alive anymore. And th- and this goes back into when people bust balls and say like, where was that second showcase and all that? Well, I'm like, hmm. Yeah, it seems like <laughs> things changed, didn't it? Between uh, May when we thought that that was going to happen in the end of the year. What are they going to show? The canceled Twisted Metal game, the canceled Factions game. The can- it's I don't yeah. know. So I'm, I'm feeling OK about it. How are you feeling, Chris? I mean, I wasn't really thrilled about the idea of them going into live service anyway. I wasn't opposed to it or anything, but I I wasn't looking forward to a lot of these. And I'm still kind of, you know, Concord and Fair Games are still kind of big unknowns. So it's it's kind of hard to be excited for either of those. But yeah, I, I'm it's not going good. And I'm all right with that <laughs> in some way. I, I don't think I need uh, a shit ton of live service games out of Sony. I think the the games that are the games that are still currently happening, I think Marathon, Helldivers, um uh Concord and Fair Games, I think that's more than enough personally for me and and, and to satiate my curiosity. Is it enough for Sony? I don't know. But it's it's better than releasing all of these things into the wind uh, if they're not going to be up to snuff. I'm just, I'm still kind of surprised by factions not happening. Me too. That is the one that I'm really, really curious about because that couldn't have been cheap, but it also it's hard for me to imagine that it could have been bad. You know what I mean? Like, I, I, yeah, I, it I know exactly feel like, what you mean. I, I agree. I it, it does sound unthinkable. Like, I, I don't feel like there's no part of me that believes that they couldn't have taken what was there and turned it into something that could have turned a profit at the very least that would have made it um, 
at least if not a breakout success still pretty successful um it's just it's hard for me to imagine that that's the case but i mean they felt that that was the case so whatever um i guess that that it is what it is but as far am i disappointed to not see a live service twisted metal game no <laughs> i'm all right i see what are your thoughts I was thinking about Concord and I went back to the PlayStation blog article from when it was announced back in May of 2023. And it's funny how little we know about this game, really, Um, because I was looking to see if there was any descriptions of gameplay. And the only thing they really say is the Firewalk team is driven by the type of exciting, unexpected moments and shared experiences that multiplayer games create. And, uh, if that's really true, which I'm sure that many multiplayer games would try to describe themselves in that way. But I think of something like Helldivers that has right. exactly that unexpected moments and shared experiences that become really memorable in that's you know, someone dropped the hell bomb on my face and then or something like that. There's all these different things um, that create those memorable experiences. And if that ends up being true, then Concord could be very cool but it's just so little known between that and also fair games too that it's hard to feel excited about the the future of this initiative and these games for the time being but we'll have to see when eventually i would assume i mean concord has to be this summer that we finally get a look at what the game if they're still planning to release this year but the the sad thing still about you guys bring up factions is just that I think it still could have been great and even successful, but it comes back to what you say, Colin, about it can be successful, but it needs to be very successful. And it, the, 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 it, you need to be able to uh, really squeeze the juice out on this one. And I'll that's what's it. sad. It's I'll just that, it yeah, squeeze it, squeeze it right out there. Mm. Um, <laughs> I just wish that we could have got... <laughs> <laughs> I guess we could have gotten the more <laughs> as low key as a naughty dog game would be a low key factions that was supported for a year and had a great multiplayer suite and didn't have to be a lifestyle game. Yeah. To have a separate team that's dedicated. Hey, we're going to do this long of support for it. But that's not what Sony's interested in. They need they need to increase those profit margins clearly. And that wasn't the game to do it. Maybe Concord and Fair Games are. Maybe not. I do look at Helldiver's success. Not that they're really comparable. It's a $40 game. It's just a random phenomenon. But I, untethered from the dr- dramatic fucking consternation around The Last of Us and all the rest. But I look at that and I'm like, damn, dude. If you could sell 10 million-ish copies of Helldivers, I can't imagine how many copies. I'm not saying they would sell more than 10 million copies of The Last of Us uh, online at $70, whatever. I'm saying you could probably sell five six million maybe and make a nice little amount of money i don't know man. It, it's very surprising i kind of hope they they're not going to change their minds but it'll be awesome if they did all right jeremiah wrote in and said hey cdc colin this is mostly directed to you but i'd love to hear your dear son's takes on this as well since i don't recall them discussing the idea extensively very frequently as of late you have argued that we need fewer games in order to secure a more financially stable industry i understand the argument in a general sense but would like to hear you elaborate on it further for the sake of clarity more specifically, what games need to go and why? Are we strictly getting rid of shovelware in order to help with curation? Or are we consolidating budgets for mid-sized titles to form a singular or larger one? Does the indie space not indicate that micro communities of which there are many are more than willing or more than enough to sustain titles? This is a complex thesis, so I'd love for the three of you to deep dive on it. Wishing you all the best. Thank you, Jeremiah, for writing in. So look at the way I would visualize this is to look at like two bars on a graph, and one of them is cost and one of them is revenue and these lines are related to each other but you can start to lower the cost quite a quite dramatically and the revenue i think would lower less in other words i think the fewer games you release of quality the revenue doesn't the revenue will be less cumulatively if you have fewer games but not comparable to the number of games in which you remove from the store in other words focus your eyeballs on on the games that matter and you ask like what what is how does this happen and the reality is it doesn't happen there's no one that can snap their fingers and make this happen there are you could in a walled garden say like no more shovelware or this or that but 
this really the the industry itself has to come to a conclusion that we cannot sustain this many games because there's not enough money to go around. And you either find that out the easy way or you find that out the hard way. And I just think that there's an easier way to find that out. I think people vastly, vastly overestimate how much money people are making on selling games in the indie space. Like Lily Mo is a, is a sizable, like independent, truly independent retro entity comparable to many one-off studios and people doing things on the side and we don't make very much money at all i don't take any money from the organization so that we can survive and i'm happy to do that because we don't really need it and i want to make the next game and all of that but i think people think like okay game is quality game looks good game must make money and the answer is that a lot of games that are very good don't make shit and i see that on steam i was i was lamenting that last year when i was playing games like bat boy and we were talking about cyber shadow a long time ago and others where it's like people just didn't play these games and they're great. They're way better than a lot of the games that people are playing. But at some point, you have this discoverability problem. I think that the organizations that sell games on a market level, so like PlayStation, like the console holders, they don't need to have the Nintendo seal of quality, which, by the way, didn't really mean anything anyway. There were plenty of horrible games with the Nintendo seal of quality. But what Nintendo, of course, tried to do was to just limit publishers output so that they had to make really hard decisions. And I think that that might be the best way forward is to say, like, listen, you don't have more than three slots this year on PSN. So make them count. Like whatever they might be. And that's exactly what Nintendo did. It was five games, but that's what Nintendo did. And of course, companies found out ways around that, like Ultra with Konami. But it checked people and stopped them from just releasing games that were made in weeks, which was basically what was happening on Atari 2600. Games literally made in weeks, stem to stern from the formation of what the game would be to it's in a box in two months. And Nintendo's like that ruined. We see, we, they already went, that's what's so funny. You have to know your history to know we already went through this. And gaming collapsed, console gaming collapsed in the early 80s, not because the games were bad, but because there was so much shit. And sometimes it's hard to wade through the shit to find the diamonds. So again, we either find this out the easy way or we find that out the hard way. We're obviously finding it out and we'll continue to find it out the hard way. But more and more games are getting canceled, as Chris said, and we don't even report that on, on them unless they're really associated with PlayStation or a big company anymore. Because like I just saw a game was canceled two years into development of like these guys from Bethesda spun off. It's like, OK, they're done. Like there's just. There's just no room that the, the money doesn't check out. So I think by lowering the volume, being more quality oriented, controlling the, the walled gardens better. And of course, shovel, getting rid of shovelware is a no-brainer. That's yeah. like the, the least that, you can do, but that's not going to solve the problem. That's probably 10% of it. You know? Yeah. It's managing people's expectations, asking people what they expect out of products, releases, and there should be a libertarian marketplace like Steam, but they all shouldn't be like that. So that's what I, that's what I say is that there, there's a bunch of different ways to tackle it, but there's just not enough money to go around. There's not enough interest. There are not enough eyeballs you're chasing money that's not even there because it's all wrapped up in fucking whatever already so you have to play by those rules or you can try to change the paradigm but you're not going to you know so that's what i have to say i don't know if you guys have anything you want to add that's basically it no, no. good no well said yeah no, thank you yeah, I, I don't know all right Perfect. i think i think the only thing that i would say though is that i do think shovelware the the definition of shovelware should be should be extended i think mm -hmm. i think they, i think it should be extended to include things like Lord of the Rings Gollum and stuff like that. I think there should be like a like a generalized quality assurance check that you have to pass. Yeah, I agree. Like, you wouldn't even call if, that shovelware. You would just say it doesn't it doesn't meet our quality assurance expectations. Right. You might have spent money on it. It sucks, you know, and we don't want well, it on our store. Yeah. Yeah. But, but I just mean like for, for, for a hypothetical system and, and, and for for the for the uh, efficiency of simplicity. I mean, just, this is shovelware to us. Uh, this is this is this is ostensibly shovelware. This does not pass basic basic tests and uh no <laughs> this can't be on the store i'm sorry i i would um i would say they could reduce volume on playstation network by one quarter by just deleting games that demonstrably do not belong on psn oh I'll yeah be happy easily. to make a list for them if they want to they want to use it you know it's there are games on there i look at games all the time all sushi the time. flip trash dude there's just trash all over the place and I'm not saying Herbroxia or fucking Perils or whatever are the best games in the world, but they are way better 
than these games and demonstrably belong on the on the because people act like this is so subjective as to be this deep conundrum. I'm like, no, not really. I've been playing games for a long time. I can just kind of look and tell if your game sucks or not. Like there's going to be deeper levels to it, but there's got to be some sort of like some sort of barrier where it's like this. Definitely. We don't want like we definitely don't want that. Let's have some questionable things, maybe. But that would solve much of the problem. But I love the idea of just of just constraining publishers and entities to saying like you can only at certain sizes like if you're a if you have 10 or fewer people you have one slot a year if you're like ea you have five or whatever and of course they don't want to do this but i just don't believe that sony makes more money on incidental sales of games that no one plays than they do of just not dealing with them at all i would feel like that would be a money saving operation from every angle from from qa to like liaison liaising with all these people to giving them dev kits and and PlayStation access to the PSN backend and all the rest. It's like to sell a hundred copies of the game. That's really worth it to you. That's so weird. A hundred copies of a $10 game. So you made $300 Sony. You made $300 on this. And you're telling me that it belongs on the PlayStation network. I think you're fucking crazy. That's like saying like when you go to the Walmart, they don't have every deodorant that's ever been made. They have made yeah. some sort of selection for you about like what they'll sell to you. It doesn't mean that other things don't exist. You can go to the libertarian utopia of Amazon and find whatever you want. But here in this storefront, this is like our selection and we stand by and we make money on that. It's like, what is so difficult yeah. about that? You know, it's just strange to me. But anyway, I digress. Jeremiah, thank you for writing in. My friends, that's it. That's episode 299. Now we're really here. Wow. Uh, We've next done we it. Will, next week's speak will be in New York City. And I'm excited <laughs> for that. See how it goes. Hopefully, nothing calamitous happens. Um, and then we'll be back I mean, for a proper episode 300, <laughs> which will just be a normal episode of the show, I think. And uh, yeah. go from there. So let's go around the horn and say goodbye to everyone, Chris. Goodbye to you. Goodbye, man. I'm, I'm excited. I'm yeah, excited to be in New York. I'm excited to do this show. I'm excited to engorge myself in, with pizza oh, yeah. to, an, to a really irresponsible degree. Sure. Very pumped. I'm all about irresponsible eating, so I totally understand. Dustin, goodbye to you. Safe travels. Goodbye. Yeah, getting ready to go pretty soon here. But Chris, I was thinking you're saying about pizza. You and I we might need to have a little date because in Houston, after the show, oh, we yeah. had oh, the yeah. uh, the gray van pizza. <laughs> and Colin, I would invite you, but I know that you're not hanging out after the show. Yeah, probably not. We'll uh, see. I, I may, so, I may not. I have family there too and stuff, so I don't know what my obligations are going to be, to be perfectly honest. So, right, Chris, yeah. you and I maybe, I mean, after the show, I don't know. Definitely. Can you get pizza at all times of the day yes. in New York? You can, get, you can get pizza till 4 a.m. Okay. Then you and I, let's get some pizza after, let's uh, do it. after a nice show. I'll I'm get, trying to I'll eat pizza the- as much as possible when I'm there. Even no, though I'm not hungry and it's it, and I walk by, I'm like, well, I can go for a slice. Let me tell you something. That morning, that morning I'm going to have pizza. <laughs> that afternoon before I go, I'm gonna have pizza, and then mm. that night I'm gonna have pizza because I I can't get any of it here, and so I I, mm. I, I got to get it when I when I can. I I'm, he- I'm much healthier. Pe- oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was saying I, I'm much healthier for it, <laughs> but you know when I'm home, I'll I'll take advantage of it. You instruct you instructed uh, Ben to what? So I was gonna say I instructed Ben to get have like pizza behind you know like for us pizza and just like some you know a small craft craft services table, just a little pizza, some snacks, some drinks. But the pizza will be I the think, centerpiece, I think, of that. In my, that's yeah, a way I must, envision must, it anyway. We'll see how that all goes. You know? I'm going to have to talk to my dad because I think that's going to be one of the things we have him do is is get pizza. But I'm going to be like, dude, you can't. No you trash. Gotta, you can't go with Domino's no, no trash. right now. No trash. No Domino's. I, I, will, I will not do the show. Yeah. Don't I, will, I, I will, I will you'll fly punch back my dad in the Domino's. face, which would be even more interesting. <laughs> So poor man, Jesus we'll, we'll talk. I'll talk to him. We'll we'll get something sorted. Yeah, no, we'll definitely do that. All right. Well, that's it. I'm excited to go to. I have a, a tomorrow Friday when this goes live on Patreon. I, I will begin to prepare. We leave Saturday afternoon. So we'll see you guys Saturday evening. I guess we we'll get dinner or something somewhere. I got to look into that at some point. Figure that out. But I'm looking forward to it. We'll see you all at the show and we'll see you next time for episode 300 proper as well. But this is the episode 300 celebration. So it's gonna be two different things. That's pretty exciting. So um, boys, looking forward to seeing you. Looking forward to seeing you all out there. Thank you again for your love, kindness and support. Patreon.com slash last day media for early ad free access, etc. Last day media.store for merch. Till next time. Goodbye. See ya.
Take care, guys. Sacred Symbols, a PlayStation podcast, is a product and trademark of Last Stand Media and Collins Last Stand LLC and is proudly recorded in the USA. The show is conceived by, is written by, and is directed by me, Colin Moriarty. My co-hosts are Chris Raygun Maldonado and Dustin Furman. The show is produced by executive producer Dustin Furman. It's edited by associate producer Ben Smith. All of Last Stand's theme music is by my best friend, Ramon Narvaez. As you know, all of Last Stand's shows, including Sacred Symbols, are fan-funded on Patreon at patreon.com slash laststandmedia. The following names are at the producer level on Patreon, our highest tier, and we're grateful for your thoughtful and kind contributions to our independent endeavor. Thank you.